The Enemy, The Project, written by Alex Lukman, narrated by Jack Tegolia. Chapter 1 The scorpions scuttled across the hard-packed earth on top of the hill looking for something to eat. An insect, a spider, or a centipede, anything would do. The scorpion wasn't picky. It crawled around a square metal object rising out of the ground and continued on, past the man lying motionless a few feet away. The scorpion was a death stalker, one of the deadliest creatures on earth. If it decided to wander over and check him out, he might have to move. But if he moved, one of the satellites high up in the Uranian sky might see him. He watched it crawl out of sight and breathed a small sigh of relief. Full dark was minutes away. He waited another hour, until the only light came from the vast spread of stars overhead. Without any pollution from nearby humans, the stars threw plenty of light to see by. He moved out from under his camouflage netting, rolled it up, and placed it to the side. Then he opened the pack lying next to him. First, he took out an object that looked like a child's toy. It had an antenna, four rubber wheels, and an odd appendage that looked something like a miniature elephant's trunk. He reached again into the pack and extracted the control unit. It had a screen, a tiny joystick, and several buttons. It was about the size of a smartphone, but it wasn't a phone. The technology it contained went far beyond that. He pushed a button. A tiny green light lit on the device with the wheels. The screen on the control unit came alive. He touched the joystick and the device rolled forward. In a darkened room on the other side of the world, a technician in an Air Force uniform sat in front of a console and a large monitor. Two men in civilian clothes stood behind him. The monitor showed only a blinking red dot. Suddenly, the screen lit with greenish light, illuminating a low, square object sticking out of the earth. Sir, ghost is online. About time, one of the men said. Took him long enough. Now we'll see what those bastards are up to, the second man said. They watched as the camera mounted on the mobile unit moved toward the object. They were looking at the top of a ventilation shaft. The picture changed, moving over the edge of the shaft, then looking down and in. He's deployed the snake, the technician said. They watched as the image dropped down through the shaft. There was little to see. The camera mounted on the end of the snake moved through a dark tunnel of metal ductwork. Then the image grew brighter. Something ahead, sir, the technician said. The camera came to a large vent in the side of the ductwork and paused to look through the grid into the room beyond. It's a laboratory, the first man said. Yeah, but what kind, his companion said. Look along that wall. Those are animal cages. It must be a bio lab. Where are the animals? Wait a second. Why aren't any of them moving? You see what I see? Shit, they're all dead. The camera moved. Uh-oh, the second man said. Not just the animals. The director isn't going to like this. At that instant, the screen went dark. The red dot that represented ghost disappeared. What happened? I don't know, sir. The connection is gone. So is the GPS locator on Ghost. Shit, the first man said again. Better hope they didn't take him alive, the second man said. Chapter Two Clarence Hood sat in Elizabeth Harker's office sipping coffee with the woman who was his friend and sometimes lover. Elizabeth ran the Harker Group, technically a consulting firm. Calling it a consulting firm was like calling the Roman legions a marching band. In the past, her team had operated under the protection of the U.S. president. But that was no longer the case. In the relentless cycle of American politics, a new administration had entered the White House with different ideas about how the country should be run. The current occupant was a man who believed in personal and political agendas first and the country second. One of his first actions was to proclaim a new era of transparency. He denounced U.S. involvement with covert operations. 
At the first available opportunity, he'd withdrawn government support from Elizabeth and her team. Elizabeth had taken the group private. Official or not, there was a lot of demand for the specialized skills her team could provide. She had powerful contacts scattered around the globe and a reputation for getting results. She no longer had the blessing of the White House, but not much else had changed. Clarence Hood was a former director of the CIA. After the new president fired him, he established a strategic think tank, the Hood Foundation. There were few people Elizabeth respected for their intelligence and perception, but Clarence was one of them. She waited for him to tell her what was on his mind. From long experience, she knew the look on his face meant he was concerned about something. Come on, Clarence, out with it. What's going on? You look like the end of the world is coming. He put his coffee cup down on her desk. That's the problem, he said. It might be. You're serious, aren't you? I wish I could say no, but I'm worried, Elizabeth. She waited. Hood took a thumb drive from his pocket. Before I say anything more... I'd like you to watch this. No one is supposed to know about it. I'm not supposed to have it. If you watch it with me, you'll be breaking every secrecy law on the books, and probably some I haven't even heard of. And your point is? Clarence laughed. Okay, I just thought I'd give you a chance to back off before you're involved. He handed her the drive. Elizabeth plugged it into her computer. They both turned to look at the monitor on the wall, where a greenish image filled the screen. A play message blinked at them. What am I looking at? Elizabeth asked. That is the top of a ventilation shaft. What you're about to see was taken a week ago. The location is way out in the boonies of southern Iran. There isn't anything of consequence within a hundred miles of this place. Ah our old friends, the Iranians. The White House has decided to dismiss what's on this recording. It seems like it's always the same people making decisions when it comes to Iran. Either they don't believe the mullahs are serious about WMDs and using them, or they simply don't care because they're making too much money looking the other way. What's on here could create a real shitstorm. It could screw up deals with the Iranians that are making some people rich. You're getting cynical, Clarence. Washington has been making deals with the mullahs for a long time. Yes, but this is different. Go ahead and run the video, then I'll tell you the rest of it. Elizabeth raised her eyebrows and clicked on play. They watched as the camera entered the shaft, dropping down and around until it came to a screen where it could look out on the room below. Pause it there, Clarence said. Elizabeth studied the screen. A laboratory, she said. Animal cages, but they're all sleeping, or... Oh, I see. They're all dead. Right. Let it play. The camera panned around the room. Two people in white coats lay on the floor, their bodies twisted and contorted. A dead man slumped backward in the chair at his desk, lips pulled away from his teeth in agony, the front of his shirt streaked with black vomit. Then the screen went dark. That's it? That's all there is, Clarence said. It was sent in real time to Langley by satellite. The transmission was cut short. Since then, there's been no contact with the operative who took that video. He didn't show up for his extraction, and he hadn't been heard from. I won't ask how you got this. I wouldn't tell you. In this case, you don't need to know. When are you going to realize I don't need protection, Clarence? Hood smiled. I figured that out a long time ago, Liz. But you still don't need to know. Hmm. You said you were going to tell me the rest of it after we watched the video. What we just watched tells us Tehran has developed a bioweapon of some kind. A plague, a gas, something really nasty. There must have been an accident at that lab, and it got loose. Our problem is we don't know exactly what it is. The people who ought to be doing something about it have decided not to rock the boat.
Politicians never liked an inconvenient truth unless it's to their advantage, Elizabeth said. One of the reasons I started the foundation was to try and make a case for stronger national security. This is a good example of why we need it. Those fools in the White House want to look the other way when it comes to Iran. However, there's an opportunity to make them pay attention. That's where you come in. I'm listening. A top scientist in the Iranian Ministry of Science wants to defect. There are two opposing factions at Langley, likewise in the Pentagon and the White House. One faction wants to avoid provoking Iran at any cost. From their point of view, helping this person defect would be a major provocation. The other wants to get her out of there as quickly as possible. Her? Her name is Jale Kesri. She's a genius, a major player in their weapons research program. You'd think getting her out would be a top priority. You and I would think that, but that doesn't square with the new way of doing things at the White House. Sometimes the stupidity of people who gain power in our country boggles my mind, Elizabeth said. She looked at Clarence. Where do I come in? The Iranians have no intention of letting anyone know what was going on in that laboratory. But you think Jale Kazri knows? I'm certain she does. And no one at Langley or the Pentagon or the White House wants to get her out? I didn't say that. What I said was the people in charge refuse to do anything. It doesn't fit with their agenda. Elizabeth sighed. You want me to activate the team and extract her. With the government stonewalling, there's no one else who can do it, Hood said. You're asking me to go against the expressed wishes of the government to do something that could be viewed as treason. Yes. Jesus, Clarence. I'm not alone in asking you to do this. I've had discussions with certain people who are worried about the political decisions currently coming out of the White House and the implications for our security. It's clear something has to be done. All of us agree you are the best choice to pull this off. If you can get Kesri out of Iran, we can find out what's going on. Certain people? You don't need to know who they are, at least not yet. Are they going to protect me and my team if something goes wrong? I'd be lying if I gave you any guarantees. So you're appealing to my sense of patriotism over my common sense. That's about it. I'll do it on one condition. Which is? That everyone on the team knows what the stakes are and agrees. I would expect nothing else. Chapter 3 Nick Carter stepped out of the shower and picked up his phone. Water dripped onto the bath mat under his feet. He reached for a towel with his free hand. Yes? Good morning, Nick. Morning, Director. Her voice was tense. I'm calling everyone in. Ronnie and Lamont are on their way. When? I just got out of the shower. That's more than I need to know at the moment. Valentina isn't answering her phone. Do you know where she is? She's been traveling, sightseeing around the country, she showed up a couple of days ago and she's staying with us, Nick said, probably still asleep. Wake her up. Get here as soon as you can. Harker disconnected. Here was group headquarters in Virginia, a federal-style mansion built in the 1880s by one of the robber barons. Nick toweled himself off and wiped steam from the mirror. Whatever the reason Harker had called, it would keep until after he'd shaved. He rubbed his hand over black stubble ran the water, and lathered up. He looked older than his age. That was what happened when you spent too much time in places where people were trying to kill you. It showed in the purple welts and scars on his body, the hard line of tension around his jaw, something in his eyes. His eyes were smoky gray, spotted with flecks of gold. Long ago, a girl he'd known told him his eyes reminded her of a wolf, He'd taken it as a compliment. Nick's looks were decent enough, but no one was ever going to give him a job as a male model. He pictured himself posing for an ad. The thought of how ridiculous that would look made him smile. 
He finished shaving, went into the bedroom and pulled on a pair of briefs, then dockers and a blue shirt. He grabbed a light gray sport jacket from the closet. He left the shirt open at the collar, but stuck a tie in his pocket in case he needed it. When you went to a meeting with Harker, you never knew where you'd end up. For all he knew, he'd be on his way to the other side of the world before the day was out. Selena called from the kitchen. Coffee's ready. Nick and Selena lived in a renovated factory loft overlooking the Potomac. The place was huge, but they used every inch of it. They had a gym, extra rooms, a wall of windows that overlooked the river, and a kitchen that any chef would envy. There was an armory filled with weapons and a security system good enough for the Pentagon. Access to the armory was through a hidden panel at the back of a walk-in closet. Most of what was hanging on the walls inside the room was illegal. You couldn't walk into your local gun shop and buy the kinds of things the team needed in the field. As far as that went, you couldn't walk into a local gun shop in Washington and buy much of anything. Now that they were no longer tied to the government bureaucracy that gave D.C. its reason to exist, they'd started talking about moving into the country, away from the congested traffic and polluted air of the city, some place where the twins could grow up playing on grass instead of pavement. Katrina and Jason were three years old. They were watched over by the eagle eye of Anna Montalbono. Anna had started out as a live-in nanny, and become an indispensable friend. It didn't hurt that she could use a Glock almost as well as Selena. Anna carried a pistol because Nick and Selena had made a lot of enemies over the years. Some had managed to get past the security and inside the loft. It was another reason they were thinking of leaving the city. They'd both had enough of the deteriorating environment, high crime rate, and constant focus on politics that came with living in the nation's capital. Good restaurants and historic monuments weren't enough to make up for it. Selena and Valentina were at the kitchen counter drinking coffee. Wisps of steam rose from their cups. At first glance, the two women didn't look much like sisters. A closer look revealed the similarities between them. Valentina was the result of a forbidden liaison between two spies. Selena's father had been CIA, stationed in West Berlin during the Cold War. Valentina's Russian mother was a KGB agent assigned to seduce him. In spite of both governments having harsh penalties against fraternizing with the enemy, the two had begun an affair. Both had been recalled, but not before Valentina's mother became pregnant. She'd refused to abort the child. When her mother was killed a few years later, Valentina became a ward of the state. Her intelligence and physical beauty were quickly noted. She was chosen for training as a seductress and assassin. A twist of fate brought Selena and Valentina together before they knew they were sisters. It was only later that Valentina defected to the West. Selena was taller by a few inches. Her hair was reddish blonde, cut short. Valentina's was dark brown, thick and long, usually kept in a ponytail. Selena's eyes were a striking deep blue color that was usually violet. Valentina's were a cold green. Looking into her eyes was like looking out at the Arctic steppes, the home of her ancestors. Both women gave off a strong vibe that warned predators away. Both had high cheekbones, one slightly higher than the other. The flaw made their looks interesting and kept them from falling into the trap of too much beauty. That didn't stop people from turning to look at them wherever they went. Morning, hon. Val, you look a little the worse for wear. There were deep shadows under Valentina's eyes. She kept her hands wrapped around her coffee cup. I was at little Odessa, she said. I meet nice man there. We have drinks. Little Odessa was a bar near DuPont Circle that claimed its bartenders could mix a hundred varieties of vodka drinks. Valentina looked like she had tried to sample most of them. That explains it. I think she's in love, Selena said. Ha <laughs> ha, Valentina said. You are very funny, sister. Nick poured himself a cup of coffee. Harker called. She wants us to come in right away. She said she couldn't reach you, Val. 
I lose my phone. Maybe I find later. It is not important. What does she want us for? Selena said. How would I know? She said Ronnie and Lamont are on their way. I thought Ronnie was in Arizona and Lamont was down in Florida. If she called in the whole team, it must be important. It's always important. Where are the monsters? I wish you wouldn't call them that. Anna took them to the park. It's going to be over a hundred today. She wanted to get there while it was still cool. Washington in August wasn't high on anyone's vacation list. Nick drained his coffee. We should get moving. Give me ten minutes, Selena said. That works. Gives me time to make some toast. Twenty minutes later, they were on their way to Virginia. Chapter Four Nick turned in past a stone pillar set with a brass plaque announcing the Harker Group and followed the drive to the house. The building was a classic example of federal-style architecture. Across from the entrance, a large fountain sprayed water into the air. A dusty black Hummer, Elizabeth's Audi, and a Cadillac were parked in the lot. Selena looked at the caddy. I see Ronnie's here. Isn't that Clarence Hood's car? Yeah, I think so, Nick said. They climbed the steps and went in. Harker's office was straight ahead across a high atrium. On the right, a curving staircase climbed to a second floor balcony, where a large oil painting of Cornwallis surrendering to Washington overlooked the space below. Elizabeth was behind her desk. Ronnie Pete and Lamont Cameron sat on a long leather couch facing her. Clarence Hood was in a chair to her right. To her left, Stephanie Willits sat at a rolling computer console. Stephanie was Elizabeth's deputy and resident computer genius. She looked up as they came into the room. Gold bangles jingled around her left wrist as she waved at them. Hi, guys. Stephanie maintained a Cray supercomputer located in another part of the building. She tweaked the machine far beyond its normal specs, designing a program of artificial intelligence which gave the big Cray a unique personality. Over time, the computer had become an active part of the team. Steph had named him Freddy. Freddy was capable of independent thought and processed data and information far faster than the human brain. He'd help them out of bad situations more than once. Here comes trouble, Lamont said as Nick and the others came in. Been a while, Ronnie said. What's the haps, Nick? Hi, Val. Elizabeth tapped her pen on her desk. Have a seat. Nick, Selena, and Valentina sat down next to the others. Now that we're all here, we can begin. You all know Clarence. Before I start, this is one of those times when I need to remind you that we no longer have the protection we enjoyed when President Rice was in the White House. That's nothing new, Nick said. Why are you telling us now? Clarence has come to me with something none of us are supposed to know about. It's classified, and it's tricky. If we get involved, we're getting right in the face of some powerful people who have a lot invested in not doing anything about it. What people? The kind of people who put money and personal power ahead of country, Elizabeth said. Oh, those kind of people. Now you've got me interested, Director. Nick, I'm serious. This could create a lot of trouble for us. We could all go to prison for treason. Director, Ronnie said, why don't you just tell us what it is you want us to do? Ronnie's right, Nick said. Consider us duly warned and tell us what's going on. I told you that would be their reaction, Clarence said. I didn't doubt it, she said. I just thought everyone should know the consequences if this blows up in our faces. She paused. Okay. A week ago, Langley inserted an operative deep into Iranian territory inside a highly secured area. Nobody knows what they're doing there, but it seemed important enough to try and find out. Our man was being monitored live while he was in the field. He took the video I'm about to show you before his signal disappeared. 
he never made it back to his extraction point. We assume he's captured or dead. Was it worth it? Ronnie asked. Judge for yourself. Watch the monitor. Elizabeth played the video. When it was done, nobody said anything for a moment. Nick broke the silence. What killed the animals and those people? We don't know, Clarence said. Whatever it is, it's nasty stuff. Tehran is planning something, but the people who want to find out what it is have been overridden by the White House. The current administration is playing footsie with the mullahs. It's politically inconvenient to do anything that might upset the apple cart. Like blowing the whistle on an Iranian WMD? Selena said. Hood nodded. Like that? I'll never understand these people, Ronnie said. You and a lot of others, Nick said. We don't know what Tehran is doing, but there's someone who does, Elizabeth said. That's what we need to talk about. Good morning, everyone. The computer voice boomed through the office. Selena winced. Damn it, Freddy, turn the volume down, Elizabeth said. Sorry, director, I have adjusted the volume. Have you been listening, Freddy? I am always listening. Put up a photo of Jalé Kesri on the monitor, please. Of course, Elizabeth, I am happy to oblige. The photograph was of a middle-aged woman wearing a tight-fitted hajib that covered her hair and left only her face visible. It had been taken at long distance as she entered an official-looking building. Men in the uniform of Iran's Revolutionary Guard stood at attention on either side of the entrance. The camera had caught her turning to look at something over her shoulder. She looked stressed. This is Dr. Jalé Kesri, Elizabeth said. She's a researcher in Iran's Ministry of Science, Research, and Technology. The public face of the ministry is primarily concerned with health and education. They run the hospitals, the universities, things like that. I take it she's not part of that public image, Nick said. Definitely not. Why are we looking at her? Dr. Kesri is one of the two or three top people worldwide in the field of neuroscience. She wants to defect. The last thing the White House wants is an important Iranian scientist turning up on talk shows telling us what she knows. They know she wants to defect, but they're not going to do anything about it? Selena asked. That's right. Then she's at risk. If people here know about her, it won't be long before there's a leak and word gets back to Tehran. Right again. I see where this is going, Nick said. You want us to extract her before the mullahs string her up by her thumbs. That's the mission in a nutshell. Elizabeth said, should you choose to accept? Nick and Ronnie groaned. Sorry, Elizabeth said, I just couldn't resist. Oh boy, Lamont said, all that's missing is the corny music. Valentina looked confused. Excuse me, why should be music? Selena smiled. Never mind, Val, I'll explain later. It may not be impossible. Elizabeth said, but it's not going to be easy. One thing we have going for us is a secure channel of communication with her. I thought you weren't supposed to know anything about this, Nick said. Did I say that? Yes, I suppose I did, but Clarence still has a deep connection into Langley. You mean Lucas, don't you? Selena said. Lucas Monroe was Stephanie's husband. He'd been a field operative for years and was a legend within the agency. Under Hood, he'd risen to Director of Clandestine Operations, the first black man to reach that powerful position. He still held the post, but it was only a matter of time before he was fired. You're free to speculate, but you didn't hear that from me, Clarence said. What's important is that we can get a message to Kesri. I don't know how long that will last. Iran's counterintelligence is excellent. She could be exposed at any moment. We have to assume the window of time to get her out is closing. Isn't the ministry where she works in Tehran? Selena asked. Yes. No way we get her out of Tehran, Nick said. 
She's going to have to meet us somewhere. Is she allowed to travel? Can she leave the country? She's important, and she's watched. She won't be allowed to leave, but she's free to move about inside the country. Freddy, Elizabeth said, let's see a map of Iran. Please specify what kind of map you would like to see, Elizabeth. I have over 376 different maps of Iran in my database, going back to the days of ancient Persia. Would you like to see a map of the area during the era of Alexander the Great? No thanks, Freddy. Just a current map will be fine. As you wish. A map of modern Iran appeared on the screen. Freddy sounds disappointed, Lamont said. He likes to show off his database. Stephanie said. Can this woman get to the border director? Nick asked. Turkey or even Iraq? I don't think we can extract her in country and get away with it. There aren't many options, Elizabeth said. The border with Iraq is heavily guarded. Same thing with Turkey. I don't think either one of those is a good bet. Neither is Afghanistan or Pakistan. Nobody in that area is our friend. Then we have to get her out by water. The Caspian Sea, the Persian Gulf, or the Gulf of Oman. Maybe someplace where people go for a break. A resort, a hotel on the beach, that kind of thing. She could take a vacation. Once she's near the water, we can come get her. We could stage from Kuwait, Ronnie said. If she could get to a place on the northern end of the Persian Gulf, it's a short run from there. That area is crawling with military bases and installations. I don't like the Caspian Sea for pickup, Lamont said. You really want to try and stage from Turkmenistan or Azerbaijan? Not ideal. If we don't go from Kuwait or one of the Arab states, all that's left is the Gulf of Oman, Selena said. If she could get to one of the towns in the southeast corner of the country, that might work. I see two possibilities on that map, Jask and Chabahar. Jask is close to the Straits of Hormuz, Ronnie said, another with a strong military presence. That leaves Chabahar, Nick said. Elizabeth watched the back and forth. She'd learned long ago to let Nick and the team brainstorm missions. She trusted their experience. Where would we leave from? Selena asked. India, Lamont said. He pointed at the map. If Kazri could get to Shabahar or somewhere close by, we could stage from Kandla in India. It's a port, and it's not too far to Chabahar if we have a good boat. Yeah, Nick said, but those are Pakistani waters. They're bound to have patrol boats right where we want to go. What are we going to do, pretend we're local fishermen? Wouldn't be the first time we played hide-and-seek with them. Be a lot simpler if we could put her on a plane to Rome, Lamont said. Why Rome? Ronnie asked. They have great pizza. Elizabeth rolled her eyes. Lamont, Rome is not an option. Just saying. Selena had been looking at the map. I think we should go from Kuwait, she said. What's your reasoning? Nick asked. Look at the distance we have to travel if we leave from India. It's a long stretch through hostile waters, lots of patrol boats. If we go that way, we'd need something like a fishing boat. That makes it certain radar would pick us up. Someone would intercept us. If we stage from Kuwait, we could do it in a Zodiac. Low radar profile, harder to spot, maneuverable. This is going to be a high-risk op, Nick said. I want you on shore for that part of the mission. You speak Farsi? Nick looked uncomfortable. Well, I rest my case. Damn it, Selena. It's not up for discussion. You know I'm right. I think Selena's got the right idea, Lamont said. A quick in and out below the radar. Looks a lot better to me than the India option. I know those waters. We did a training exercise with the Kuwaitis there back when. Lamont had been a Navy SEAL. There wasn't much he didn't know about boats, weapons, water, and survival. The pink scar that ran across his forehead and down the side of his face was the aftermath of a SEAL mission in Iraq. Ronnie, Nick said. I'm with Lamont. Kuwait looks like the best bat. Can we get their cooperation? I have good contacts in Kuwait, Clarence said. 
I can make sure you get a smooth entry into the country. We need weapons. Take what you need with you, but keep it simple. I'll have to bring in someone on the Kuwaiti side to get you through customs. Is that really necessary? You won't get weapons in without local help, and you can't obtain them there. It's the only way. You'll have to trust me on this. There isn't much time to get this done, Elizabeth said. Every day that goes by increases the risk she'll be arrested. Director, we walk into this without the right prep and nobody is going to come back. How much time do you need? Nick thought about it. How long will it take to contact her and get a response? A day, Clarence said, maybe two. Okay, let's say it's a day. Once she knows we're coming for her, she has to find a way to travel from Tehran or wherever she is to the extraction point. We don't know how long that's going to take. She has to follow directions exactly. There has to be a way for her to let us know when she's ready for us to come get her. Otherwise, this isn't going to work. Assuming no problems, we can be waiting for her signal in Kuwait. Nick tapped his fingers on the arm of the couch, thinking... We can use the day it takes to contact her to get our gear together, pick an extraction point, and figure out where we're going to stage from. Once we're in Kuwait, we'll need a cover story. I've been scuba diving in Kuwait, Selena said. It's a big part of the tourist industry. There are beautiful coral reefs, good hotels. It's perfect cover. We can rent a Zodiac without arousing suspicion. All right, that's good. A day for prep here another day to go to Kuwait, a third day to set up for the extraction and act like tourists. With a little luck, she could be ready for us on the Iranian side by then. So, three days? Elizabeth asked. We can be ready for her in three, but there are too many unknown factors to promise we can get her out that fast. A lot depends on her. She'll have to take some risks. If they catch on she's defecting, it's game over, Ronnie said. Better hope they don't. If they figure it out, they could use her as bait. Bait? Valentina said. To see who comes to get her. They might be waiting for us. This would not be good. Everyone laughed. What is funny? I think you just took Nick's place as the master of understatement, Elizabeth said. Chapter 5 In a restricted research facility outside Tehran, Jalei Kezri came to work early. She wanted to get a start on the day. Her hijab surrounded her face and covered all of her hair, blending in with the plain, dark-colored outfit she habitually wore. Her dress reached all the way to her ankles, the sleeves of her shirt to her wrists. It was important to appear totally correct and obedient to the numerous laws governing the behavior of women. There could be no hint anything was amiss. She didn't want to think about what would happen if her watchers discovered she'd contacted the Americans. Kazri paused at the security desk and waited for a retinal scan to verify her identity. Two hard-looking guards, armed with submachine guns, stood nearby, watching her. When the scan was complete, a pair of glass doors hissed open and she entered her domain. She walked down a long corridor to her office, sat at her desk, and turned on her computer. She entered her password and was connected to a Russian NDMC supercomputer in the basement. Dr. Jalet Kezri had been born with the kind of rare intelligence that leads to great discoveries. Even in a culture relegating women to secondary status, her brilliance and uniqueness had been recognized. She'd ended up specializing in the expanding field of neuroscience, where she'd demonstrated remarkable abilities. Eventually, she'd risen to her present important role. Because of her privileged position, she had access to all the latest world research in her field, much of it classified. There was plenty of that. Russia, America, China, and India were all heavily invested. Only governments could afford the massive expenditures needed for the technology required. Neuroscience held enormous potential to improve the human condition, although that wasn't why governments were pouring money into the research. Scientific knowledge was a two-edged sword. Research to improve the quality of human life was often used to the opposite effect. 
What determined how a discovery was applied depended on the nature of the people who controlled it, that and how much money it might bring in. Jalay had a deep and abiding faith in the infinite love of Allah, but Allah's love had nothing to do with what was being planned in Iran for her life's work. Her research was being turned into a murderous weapon. She'd spent many restless nights tossing and turning, wondering how to stop it. In the end, she'd decided the only way was to defect to the West and hope someone there would take action. To a casual observer, Jalé Kesri was a shining example of how a woman could succeed even in a rigid society like the Islamic Republic. She was driven to and from work by an armed guard, a sign of her important status. She lived in a spacious apartment, equipped with all the luxuries taken for granted in the West, but not usually available to the average Iranian citizen. She had a stunning view of the majestic mountains north of the city. But her building was guarded around the clock. Her driver reported on everything she said or did. Even though her watchers kept their distance, she lived in a velvet prison. She was too important to be allowed a normal life. She had been watched for so long that the surveillance had become routine. There was nothing in her behavior to indicate anything but dedication to her work and loyalty to the regime. The fact that she had never married and never had a serious relationship was another reason surveillance had become lax. A chaste woman was respected in Iran, although it didn't stop her male colleagues from making unflattering remarks about her behind her back. Jalay was 37 years old. Her lack of an intimate relationship was due less to desire than circumstance. Her formidable intellect scared away potential suitors. The right person had never appeared. She'd accepted the possibility the right person never would. She logged onto her email and began working through the messages. She came to one inviting her to speak at a scientific conference. It was going to be held in Boucher, a city on the Gulf. The organizers wanted her to give a talk on functional neuroimaging and genetics. The message set her heart thumping. It wasn't the thought of speaking on one of her areas of expertise that triggered her. It was the wording of the invitation. It included a code phrase that told her the Americans were ready to get her out. How they'd manage the invitation, she didn't know or care. All that mattered was that they had. There would be no problem getting permission to go to the conference. The speakers included noted scientists from Iran, Russia, China, and India. Neuroscience was recognized as an important discipline. It would be perfectly natural for her to attend. A bonus would be the attention given to Iran as a leader in the field. Her boss was always looking for ways to increase the prestige of his department. With prestige came more funding. He would jump at the chance to send her. The aftermath of her defection would cause him serious problems. He would probably be removed from his post. She thought of his arrogance, his patronizing attitude toward her. Somehow she couldn't feel any remorse for whatever consequences came to him. With that pleasant thought, she composed a memo to her boss and attached the email requesting permission to attend. She replied to the email accepting the invitation. Soon, I'll be free, she thought. Chapter 6 Nick leaned back with his eyes closed, lulled by the low murmur of the engines and the soft leather of the Gulf Stream 5 carrying them to Kuwait. They'd left Washington as the sun was setting. It was six and a half thousand miles to Kuwait, the plane had enough fuel capacity to make the flight non-stop, but without a margin for error or unforeseen circumstances. They'd made a stop in Spain to take on fuel. Now they were on the last leg of the journey. Before they left, Harker told him Kesri would be staying at a hotel across the Gulf from Kuwait, in the Iranian city of Boucher. She'd handed him a folder with pictures of the hotel and satellite photos of the surrounding area. He was looking at the folder, thinking about the mission, picturing the steps he would have to take. 
Random images drifted across his mind. He thought of the guns and stun grenades stowed in the spacious luggage compartment under his feet. Tools of war as familiar to him as the back of his hand. It seemed like he was always going someplace where guns were needed. He'd been here too many times before. Not for the first time, he found himself wondering what the point of it all was. All the missions he'd been on, all those times when he was at the sharp tip of a spear, aimed at people who wanted to turn the world into their private charnel house. What difference had he made? What difference did any of it make? You took down one bad guy and three more took his place. It was like playing whack-a-mole with crazies who popped up out of nowhere and did their best to kill you. There were always more of them waiting. There had to be something more than this to his life, something to give it meaning. In the beginning, he'd found meaning in fighting for what he thought was right, meaning in the company of warriors, the physical challenge, the brotherhood of the core, the idea that what he was doing was making his country and the world a safer place. Most of the idealism disappeared during his first combat tour. It hadn't taken long to realize that the only thing that mattered was his responsibility for the men he led, his Marines. He developed a hard shell that kept him alive in situations no one should ever have to experience. It helped him deal with his anger when commanders and politicians made stupid decisions that got people killed for no good reason. He'd been recovering from wounds at Bethesda and wondering if he should stay in the Corps when Harker had recruited him for the project. It had seemed like a new start. Then he'd met Selena. Circumstances tossed them into a crucible of shared danger and survival that forged their relationship into an indestructible bond. For a while, his relationship with her had helped provide a sense of meaning. He had friends, work, respect, a beautiful woman who loved him, two amazing children. Most would think he had everything. So why did he feel like something was missing? He thought about the team, his friends, his comrades. Nick had known Ronnie a long time. Ronnie was still solid as a rock, but Nick could see age beginning to catch up with him. Hell, it was catching up with everybody, himself included. He had a feeling something was going on with Lamont, maybe something physical. He wasn't sure what it was. Lamont was the kind of person who covered who he was with humor and a smart-ass joke. With Lamont, the waters ran deep. Selena's reaction to this mission had surprised him. The last couple of times Harker had sent them off somewhere, Selena had said she wanted to stop going on assignments like this. She'd said she wanted to stay home and be with the twins. He'd expected her to put up an argument against going this time. But she'd never said a word. Instead, she'd made it clear she was in it all the way. Maybe it was because the mission was about getting Kezri out of Iran and out of danger. Something to do with universal sisterhood. Maybe it was her old need for a periodic adrenaline fix. Whatever it was... Nick was glad she was along, but he wasn't happy about her going to Iran. It was true her knowledge of Farsi was invaluable. The problem was that if they had to use her language skills, they'd probably be in serious trouble. He drifted deeper, until his thoughts turned into random images dancing across his inner vision. The unfamiliar face of a man floated up before him. His hair was thick and gray, hanging down in waves to his shoulders. His skin was dark and weathered, his nose large. He wore a dark robe with a hood. His expression was intense. The man's eyes seemed to bore into him. Wake up! Nick jolted awake, the words echoing in his mind. He looked around. Selena was reading something. Ronnie and Lamont were sleeping. Valentina was leafing through a magazine. No one was paying any attention to him. Just a dream, he thought. Weird. For the rest of the flight, he kept coming back to the face in the dream. They landed at Kuwait International Airport without incident. The Gulfstream taxied past the main terminal to a secured area reserved for diplomats and the private aircraft of the wealthy. The co-pilot emerged from the flight deck, 
opened the outer door and lowered the stairway. Dry, hot air that smelled of dust and jet fuel swept into the cabin. A man wearing a neat beard, a long white cotton robe, and a white head covering stood with his hands clasped behind his back, waiting for them. He had a hard look about him. A cart pulling a baggage wagon pulled up to the plane. There's our contact. He's probably KSS. KSS? Valentina asked. Kuwait Security Service, their main intelligence agency. Selena took a silk scarf from her purse and arranged it over her hair. You're going to walk two steps behind, Nick, Lamont said. Don't be a jerk, Selena said. This is a Muslim country. We don't want to stand out more than we already do. She's right, Lamont, Nick said. Selena and Val need to cover their hair. All right, Nick, Valentina said, if you say so, but I do not like it. It could be worse, Ronnie said. We could be in Afghanistan. Then you'd be wearing a tent. Chapter 7 The dry desert heat was well over 100 degrees. After the air-conditioned comfort of the plane, it felt like a physical blow. The Kuwaiti touched his hand to his heart and made a slight bow. Welcome to Kuwait. I am Fahad al-Azmi. I will escort you through customs and take you wherever you need to go. Thank you. I'm Nick Carter. We've booked rooms at the Hilton Kuwait. Two baggage handlers began taking bags and scuba gear out of the luggage compartment. The last thing they reached for was an aluminum case that contained the team's weapons. Al-Azmi said something in Arabic and the men stopped. He turned to Nick. I'm afraid that we'll have to stay on the plane. Nick took a breath. My understanding is that we have clearance for what's inside that case. I am truly sorry, Mr. Carter, but we cannot allow the possibility of an incident with our Iranian neighbors. You know why we are here? In a general sense. I do not know the specifics. I have been instructed to tell you that any attempt to enter Iranian territory will be seen as a violation of our hospitality and will result in immediate deportation. However, I see that you have brought scuba gear with you, you are free to explore our beautiful islands and the exquisite coral reefs. I see, Nick said. I thought you might, Al-Azmi said. May I have your passports? They handed them over. Please follow me. Al-Azmi had a brief conversation with the guard in the customs booth. A few moments later, they were through. Al-Azmi led them to a white Land Rover. We have provided this vehicle for you. It has GPS to guide you. Simply tell it your destination. He handed Nick a business card. My private number is listed on the back. Please do not hesitate to call me if you require assistance. May I ask how long you intend to stay? We've booked rooms for a week, Nick said. We may stay longer depending on the diving. I think a week will be sufficient, Al-Azmi said. The way he said it was more than a comment. They got into the Land Rover and left the airport for the hotel. Selena had booked the best accommodations possible, something she loved to do. She could afford it. This time, she'd chosen a four-bedroom villa with a private pool looking out over the gulf. The villa had every convenience. Two floors, a balcony, a full kitchen, and all the amenities. After the hotel bellhop had delivered their bags and left, they looked around. Nice digs, Lamont said. He walked into the kitchen and opened the refrigerator door. It contained an assortment of fruit juices, water, and snacks. No beer, figures. There's no alcohol allowed here, Nick said. Pick your rooms and get settled in. We'll meet in the living area, Nick said. Selena and Nick's room was on the second floor. It had a wide balcony and an unobstructed view over the gulf. The water was a cloudy green the sky a clear, brilliant blue. Surf broke on the beach below the villa, steady, soothing. It was a beautiful setting, a perfect spot to relax. One of these days, we ought to come to a place like this for a vacation, Selena said. Vacation? What's that? It's been a long time since we went somewhere just for the heck of it. I hear you. Tell you what, 
When this is done, let's go somewhere. We'll take the monsters and Anna. Somewhere on the water. Hawaii? Hawaii's always nice. Or maybe the Caribbean. Last time we were down there wasn't much fun, he said. Then Hawaii it is. What do you think about our Kuwaiti minder? I think he's under orders. Let's go downstairs and we'll talk it over. The corner living area featured window walls looking out over the pool and the gulf. Two comfortable couches flanked a low ebony coffee table. A 60-inch TV faced the couches. The floor was of exotic, polished wood. The team made themselves comfortable on the couches. I thought HUD had cleared everything for us, Ronnie said. Somebody's worried we're going to kick up a shitstorm, Nick said. Hell, you can't blame them, Lamont said. They're probably right. Nick held up his hand and took out an electronic sweeper. It looked like a large cell phone with an antenna. They'd all seen it before. Nick began to walk around the room, searching for listening devices that might have been planted by the security service. The others made small talk. The diving should be wonderful here, Selena said. I'm looking forward to it, Lamont said. Nick shut down the sweeper. All clear. You notice Al Azmi didn't search us? Lay out what you've got on the table. Nick pulled up his pant leg, revealing an ankle holster. He took out a 9 millimeter compact pistol and put it on the table. Lamont and Ronnie produced pistols and placed them next to his. Valentina had a holster concealed in her bra. She put a 380 on the table. Mine is upstairs in my bag, Selena said. Okay, Nick said. Five pistols plus magazines, maybe 80 rounds. This is not very much, I think, Valentina said. What was all Addy was saying about enjoying the diving? Ronnie asked. al knows we're going to Iran. He was telling us the KSS will look the other way. He was also letting us know we're in deep shit if we get caught. You heard him. We've got a week. What is plan? Valentina asked. First, I'll call Harker and find out if they've heard from Kesri yet. And? We have to assume we're being watched. We need to act like tourists. It's tough to hide guns in a bathing suit, so stash them where the maids won't find them. It's already afternoon. There's not much we can do today. Tomorrow we check out the dive shops and line up a Zodiac. I say we hang out by the pool for a while, then hit the hotel restaurant. You think they've got pizza? Lamont asked. Chapter 8 Jale Kesri adjusted her scarf and stepped out of her taxi in front of the hotel, where the conference was set to start the next day. The driver went around to the trunk and took out her bag. A bellhop ran forward, picked up the bag, and disappeared into the hotel. She paid the taxi, and it drove away. She looked at the place where she'd be staying for what she hoped was her last time in Iran. The hotel was pyramid-shaped, an architect's concept of an ancient Persian tower, all angles and sharp corners. Balconies rose in tiers along the sides, seven stories high, bathed from top to bottom in green light. It looked like something from a bad American science fiction movie. August temperatures in Bashir seldom fell below 100. It was early evening, but the heat was still intense. Jalet sweated under the clothes she was forced to wear. She hoped the air conditioning in her room worked. A short man in a dark suit waited for her outside the doors to the lobby. He had a neatly trimmed beard and mustache, dark hair, and a white shirt without a tie. His face was pockmarked with old acne scars. Dr. Kesri, welcome, welcome. I am Dr. Ahmadi, the organizer of our conference. I am so pleased that you are able to attend. I trust your journey was pleasant? Very pleasant, thank you. We begin in the morning at 8. I will present some opening remarks, then introduce the first speaker. You are the main speaker in the afternoon. Afterward, there will be discussion groups. We break for the day about 5. By Allah, his breath stinks. She resisted the urge to turn her head away. How many people will be attending? About 100 or so. We're still waiting to hear if the delegates from Turkmenistan are coming. I'm sure you will find the conversation stimulating. Most of the top names in your field are attending. I am looking forward to it. 
Let me get you checked in and escorted to your room. You'll find that the restaurant is quite good. Thank you. Ten minutes later, she was finally alone in her room. They'd given her a suite with a queen-sized bed and a balcony that overlooked the gulf. The beach wasn't far away. She opened the sliding door to the balcony and stood for a moment, listening to the sound of the surf. She closed the door, sat on the end of the bed, and stared out the window. It was quiet in the room, only the sound of the air conditioning breaking the silence. She took a deep breath and allowed the fear she'd been holding at bay to surface. During the flight from Tehran, she'd pushed away doubts about what she was doing, focusing instead on planning her presentation for the conference. Immersing herself in work had always helped deal with the narrow restrictions of her life. Work was a way to protect herself from the difficulties of being a second-class citizen in a country that viewed women through the eyes of religious patriarchy. Her intellect had been her path to success and acceptance. The downside was loss of privacy. Important scientists like her were considered national assets. She was always watched, suspect by definition. She was important. So important, in fact, that it was certain there would be watchers in the hotel. Keeping a close eye on her, the thought raised goosebumps of fear. She rubbed her arms. If they caught her trying to defect. At first, the research she'd been working on had excited her. She had discovered a way to influence the brain, a way to tell it how to aid in healing. Cancer, Alzheimer's, immune diseases, the long litany of ways the human body could destroy itself. All of these might now be headed off before they could wreak their havoc on frail human flesh. The potential for good was limitless. She hadn't reckoned on the potential for evil that always waited to balance the possibility of good. Someone in the Ministry of Defense had noticed what she was doing. All scientific research was monitored by the MOD as a matter of course. Soon, she found herself always in the presence of armed guards. Her budget was increased. At the same time, she was instructed to focus on particular aspects of her work. She had little choice except compliance. They could tell her what to do, but they couldn't tell her what to think. On the day she discovered what they intended for her beautiful research, she went into the bathroom and threw up. She couldn't allow it to happen which was why she found herself sitting in this room, holding in her fear and wondering how she was going to get through the next few days. Chapter 9 The day after their arrival in Kuwait, they found a dive shop. Nick arranged a Zodiac and spare tanks for the diving gear. They headed out for the offshore islands and the coral reefs for a day of scuba diving. Prepping for the mission didn't mean they couldn't enjoy themselves. The reefs were everything they were supposed to be. Later that afternoon, they were back at the hotel. Lamont, Ronnie, and Valentina lounged by the private pool. Man, this is a life, Lamont said. He was sipping an ice-cold fruit juice concoction called a mocktail. It even came with a tiny umbrella. He held up the glass. Pretty good. Could use a little rum, though. Or vodka, Valentina said. She was drinking something purple. I would like to have vodka now. Like real vacation, no? Nick and Selena came out of the villa carrying fruit drinks. Selena draped a towel over a lounge chair and lay down. She adjusted her sunglasses and started applying suntan lotion on her legs. I just talked with Harker, Nick said. What's the word? Ronnie asked. Kesri is at a hotel in Bushir. A message was sent to her with instructions on the extraction. We're on hold until she confirms. Once we have that, we go get her. What are her instructions? Valentina asked. Her hotel is on the beach. She's supposed to go for a walk late in the evening and meet us at a disused pier away from the hotel. Sat photos show that stretch of beach doesn't see a lot of foot traffic. With a little luck, there won't be any late-night strollers to deal with. The idea is she walks to the pickup point and waits for us. Sounds simple, Ronnie said. 
That makes me nervous. One thing going for us is no moonlight. It will be dark. It's never pitch black here, Lamont said. There's stars. The water can turn phosphorescent when it gets stirred up. The Zodiac might leave a trail of light behind it. Nothing we can do about that. What if she doesn't show up? Then we wait to hear from her and do it again if we need to. You see that patrol boat out there today when we were diving? Ronnie said. Couldn't miss it. Where we're going, they'll all be flying the wrong flag. I'd feel a lot better if we had something heavier than a couple of pistols, Lamont said. Look, Nick said, we all know this is a half-assed situation. It won't be the first time we went into something where things could go bad pretty quick. Hood has convinced Harker that getting this woman out is high priority. Selena took off her sunglasses and sat up on the edge of her lounge chair. I wonder what else is going on here, she said. What do you mean? There has to be a reason why Langley and the White House don't want to have anything to do with this. You don't think it's just because they're making deals with the mullahs? No, I don't. They've been making deals since the day the Shah was overthrown. So what's different now? Why are they unwilling to help an important scientist defect? She's got an inside track on what the Iranians are up to. You can't tell me it's because the White House is afraid she'll show up on Tucker Carlson. They could stop that from happening. Kesri knows something, and they don't want it to get out. That's what I think. Whoa, Lamont said. You think they're conspiring to keep her in Iran? Call it what you like. Something stinks. In Russia, conspiracy is way of life, Valentina said. Sometimes I think it's become a way of life in America. If you're right, we'd better be careful, Nick said. Hood is one of the good guys. He wouldn't be pushing this unless he thought it was necessary. That think tank he started has been making a lot of waves, criticizing White House policies. He has a lot of clout. The current administration hates him. They don't like us much either, Lamont said. I hate politics, Ronnie said. This operation goes south. The shit is going to hit the fan. In Russia, we have saying like this, Valentina said. Everyone has a saying like that. Selena put her glasses on again. I could be wrong. Maybe it's just that someone doesn't want to make waves with Tehran. But my gut says it's more than that. It feels important to get her out. We need to hear what she has to say. Nick's secure phone signaled. He looked at the display. Harker, he said. Yes, director? He listened. The call ended. It's confirmed. We're going tomorrow night. All right. Gives me time to work on my tan, Lamont said. Like you need a tan, Ronnie said. Gotta get my raise. Someone has to stay behind, Nick said. If something goes wrong, someone has to contact Harker, run interference with the authorities, and do whatever has to be done. Valentina, will you do it? I would rather go with everyone. It's important, Val. I wouldn't ask you if I didn't think so. Then I will do it, Nick. We are team, no? That's right, Nick thought. Chapter 10 Jalet looked at her watch for the fifth time in as many minutes. It was twenty minutes after eleven. Her instructions were to wait until eleven thirty, then leave the hotel and walk along the beach to a concrete pier about a half mile away. The structure was in disrepair, seldom used. Newer and better facilities had been built farther up the coast. At night it would be deserted, they'd said. Her mouth was dry. She found herself clenching and unclenching her fingers. What if something went wrong? What if the Americans didn't come? At least two thugs had been assigned to watch her. In a room full of academics, they stood out like wolves in a sheep pen. She'd seen two, but there might be more. Tomorrow was the last day of the conference. Her flight was scheduled to leave on the following morning. If she didn't get away tonight there would only be one more chance for them to pick her up. She'd have to go back to Tehran and wait until another opportunity presented itself. For several weeks, 
she'd been altering her research notes in an attempt to slow down development of the project. So far, she'd been successful, but sooner or later they'd discover what she'd been doing. She had no illusions about what would happen to her then. Fortunately, there were only two or three people in the world who could easily follow her thinking. She looked again at her watch. It's time. She got up, turned out the light, and pulled a scarf over her head. She'd already scouted out the best way to leave the hotel, a stairway at the end of the hall. Holding her breath, she cracked open her door and peered into the hallway. Hall lights at regular intervals showed no one in sight. She slipped out of her room and made her way to the stairs. Her footsteps made sharp echoes in the stairwell as she descended to the ground floor. She stepped out into the night, looking right and left. A soft breeze caressed her face with the last of the day's heat. She followed a path from the hotel to the beach, then turned north and began walking. There was no moon, but the light from the stars was enough to see where she was going. She walked along the beach, a few feet away from where the incoming tide swirled over the sand. Once, she thought she heard something behind her. When she turned to look, there was nothing there. It was like being in a bad dream, moving toward an unknown destination, uneasy that something might be following her. It felt like she'd been walking for a long time. Suddenly, a dark shape took form ahead, crossing the beach like a scar. It was the deserted pier where the Americans were supposed to be waiting for her. No one was there. She fought a rising sense of panic. They're not here. Oh, Allah, they're not coming. Then she heard the sound of a boat engine. It sounded like it wasn't moving fast, but she could still hear it over the noise of the surf. She looked out towards the water and saw a low shape heading toward her. Lamont cut the engine. Nick and Ronnie jumped into the water and dragged the Zodiac up onto the beach. They wore black wetsuits. Selena clambered out of the raft and walked toward the woman standing on the shore. She spoke in Farsi. Dr. Kesri? Yes? Don't be alarmed, doctor. We're here to take you to safety. You are American? Yes. Your Farsi is very good. I speak English, Kesri said. That helps, Nick said. Sudden light blinded them. An angry voice called out in Farsi. Hands up! Do not move! Selena tackled Kesri and knocked her down. The others dropped to the sand and began shooting at the lights. The night went black again. Bursts of automatic fire came from the darkness. The flashes made an evil strobe effect, lighting the faces of the men behind the guns. The bullets flew by with sharp, snapping sounds. The noise was fierce. Selena lay on top of Kesri, protecting her with her body. She felt the air move as bullets passed over her, a gentle hint from the angel of death. The slide on Nick's pistol locked back. He ejected the empty magazine and slammed in a new one, racked the slide, aimed. Then he realized that the guns had stopped. Someone up on the beach gave a long, rasping sigh. Then there was only the sound of the surf. Nick waited a beat. He got to his feet. Anyone hit? Not me, Lamont said. I'm good, Ronnie said. Selena? Selena got up and helped Kesri to her feet. The Iranian looked dazed. Her dark clothes were covered with sand, where she'd been pressed into the beach by the weight of Selena's body. You okay, doctor? Selena asked. Yes. We're good, she said. Ronnie, with me. Selena, get her into the boat. They went up the beach, holding pistols ready. Four men in green uniforms, one an officer, lay sprawled on the sand next to a shot-up three-quarter ton with a mounted spotlight. They were all dead. Take their weapons, Nick said. Ronnie picked up one of the guns. It's a copy of an MP5. Gives us an upgrade if we run into more trouble. Let's boogie before somebody else shows up. The others were already on board when they got back. Nick handed the guns over to Selena. He and Ronnie pushed the raft away from the beach and climbed in. Lamont started the engine and they backed away, then headed toward Kuwait. The raft was sluggish. One of the compartments got hold, Lamont said. Gonna slow us down. 
At least the wake isn't as obvious, Nick said. Let's hope they didn't radio for help. I don't think they expected a fight, Selena said. We were supposed to give up. Thank you for not giving up, Kezri said. Nick nodded. You're welcome. How did they know where we'd be? Selena said. I don't know, Nick said. We'll figure it out later. There were two men watching me during the conference, Kezri said. Were they wearing uniforms? No. Maybe they saw you leave the hotel. That wouldn't tell them where she was going, Ronnie said. They were waiting for us. There could be a leak. Maybe our KSS buddy in Kuwait? Maybe. Shit, Lamont said. He pointed over Nick's shoulder. In the distance, a low, rakish boat cut through the water. As they watched, a big spotlight came on. It began sweeping the waves. Patrol boat, Nick said. Everyone down. Lamont cut the engine. They drifted, watching the patrol boat. What if they see us? Ronnie asked. Excuse me, Kesri said. If I am captured, I will be tortured and executed. They will call you spies and do the same to you. You must believe me when I tell you this. She's right, Selena said. Nick, we have to fight them if they spot us. Bad odds, Lamont said. Ronnie, Nick said, what do you think? I don't fancy sitting in an Iranian jail waiting for them to cut off my head. Okay, if they see us, we play dumb. Selena, you talk to them. We're tourists who had trouble with our boat. Pretend to surrender. When they get close, start shooting. Lamont looked grim. They've got heavy machine guns, Nick. They can cut us to pieces. Yeah, well, shoot the gunners first. Psst. If you're enjoying this book and want more free audiobooks, please click subscribe. Chapter 11 They lay in the bottom of the raft for the better part of an hour, watching the Iranian patrol boat cruise back and forth. Once, the sweeping beam of the searchlight passed within feet of the Zodiac. Finally, the boat moved away until it was out of sight. Lamont started the engine and they resumed course for Kuwait. That was close, Ronnie said. You think we could have taken them, Nick? Not without the kind of luck that wins the lottery, but it would have cost them. You are brave, Kesri said. All of you. I wouldn't say that, Nick said. Sometimes you don't have a choice. Nick took out his satellite phone and called Harker. With the time difference, it was afternoon in Washington. What's your status, Nick? We ran into a little trouble, but we have Dr. Kesri. What kind of trouble? Soldiers were waiting at the extraction point. We had to take them out. If they'd had more people, I wouldn't be talking to you. We got lucky. Where are you now? On our way back to Kuwait. Director, we need help getting her out of here. I think someone tipped off the Iranians. I'm not sure we can trust our Kuwaiti contact. Does Dr. Kesri have a passport? I don't know. I'll ask. Dr. Kesri, do you have a passport? No. They have always been afraid I might leave the country. No, she doesn't. All right, I'll see what I can do. In the meantime, get ready to come home. Can't be too soon, Nick said. The rest of the way back, no one talked much. Selena sat in the bow, thinking how close they'd all come to dying. She thought about Jason and Katrina. They were young. They'd never remember her. In some ways, that felt like the worst hurt of all. At times like this, she wondered what it was that drove her to keep risking everything in spite of all her resolutions to stop. When she was in the middle of it, nothing compared to the adrenaline high that came with walking the razor edge between life and death. It was only afterward that the guilt moved in. Guilt for risking a future for her children without her. As they got closer to shore, they ditched all the guns over the side. Kuwait was friendly territory. Now that the mission was almost over, it wasn't worth the risk of being caught with them. When they got to the marina, the attendants started loudly complaining about the damage to the Zodiac. We tore it on a reef, Selena said in Arabic. No problem, we'll pay. She bargained with him until they agreed on a price. They got in the rented Land Rover and headed back to the hotel. 
Why did you argue with that guy at the marina? Ronnie asked. Why not just give him what he asked for? He wanted three times what the raft was worth, she said. He wouldn't respect me if I hadn't argued with him. It's the way you do things here. He was giving Dr. Kesri a hard look, Nick said. She was the only one not wearing a wetsuit. You can bet he's going to talk to someone about it, not to mention that the bullet hole in the Zodiac doesn't look like a tear from a rock. We need to leave right away. When we get back to the hotel, hustle out of this gear and grab your stuff. Then we'll head for the airport. Valentina was reading a magazine when they came into the villa. She put it down and stood up. I'm glad to see you back. She looked at Selena. I felt worried. Something happened, no? You had trouble? I could feel this. We had a little trouble, Selena said. You are Dr. Kesri? Valentina said. Excuse my rude sister. I am Valentina. I am pleased to meet you. Hello, Kesri said. Val, we have to get out of here right away, Nick said. Get your stuff together. I am already packed, Nick. Ditch your gun. You won't need it now. Ditch? I do not understand this. It means get rid of it, Selena said. Okay, I know perfect place. Ten minutes later, they piled into the Land Rover and headed for the airport. Nick's phone buzzed. It was Harker. Nick, I've alerted the pilots. The Gulf Stream will be waiting and ready to go. There's an American passport for Dr. Kesri being held at the airport counter in the private terminal in the name of Anahita Shirvani. It has her photograph and the proper stamps. Bring her up to speed on her legend. She's married to a rug importer in New York. Her husband's name is Mohammed. He's 51 years old. They have an apartment on West 87th Street. That was fast. The Iranians are really pissed off, she said. They figured out the operation was staged from Kuwait, and they're putting pressure on the government. Clarence and I are doing what we can, but you need to get out of there. We're on our way to the airport now, Nick said. All right, good. Call me if there's a problem. See you soon. She broke the connection. Nick told the others what she'd said. One thing I like about her, she always has our back, Ronnie said. If I didn't think we could rely on that, I'd quit, Nick said. Dr. Kesri, when we get to the terminal, you have to pick up a passport. Do you think you can act naturally? I've been pretending as if nothing is wrong for a long time. It will not be a problem. Nick went over the story with her about who she was supposed to be. They parked the Land Rover outside the terminal and went in. At the counter, Kesri retrieved the passport. As they started for the gate, Fahad al-Azmi came through the terminal doors. Two armed soldiers were with him. Ah, oh, Mr. Carter, I'm afraid there is a problem with your departure. Oh, what problem is that? There's been an unfortunate incident with our Iranian neighbors. You will recall that I cautioned you about such things? I don't know what you're talking about. Nick said. We haven't been anywhere near Iran. Whatever this incident is, it has nothing to do with us. I don't know anything about it. Al-Azmi looked at Kesri. I see you have a new member with your party. This is Mrs. Shirvani. Her husband is a friend of ours. We're giving her a ride back to the States. How very convenient for her. He turned to Kesri. May I see your passport, please? She handed him the well-worn passport. Al-Azmi flipped through the pages, looking at the numerous stamps. What is your business here? My husband imports rugs from the Gulf region, Kesri said. I act as his agent. It requires someone who can evaluate quality and workmanship. Beyond the glass doors of the terminal, Nick saw a black SUV pull up. Two men in military uniforms got out and came in. One of them was tall, athletic-looking. His face was angular, his nose large, his eyes black and piercing. His crisp uniform bore shoulder boards with two crossed swords and a crown. Al-Azmi looked surprised. He snapped to attention. General Karim, what is going on here? General, I believe these are the people responsible for the incident at Boucher. I was about to bring them in for questioning. You are... Major Fahad Al-Azmi, sir. Major, do you enjoy your work? Yes, sir. Then I assume you would like to continue doing it. Yes, sir. Listen to me carefully. You will not bring these people in for questioning. 
you will not further delay their departure. Do you object to this? Al-Azmi looked as if he had swallowed something unpleasant. He opened his mouth and closed it again. No, sir. I am pleased to hear it. The general turned to Nick. You are free to go. However, I suggest you do not return. If you do, you will find you are no longer welcome here. I trust I make myself clear? Very clear, general. Thank you. Good. Major Al-Azmi, accompany our guests to their plane. Make sure they depart. Sir! Waves of heat rippled from the tarmac where the plane waited. Selena and the others boarded the plane. Nick was the last. He put his foot on the steps. Al-Azmi gave him a look filled with hatred. I don't know how you made this happen, but do not come back to Kuwait, Mr. Carter. And here I was going to tell you to stop by if you ever got to America, Nick said. I were you, I'd watch my step. I don't think you're too popular with General What's-His-Name. You are an arrogant infidel, Al-Azmi said. Maybe so. Nick turned and climbed the steps. As the co-pilot pulled the door shut, he caught a last glimpse of Al-Azmi, the corners of his mouth pulled down in anger. Chapter 12 Two days after returning from Kuwait, the team was in Elizabeth's office, along with Kesri, Hood, and Stephanie. When you hear what Dr. Kesri has to say, you'll understand why getting her out of Iran was important, Elizabeth said. You took the risk to extract her. You deserve to know why. I want to repeat the warning I gave you about the problems we could run into if this gets out. No one outside this room must know what you're about to hear. This sounds ominous, Selena said. I meant it to. We just took a stick and poked it into a very big secret hornet nest. Sooner or later, someone will take exception to that. So be on your guard. You think we're at risk here at home? Nick asked. Clarence and I agree it's possible. We don't know yet how far this goes, but we're dealing with a serious threat. It's best to be prepared for any eventuality. Wonderful, Selena said. Consider us warned, Nick said. What's going on? What do you know about the field of neuroscience? Nothing, really. I assume it's the study of how the brain and nervous system operates. That's basically right. It's a discipline that goes back as far as ancient Egypt, if you include early attempts at brain surgery and treating things like epileptic seizures. I want you to listen while Dr. Kesri explains her research, what she was working on and what she was doing in her laboratory. Then you'll understand why it's a good thing we acted. Doctor? Kesri's face showed fatigue and stress. There were dark pockets under her brown eyes. She clasped her hands together in her lap. I will try to explain my research for you, she said. I know you do not have a scientific background. However, in order to understand what I'm going to tell you, you need to know about a fundamental principle of modern neuroscience. We call it CRISPR. Sounds like a cracker, Lamont said. Kesri smiled. I can see why you might think that. CRISPR is an abbreviation. It stands for Clustered Regularly Interspaced Short Palindromic Repeats. These are DNA sequences that repeat themselves, like a palindrome, the same forward or backward. My particular field is genetic neuroscience. I work with genes and strands of DNA. Why do I have a feeling I'm not going to like where this is going? Nick said. Please, Harker said, let her talk. Sorry, Director. It's all right, Kesri said. Please feel free to interrupt or ask questions. The point of this research is to discover ways to interfere with the diseases that affect humanity. For example, a disease like Alzheimer's. The causes are not fully known, although the mental and physical effects are well documented. What if we could alter the deterioration of brain cells and neural connections before the disease could wreak its damage. Or consider if there was a cancerous tumor. Perhaps we could block or shrink its developments. These are the kinds of possibilities neurogenetics offers. My research has been in applied genetic engineering, 
developing a kind of magnetized protein that can affect the brain. By stimulating this protein, it is possible to control groups of neurons and the circuits they are involved with. You can manipulate this protein and affect the brain? Selena asked. Yes. How would you introduce it into the brain? This was a major challenge for me. At first, I developed a complex system with many steps. This created inherent problems, as the process could break down at any one of those different points. But you solved this. Yes, I created a process that allows the protein to attach itself to a virus. This eliminated all the previous steps. A virus can carry the protein through the blood-brain barrier. Then it can be stimulated by electronic transmission to produce a change in neural activity. Wait a minute, Nick said. Are you saying that once this protein gets into someone's brain, it can be activated by remote transmission? That is correct. But how would that affect something like Alzheimer's? As a function of the genetic component, Kesri said, the protein can be programmed to affect any genetic sequence desired. Someone's DNA? Of course. Genes and DNA are inseparable. So you could affect any individual as long as you had a sample of his DNA? Kesri looked uncomfortable. More than that. At first, I was sure an individual sample would be necessary. However, that turned out not to be the case. It is possible to affect the neural activity of anyone affected by the combination of virus and protein. The protein will respond to the transmission. Depending on the nature of the signal, different results may be obtained. What kind of results? Selena asked. It is possible to affect logical thought. For example, one could stimulate dopamine release to create pleasure as a reward for behavior. Or, just as easily, create confusion, fear, pain, unbearable headaches. The protein can interfere with involuntary nervous processes like heart rhythms or breathing. You could stop someone's heart. Yes. You're talking about a weapon. In the wrong hands, my research is a disaster. That is why I decided to defect. You think your research is being used to create a weapon? Nick asked. At first, I didn't think that. But now, I am certain of it. What made you change your mind? My work is funded by the government. Everything is documented and checked. It was about a year ago when I discovered that the protein didn't have to be linked to a specific subject. Soon after that, things changed. Security was hardened. My personal life was subjected to more restrictions. I couldn't go anywhere without specific permission. I was always accompanied by armed guards. I felt they were there to keep an eye on me, more than protecting me from some unidentified threat. Tell them about the German who visited your laboratory. Elizabeth said. A foreigner had never been escorted through my laboratory before, Kesri said. I was told only that this man was important and that I should demonstrate how the protein worked for him. How would you do that? Nick asked. With laboratory mice. Mice exposed to the protein will behave in programmed ways according to the type of transmission sent to them. The experiment uses a control group which have not been exposed. They are unaffected by the transmission. In this way, I was able to demonstrate the effectiveness of the protein. Go on. The visitor spoke only German. We talked through a translator. I did not like him. The demonstration was successful. Toward the end of the experiment, he wanted to see the transmission disrupt neural activity. When I pointed out that this would result in the death of the laboratory animals, he said to me, they're only mice. I was told to proceed. It is not a pretty thing to see what happens when brain activity is fully disrupted. It was bad in mice. I could imagine how it would look if the subjects were human. It would work just as well with humans, 
Lamont asked. Yes. After that, I started to worry. A few days after the visit by this man, I was called into the office by my superior. He began a review of my research. He referred to a folder on his desk when he had a specific question and made a note. Then he was called away for a few moments. He told me to wait for his return. You looked at the folder, didn't you? Nick said. How could I not? The questions he was asking were unusual, mostly to do with production of the protein, potential problems, timelines, like that. Inside the folder were two sheets of paper. The top page listed the same questions he had been asking me. The second page was a copy of a letter to the Minister of Health requesting that these questions be answered. That page had the corporate headings of a pharmaceutical company. Which company? Gutenberg AG. Gutenberg AG is a big outfit, Elizabeth said. They produce antivirals, antibiotics, and biologic drugs. It's owned by an American, Carl Hauser. The billionaire? That's him. Man, Lamont said, I've heard of him. He's supposed to be one of the three or four richest men in the world. Harker continued, The question is, why would the Iranians give his company access to Dr. Kezri's research? Iran has a highly developed pharmaceutical industry. Why would they need to bring in Hauser? This is what I asked myself, Kezri said. His company has enormous manufacturing facilities compared to what is available in my country. I think my government has made a deal with this man to produce the protein in large amounts. I think they intend to use my work to control or kill many people. Maybe attack Israel, maybe something else, I don't know. I found out they were testing my research in another location and something went wrong. Everyone in that lab died. I do not want to help them kill people. It is why I defected. The lab in the video. Elizabeth thought, I have a question, Nick said. If someone wants to use this as a weapon, how would they go about it? How would it be deployed? The easiest way would be to introduce a virus into the targeted population, Kesri said. That part is perhaps not very hard. Then create a vaccine to inject the protein into the body. After that, the virus would carry it to the brain. More difficult is transmission of the activating signal. Could it be done with existing technology? Yes, with cell phone technology. But it would require cooperation by government agencies controlling transmission systems and towers. That's the only way. It is possible transmissions could be sent from satellites that also would require government cooperation. Any government that did that would start a war, Nick said. It would be an act of lunacy. When did that ever stop anyone, Ronnie said. You are cynic, Valentina said. Nah, I'm a realist. Elizabeth tapped her pen on her desk. Any other questions for Dr. Kesri? I have one, Selena said. Once people have been infected with this virus containing the protein, is there any way to block the transmission that activates it? No, Kesri said, not in a practical sense. A Faraday cage will stop the transmission. Perhaps some people will be protected because of being inside. That would depend on the structure of the building. Aside from that, no. I can think of a way, Nick said. Destroy the transmitter. Gotta find it first, Lamont said. We can't go around destroying cell phone towers. And what if the signal's from a satellite? We'll brainstorm this later. Elizabeth said, if no one has any more questions, Clarence is going to take Dr. Kesri someplace where the Iranians can't find her. Chapter 13 Carl Hauser lived in a sprawling mansion set on 2,000 acres of prime Texas hill country near Austin. Built of granite and timber, the house radiated money and power. The entrance was marked by a 400-year-old marble fountain where angels and demons wrestled in eternal struggle under soaring streams of water. To the left of the main house was a complex of smaller buildings. A garage with 20 bays housed a collection of exotic cars. 
Beyond the garage were a helicopter hangar and concrete helipad. A large shop contained all the equipment and supplies necessary to maintain the property. The servant quarters and security force barracks were in a two-story building behind the garage. A windowless square building next to the barracks housed a massive Cray supercomputer, banks of security monitors, and the communications center. It took a lot of people to maintain Hauser's sense of well-being. Everyone who lived on the estate had only one purpose, to serve him. Hauser seldom left his luxurious home. Occasionally, he would appear at certain key events, an important charity perhaps, or an exclusive gathering of financial and government leaders. The meetings that really mattered were never seen by the public. Hauser found people distasteful. There were few reasons to expose himself to the common mass of humanity. Everything he needed to conduct his empire was here in Texas, at his fingertips. His communication systems used encrypted security that was better than the CIA's. He could meet remotely with anyone he chose anywhere in the world without fear of being overheard. Like Napoleon, a person he greatly admired, Hauser was a short man. He topped out at little over five feet four inches tall, an unchangeable fact that had shaped his life. He was not particularly good-looking. His face was pinched, his skull elongated as if it had been squeezed. His eyes were black as coal. His nose was sharp and pointed like the beak of a predatory bird. Hauser was finishing his breakfast in the dining room. A silent servant dressed as an English butler stood discreetly to one side. Hauser was thinking about Kesri and considering what to do about her. News of her defection had arrived the night before. How could those fools have allowed her to escape? At first, he'd been angry. With time to think, his anger changed to reasoned assessment of the damage done. The fact was that Kesri was no longer needed, or essential to success. Her work was already in the hands of others. Development of a modified virus to carry the genetic protein she had engineered was well underway at his German facility. Kesri hadn't known she'd been working for him, but it didn't matter. She knew too much. Her defection could not be tolerated. Retribution was required. He decided to make it today's first order of business. He addressed the butler. Harrison, have fresh coffee sent to the library. At once, sir. Get hold of Strecker. Send him to me. Yes, sir. Gerhard Strecker was Hauser's chief of security. He was also a man entirely without morals or conscience. Hauser got up and made his way to the library in the east wing of the mansion. The library was the nerve center of his business empire, a room deceptive in appearance, considering the kind of power that emanated from it. At first glance, it seemed a place for peaceful contemplation and study a bucolic scene of the English countryside painted by John Constable dominated one wall, a painting worth many millions of dollars. Two of the walls were lined from floor to ceiling with books, including the complete works of the great philosophers from Plato to Nietzsche. Hauser had read and studied them all. He was particularly fond of Nietzsche. A life-sized marble bust of Nietzsche was mounted in a place of honor, near tall windows that overlooked the rolling acres of the estate. Beneath the windows was an ornate desk of walnut, inlaid with gold and mother of pearl. It had once belonged to Tsar Nicholas II. A large monitor placed on the polished surface seemed like an insult to the graceful beauty of the desk. Hauser sat down and placed his hand on a scanner to the left of the computer. The monitor lit with swirling colors, a robotic voice sounded from hidden speakers. Waiting. A servant appeared bearing a silver tray and coffee service. Hauser indicated a side table between two leather armchairs. Set it there. Yes, sir. Hauser dictated details about Kesri's defection, information he'd gotten from his contacts in Iran. When he was done, he told the computer to print it. Hauser got up took the sheet of paper from the printer and went over to the table. He sat down in one of the armchairs and poured a cup of coffee. 
there was a light knock at the open door. You sent for me, sir? Yes, Gerhardt, come in. Sit down. Have some coffee. It's a new blend I'm trying. Comes from high up in the Andes. Gerhard Strecker was in charge of worldwide security for Hauser's businesses. 35 years old, a little over six feet tall, he was an intimidating presence. He was muscular, square-jawed, blonde-haired, rugged-looking. Hauser sometimes found himself thinking the man resembled a character out of a second-rate action comic. But there was nothing second-rate about Strecker. His eyes were cold, hard blue. Women found Strecker attractive, but those who got close to him soon regretted it. Strecker wore a tailored suit that concealed the shoulder holster he habitually wore. His white shirt gleamed in the morning light coming through the windows. His tasteful silk tie displayed a perfect Windsor knot. His shoes were shined to perfection. Hauser appreciated Strecker's attention to detail, just as he appreciated the fact that his chief of security was no ordinary thug. For thug, he was. Strecker was the product of a first-class European education, intelligent, ambitious, and competent. He was one of those people who are born without the capacity for human empathy, which made him useful for Hauser's purposes. His private life was not something for public scrutiny. Hauser was aware of Strecker's peculiar addictions, but chose to overlook them. Strecker, in turn, made sure nothing he did off-duty could come back in a way to endanger his employer. Their relationship was based on unspoken recognition of something dark that lived within each of them and on their respective roles as leader and follower. Strecker sat and helped himself to coffee. I have a problem, Hauser said. I'd like you to take care of it for me. Anything I can do to help, sir. Hauser handed him the sheet of paper he'd dictated. Briefly, he explained about Kezri's defection. He didn't bother elaborating on what exactly she had been doing or why she was important. Strecker didn't need to know that. I want to know where she is now and who got her out of Iran. When you have that information, contact me. Do you want her eliminated? Possibly. We'll discuss that when you find out what I need to know. Yes, sir. This takes priority, Gerhardt. Turn over your other duties to Jensen. Richard Jensen was Strecker's deputy. Davos is next week. There's been no change in your plans? Strecker asked. No, no change. I'm going. I'll try to get this done before then. I like to be present when you are away from the compound. I appreciate your loyalty, Gerhardt, but don't let that distract you from finding Kesri. Of course not, sir. Strecker finished his coffee. If you'll excuse me, I'd better get started. Close the door after you. With Strecker gone, Hauser turned his thoughts to the upcoming meeting of the Global Future Symposium at Davos. The GFS brought members of the financial, scientific, business, and political elite together to brainstorm solutions to the world's many problems. Predictably, Plans produced by the meetings were met with hostility and resistance by the common people. They simply didn't have the intelligence to appreciate that what was planned and implemented by their betters was for their own good. Soon, that won't be much of an issue, Hauser thought. He sat, enjoying his coffee. It really was a tasty blend. Chapter 14 Elizabeth closed the file on Carl Hauser and turned to Stephanie. We need to know more about this man, Steph. What he's planning. What he's doing. I thought you might say that, Stephanie said. There's a way we can find out. What do you have in mind? The man's an eccentric. Anyone else would run all those corporations he owns from an office somewhere in a big city. Hauser isn't like that. He's almost a recluse. He hates being in public. He controls everything from his house in Texas. You can't do that without sophisticated computer technology. Go on. I looked up the plans for his compound. His servers are on site. If I can hack into them, we might find out what we need to know. At least some of it, anyway. You think you can get past the firewalls without being detected? I got into Langley without being blocked or traced. It couldn't be harder than that. 
You know I like a challenge. Hmm. All right, give it a try. The gold bangles on Stephanie's wrist jingled against each other as she rose from her chair. I'll let you know as soon as I have something. She paused at the entrance of the computer room for a retinal scan, waited for the glass doors to hiss open, and walked to the wide console that was the heart of her domain. She sat down and sighed. Are you all right, Stephanie? The sound you just made indicates possible distress. I'm fine, Freddie. Thank you for asking. It's just nice sometimes to sit down in a comfortable chair and take a load off my feet. Perhaps you should lose some weight, Stephanie. Then there would not be so much of a load for your feet. Let's not go there, Freddy. I was making a joke, Stephanie. That wasn't very funny, Freddy. You have a lot to learn about humor. Anyway, we have a job to do. Is it a difficult job? I think you'll find it challenging. I enjoy a challenging task, Stephanie. What will we be doing? I want to hack into another computer. I'm certain the security is very high. I need you to probe the firewalls and tell me what we're up against. Where is the computer located? In Texas. Please access your database for data on Carl Hauser. Accessing now. I have the information. Do you have the location of his servers? Yes, Stephanie. Good. Begin probe. When you discover the firewall, display the coding for me. Do not attempt to gain access. Probing now. There was a pause of a few seconds. There are four firewalls. I am displaying the sequencing and coding for you now. Four was more than she'd expected. It made it more difficult, but not impossible. Please print the information. The printer chattered. When it was done, Stephanie looked at the results. Line after line after line of code. This was going to take a while. She got to work. As she analyzed the programming, she found herself admiring the thinking behind it. It was elegant. There was no other word for it. It was going to be a real challenge to break through. Several hours later, she rubbed her eyes and stretched, certain she'd found a way in. Her fingers flew over the keys, her monitor filled with lines of code. Freddy? Yes, Stephanie? Are you ready to go? I am always ready, Stephanie. She hit enter. Working. Now all she had to do was wait. Freddy would do the rest. Unless he ran into a problem, then she might have to intervene. She stretched again. Lord, she was tired. She hadn't been getting much sleep lately. Lucas was overworked, coming home late more often than not. She looked forward to the day when he'd leave Langley. She was amazed that he was still there. He'd gotten to where he was on his own merit, but Lucas was Clarence Hood's protege. Hood had been opposed to the new regime. In the politics of the intelligence world, Hood's former patronage meant Lucas was a marked man. I have accessed the core directory. Look for anything involving Dr. Jalay Kesri. Any mention of magnetized protein, virus, or Iran. The printer began spitting out paper. There are many files, Stephanie. I will... Freddy? I have been detected. Countermeasures are... The computer went silent. Freddy? There was no response. Freddy, please reply. The monitor on her desk went dark. Shit, Stephanie said. Chapter 15 Elizabeth had dressed in her usual black pantsuit and a white blouse. A gold and emerald salamander was pinned over her left breast. Everyone was present. We have a problem, she said. Freddy is offline. Freddy's down? Selena asked. What happened? I hacked into Hauser's mainframe, Stephanie said. It was going well. I got through the firewalls. There were a lot of files referencing Kesri. I started downloading. Then Freddy said he'd been detected and that countermeasures were being taken. A second later, he shut down. Uh-oh, Lamont said. Yes, uh-oh. 
Whatever they did, it activated an emergency shutdown I'd programmed in as a failsafe. That can only happen if Freddy's firewalls have been fully compromised. Does that mean someone got into our files? Elizabeth asked. The emergency shutdown is triggered by the security breach. It happens really fast. They wouldn't have had much time to access files, but they probably got something. Do they know Freddy's location? Almost certainly. How soon will he be up and running? I can't tell you that, Elizabeth. Computer systems need a programmed, ordered sequence for trouble-free shutdown. This wasn't like that. It was a total crash. It's possible critical files may have been corrupted, but I won't know until I reboot. With Freddy, rebooting is not a simple process. If no files have been damaged, it will take most of a day. And if they have? Stephanie shrugged. Then it will take longer. I'd like to get started if you don't need me here. Go ahead, Steph. Stephanie got up and left the room. Let's review what we know, Elizabeth said. We know Hauser is in bed with the Iranians and that his pharmaceutical company was monitoring Kesri's research. He's probably been funding it as well, Nick said. Why else would the Iranians give him that kind of access? We don't know that for sure, although you're probably right. It does look like they've handed over production of the protein to him. Dr. Kesri said the carrier for the protein is a virus, Selena said. Hauser's German facility is a BSL-4, a level 4 biohazard lab. That's as high as it gets. Everything you'd need to create a perfect virus. Something nasty. Like that lab in Wuhan, Ronnie said. Yes. Not this again, Ronnie said. You think he is making virus? Valentina asked. He's making the protein. It makes sense he'd develop the carrier as well. He has the manufacturing facilities to make it happen. I don't think he'll use the virus the Iranians created, the one we saw in that video. It's too lethal, but he might develop a variation. Harker picked up her pen, set it down. I've come to realize how much we rely upon Freddy for information. With him out of the picture, it's much more difficult. We have to find out what Hauser is doing. It always comes back to the same thing, Nick said. Boots on the ground. We have to see for ourselves what he's up to. You mean get into the lab? Selena asked. That's exactly what I mean. There will be records, reports, documents, something to tell us what's happening. If we can get into the building, we'll find something. Where is it located? Ronnie asked. In Bavaria, not far from Munich, Elizabeth said. We need pictures, plans of the building if we can get them, Nick said. A lot of that will be on the web, Selena said. Plans for commercial buildings are filed in public places. It shouldn't be too difficult to get them. I'm not sure I'm comfortable with you going in there, Elizabeth said. Why not? We don't have protection anymore, remember? If something goes wrong, you'll end up in a German prison. Then I guess we'll have to make sure nothing goes wrong, Nick said. I'm serious, Nick. The White House didn't want to get Dr. Kesri out of Iran. That makes me nervous. I ask myself, why? Why refuse to help this important scientist defect? Maybe it's just that they don't want to rock the boat with the mullahs? But it feels like there's something more. That's what Selena said. It's possible they don't want to help her because they don't want anyone to know what she was doing. You think they know what Kesri was doing and are deliberately turning a blind eye? Valentina looked confused. She started to say something but thought better of it. It's possible. Hauser is a big contributor to the current administration. He gave millions to the president's campaign and millions more to the president's party. That kind of money buys a lot of influence. The administration won't look kindly at us breaking into Hauser's laboratory. I don't know what they'll do if they find out, but they won't play nice. We don't have a choice, Nick said. We have to check out Hauser's lab. The mullahs hate foreigners, especially Americans. Why would they cooperate with him? Kesri may have wanted to help people, but she's created a weapon. Maybe they're planning to use it against Israel or against us. You're starting to sound like a conspiracy nut, Lamont said. 
Sometimes conspiracies are real and not paranoid fantasy. Nick is right, Valentina said. In Russia, conspiracy is way of life. I think we must know what is going on in laboratory. Yep, Lamont said. I'm in, Ronnie said. We're all in, Selena said. Elizabeth looked at them. You're all agreed? Kinda looks that way, Ronnie said. We're going to need help with this, Elizabeth said. She picked up her phone to call Hood. Chapter 16 It hadn't been difficult to pick up Kezri's trail. She'd left Iran in a boat, and there weren't many places she could go by water. The logical choice was Kuwait. He'd learned Kezri had been there and had left in a private plane. He'd tracked the plane to Washington. It was leased to an American think tank called the Hood Foundation, run by a former director of the CIA. That piece of information gave him a key link in the chain leading to Kesri. It was also interesting in its own right. Was the foundation a front for the CIA? If it was, why use a well-known public figure for something as politically explosive as the extraction? No, they wouldn't do that. Someone else was behind it. Someone with big cojones. It took balls of brass to pull off something like this. From a professional point of view, Strecker admired the way they'd set up the operation and spirited Kesri away. He figured that somehow they'd managed to get her into that conference at the hotel. It would have been difficult, perhaps impossible, to get her out of Tehran. But from a hotel on the beach? He had to admire the planning, even if the execution had been flawed to the tune of several dead Iranians. The Iranians had probably been tipped off. Well, there was almost always something that went wrong with a complicated operation like this. There had been no mention of Kesri's defection in the American news media. That told him a lot. The defection of an important scientist like her ought to be headline news. The White House would play it up as a success if they were behind it. Strecker knew the president had ignored her request for help because Hauser had told him. The more he thought about it, the more he was convinced this was a private operation. He wasn't clear why someone would go to all that trouble. Perhaps it was a competitor of Hauser's or someone who wanted to embarrass the American administration. It didn't matter. What mattered was that he was getting closer to finding out where Kesri was hiding. It was a gut feeling, something instinctive that had never let him down in the past. Making use of Hauser's resources, Strecker discovered Hood's private address in an exclusive suburb in Maryland. It was unlikely she'd be hiding there. Hood probably had her stashed in a safe house somewhere. Sooner or later, he would go to her. When he did, Strecker would be right behind him. He'd contacted Hauser and briefed him. She's somewhere here in the Washington area, I'm sure of it. What do you want me to do when I find her? Eliminate her. What if she's not alone? That is your decision. Just make sure she's dead. Be discreet. Strecker finished cleaning the pistol and reassembled it. Then he turned his attention to the scoped Remington 700 he preferred for long-distance work. Humming to himself, he began on the rifle. There was something soothing about maintaining the perfect function of the tools of his trade. He hadn't enjoyed driving from Texas, but it was the easiest way to bring the weapons. In addition to the guns, he'd brought a kilo of C4, just in case. Picturing the different ways he might kill Kesri and take care of Hauser's problem, he felt a stir in his groin. After he'd taken care of her, he'd find an accommodating companion and enjoy himself. This time, he'd keep control. It wouldn't do to have to clean up afterwards, the way things had turned out the last time. Chapter 17 Freddy was still offline, but pictures of Hauser's laboratory in Germany were up on the monitor in Elizabeth's office. A low white building situated on an artificial lake stood out against the mountain splendor of the Bavarian countryside. Cows grazed in a nearby field. It looked like a pleasant place to work. Looking at that, 
You'd never guess the evil shit going on in there, Lamont said. It's not far from there to Dachau, Selena said. It's a pretty little town, as long as you don't visit the concentration camp the Nazis built there. Somehow, I don't think it's an accident Hauser picked this part of Germany for his laboratory, Nick said. Bavaria was the heart of Hitler's Germany. You think Hauser is a Nazi? Ronnie asked. Not in the sense of swastikas and all that bullshit, but I get the feeling his way of thinking might be the same. Why else would he fund research that could be used to kill millions? You don't need marching bands and flags to be a Nazi. It's a state of mind. Let's talk about the mission, Elizabeth said. Our first priority is to find out what Hauser is doing with Kizri's research. Is he manufacturing the protein she created? That's what the Iranians want. What about a virus to carry it? He could create that in the BSL-4 lab he has there. I've been thinking about this, Nick said. Let's assume he's doing both, manufacturing the protein and creating a virus to spread it into the general populace. All right, Elizabeth said. Assume that. Go on. If that's what he's doing, we have a duty to stop him. How? Destroy the facility. You want to destroy it? If that's what it takes. Do you have any idea what a problem that would create? What if someone traced it back to us? They'd lock us all up in Supermax and throw away the key. It's bad enough breaking in there to try and find out what he's doing. But blowing everything up? Don't you think that's over the top? No, I don't. Have you looked at some of the public statements Hauser has made? The man's a dangerous lunatic with too much money. He's on record saying the world population ought to be reduced to less than a million people. He and his billionaire buddies don't see anything wrong with getting rid of everybody else. He believes artificial intelligence is going to make everything just dandy for people like him. As far as he's concerned, humans are an error that ought to be eliminated, and if they can't be eliminated, they should shut up and be useful. That's a little strong, Nick. No, it's the truth. That's how people like him think. Ever notice how they're busy calling anyone who opposes them a fascist or a terrorist? If that isn't the pot calling the kettle black, I don't know what is. I am confused by this, Valentina said. What pot? It means Hauser and people like him are accusing others of what they are doing. It's a way to deflect attention and give people someone else to blame. Ah, we have saying like this in Russia. Tap, tap, tap. They all looked at Harker. She set her pen down. Let's stay on purpose. Nick, you can't go in there and blow up things. What if we find proof he's building a weapon? Then we'll take that information to people who can stop it legally. Who would that be? We don't have any official standing. Even if we could get some form of legal approval, by the time that happened, it would be too late. I'm serious, Nick. You can't destroy that complex, no matter what you find. Do not blow it up, are we clear? Because if we're not, there's not going to be any mission. Nick let out a deep breath. We're clear. Good. Let's talk about logistics. Clarence will provide his plane. He'll also make sure you have what you need once you get there. You can pick it up at your hotel. If I didn't know better, I'd think he was still head of the CIA. You'll fly into Munich, rent a car, and get settled in. Make sure you keep me updated. I want to know everything you're doing. Copy that, Director. Later, Selena and Nick were driving back to the loft. She's wrong about destroying that lab, Nick said. Harker never used to hold back on a mission like this. You don't know Hauser is building a weapon. Elizabeth is right. It would create a lot of trouble, the kind of thing that could come back to haunt us. Come on, Selena. You know as well as I do that if it turns out he's producing a WMD, no one will stop him before it's too late. Not necessarily. Who's going to do anything about it? The White House? They seem to be in three monkeys mode for anything that might interfere with making money. They could even be part of this. The UN? Are you kidding? You always have to be right, don't you? 
What do you mean? Where's that coming from? You're always so damn certain you're right. Well, maybe that's not always the case. Not always, but this time I am. Harker is wrong. Think about it. Fine, Selena said. The rest of the ride home was spent in cold silence. Chapter 18 Two days later, they landed in Germany. They rented a Mercedes at the Munich airport and drove into town. Selena had booked a five-star hotel located near the city center. It featured a Michelin-rated restaurant, luxurious rooms with high ceilings, and service in the European tradition of grand hotels. Taking weapons with them to Europe wasn't in the cards. They no longer had diplomatic passports to ward off curious customs inspectors. Instead, a package waited for them at the hotel desk. Inside were pistols and ammunition. Hood had provided other useful items, including tranquilizer guns and darts, that provided a silent, non-lethal option for taking out any opposition. A man shot with one of those darts would be unconscious within seconds and stay that way for hours. Half an hour after they'd checked in, the team met in Nick and Selena's suite. Nick spread out plans of the laboratory on a low coffee table, along with satellite shots and photographs of the area. The building was single story. A chain-link fence with a wide sliding gate surrounded the property. A guardhouse was located inside the gate. There were no other obvious signs of security. A paved drive went past an artificial lake to the gate, ending in a parking lot in front of the building. There's a lot we don't know, Nick said. Potential problems. Like, what kind of security Hauser has set up? Ronnie said. That's one of the unknowns. I assume it's serious, even if we don't see much evidence of it. Hauser isn't going to hire a bunch of rent -a cops I'd guess ex-military, probably special forces. You can bet they'll be armed with the latest gear. That guardhouse is going to be manned around the clock. There will be cameras covering everything and someone inside to watch them. Or at least, that's how I'd do it. He pointed at one of the pictures. Across from the lab on the other side of the highway was a large three-story building, all whitewash and timber. In front was a patio with tables and umbrellas. There's an inn across from the target. It's an obvious tourist spot. I'm thinking we drive by the lab and do an initial recon, then come back to the inn and have a long lunch. We can watch the building from there. With a little luck, we'll learn something. Lunch sounds good, Lamont said. Lunch always sounds good to you, Ronnie said. Hey, a man's gotta eat. All the junk you eat, I don't know how you stay skinny like that. Lamont grinned and patted his muscular abdomen. Good genes, my man, good genes. About the security, Nick said. One thing we've got going for us is that nothing ever happens here. Bavaria isn't Afghanistan. Guarding that lab is boring duty. It's hard to stay sharp in a civilian job where no one is shooting at you. It's human nature. They're not going to be expecting trouble. It gives us a little bit of an edge. Only if they don't see us coming, Ronnie said. That's right. But we have something that gives us an advantage. That care package we picked up at the desk had this in it. Nick held up a small metal box painted black, a toggle switch and a small red lens were the only visible features on the outside. What does it do? It puts out a field that shuts down all electrical power within a radius of a hundred yards, Nick said. Lamont, turn on that TV. Lamont went over to the television and turned it on. A newscaster was excitedly saying something in German. Watch. Nick flipped the switch on the box. A red light came on. The TV died and the lights went out in the room. He clicked the switch again. Power returned. Cool, Lamont said. This will take care of the cameras and any alarms. What else you got in there? Pistols and ammo plus these. Nick gave him one of the tranquilizer guns. Latest model, Lamont said. Could come in handy. Think of Hood as your fairy godfather. He reached into the box again. Last but definitely not least. 
Nick held up a six-pack of stun grenades. How does he get his hands on stuff like that black box? That's got to be a DARPA product. I don't know, but I'm glad he's on our side. The next day, they drove out into the Bavarian countryside. It was a beautiful day, the mountain air crisp and clean. Selena drove. The big Mercedes sedan they'd rented hummed along the highway. The five of them rode in spacious comfort. Sure is pretty country, Ronnie said. Kind of like driving through a fairy tale. German fairy tales tend to be a little dark, Nick said. Hansel and Gretel, for example. What is story, please? Valentina asked. You don't know it? German stories are not popular in Russia. It's from a collection written by two German brothers named Grimm. Hansel and Gretel are two children, brother and sister. They've been abandoned in the forest. They come across a wicked witch who lives in a house made of gingerbread and candy. She invites them in and pretends to be nice, but she just wants to fatten them up and eat them. Gretel figures it out and pushes the witch into an oven and kills her. That is not nice story. No, but it's very German. Target coming up on the right, Selena said. She slowed a little and they cruised past the building. I don't see anyone except the guy in the guardhouse, Ronnie said. Doesn't mean they're not there, Nick said. Then they were past. The inn is open, Lamont said. There are people sitting out front. Go down the road a little, then turn around and come back, Nick said. Park at the inn. Ten minutes later, Selena pulled into a parking lot by the side of the inn. They climbed out of the car. Time to play tourist, Nick said. I hope the food's good, Lamont said. They sat down at a table where they could look across the highway at the laboratory. A waitress with blonde pigtails came out of the inn, dressed in traditional Bavarian costume. She balanced a tray with four large steins of beer on one hand and a platter heaped with food on the other. They watched her glide across the patio. How does she do that? Lamont said. Those trays look heavy. The girl deposited the beers and food at a nearby table and came over. Guten Tag, she said. Guten Tag, Selena said. She said something in German. The waitress smiled and replied and went back into the inn. What did you say to her? Ronnie said. I asked her what was good today and for menus. She said the Wiener schnitzel is good. I told her to bring us four beers with the menus and a soda for Ronnie. The beer has to be good here. I like this place already, Lamont said. What's Wiener schnitzel? Usually it's a breaded pork cutlet. Nick nodded at the building across the way. Check it out. A muscular looking man in a neat blue uniform came out of the entrance and walked over to the guard shack. He wore a holstered pistol and carried a bullpup submachine gun. The way he held the gun showed easy familiarity with the weapon. The man in the shack came out to meet him. They talked for a minute, then exchanged places. Ronnie looked at his watch. Axe military for sure. Shift change. Twelve o'clock. Probably four or eight hour rotation, Nick said. No one drove up. Security must have quarters inside the building. If I were running the show, I'd make it a four-hour shift. That means at least six guards. You don't get as tired in four hours. Spotlights on the corners of the building, Lamont said. They probably go on if an alarm is triggered. It looks like any other commercial business. There's nothing unusual about the fence, nice landscaping, no obvious security except for the guardhouse. Everything is designed to keep a low profile. Hauser wouldn't want to attract unnecessary attention, Selena said. Figures. Level four biohazard labs tend to make people nervous. Here comes the beer, Lamont said. The beer was excellent. The food was good. Coffee came after. They killed an hour and a half eating lunch. Nothing much was happening across the way. I don't think there's much point in sitting here any longer, Nick said. We'll come back tonight. I need to use bathroom, Valentina said. She stood and went into the inn. Ronnie, you and Lamont go ahead. We'll meet you at the car, Nick said. Search yourself, Ronnie said. Nick waited until they were out of earshot. I didn't want to say anything when they were here. 
Has Val got something on her mind? Something bugging her? Val always has something on her mind, Selena said. Why do you ask? She's been too quiet since she got back from her last sightseeing trip. She's usually pretty high energy, but not lately. She might be a little depressed, maybe lonely. She likes it here, but it's not home. She misses Russia, and she can't go back. We aren't her people. The culture is different, the food is different, the traditions, the way people talk and think. That could explain it, Nick said. It makes sense when you put it like that. She'll snap out of it. She's one of the toughest women I've ever known. If you're right and she's depressed, it makes me wonder if she's liable to make a mistake. Things could get dicey tonight. Since she joined the team, she's never let us down. I don't think she ever will, no matter what else might be going on with her. Don't worry, Nick. Here she comes. Where are Ronnie and Lamont? They went ahead to the car. We were waiting for you. Okay. Beer ran through me very quick. Nick laughed. Yeah, that's the trouble with beer. Chapter 19 In the afternoon, they studied the plans of Hauser's facility. The biohazard lab took up most of the center of the building. A large section in a back corner was set up as quarters for the guards. There was a security station and an office near the entrance. Nick figured the office was the best shot at finding documents or records. They left the hotel after midnight. There wasn't much traffic. Earlier, Nick had noted a pasture behind the lab where half a dozen cows were grazing. It was accessed by an unpaved track. They drove past the lab. Selena cut the lights and turned onto the track. She drove a short distance and shut down the engine. A quarter moon provided faint light. They got out of the car. Nick opened the trunk and handed out the tranquilizer guns, along with black balaclavas that blended with their dark clothes. They each took a pistol and ammunition. Use the darts on the guards. We don't want to kill anyone. What if they start shooting at us? Ronnie said. Then all bets are off. Shoot back. He pointed at a large, darkened window on the right-hand corner of the building. We'll go in through that window. Ronnie, you take the gizmo that kills the power. As soon as we're near the fence, turn it on. They will know we come, Valentina said. There's no reason for them to think it's anything but a normal outage. By the time they know it isn't, we'll have neutralized them. What about emergency backup power? Ronnie asked. It shouldn't work. If it does, we'll deal with it. Stay away from the bio lab. We don't know what he's got in there. Any questions? Let's do it, Lamont said. A three-wire livestock fence ran alongside the track to keep the cows in. Lamont cut the wires and stepped through. He stopped and muttered something under his breath. What? Ronnie said in a whisper. Cow shit. I just stepped in it. They moved through the pasture. As they neared the chain-link fence, Ronnie flipped the switch on the black box. Lights in and around the building died. Lamont cut an opening in the fence. Then they were through and running toward the back. Ronnie taped the window and broke it. They climbed through the opening into a storeroom. A large cylindrical tank dominated the far corner. The door leading into the rest of the building was closed. Nick signaled, then cracked the door open. Emergency lights lit a hall leading away from the room with a harsh white glare. The black box hadn't affected them. They ran down the hall toward the front of the building. A security guard appeared at the far end. He shouted something in German. Valentina shot him with a dart as he raised his weapon. He fell to the floor, twitched, and lay still. Nice shot, Val, Nick said. He called the others, Selena said. They passed a steel door labeled with warning signs and reached the end of the hall, where the guard lay unconscious on the floor. The hall opened onto a lobby in the front of the building. Nick took out a stun grenade, pulled the pin, and tossed it around the corner. He didn't try to see if anyone was there. They shut their eyes tight, looked away, and covered their ears. Even so, the blast was numbing. White light punched through their closed eyelids. Bright after images floated in front of their vision. Nick glanced around the corner. 
Three men lay writhing on the floor. Ronnie and Lamont shot them with darts. Watch for the others, Nick said. There have to be at least two more. There's the office, Selena said. Valentina, Lamont, you cover. Ronnie, Selena, with me. They went into the office. A safe stood against one wall. Ronnie, open that up. Ronnie went to the safe and stuck C4 on the door hinges. He set the remote detonators. Better go back out, he said. Once they were clear, Ronnie triggered the charges. The explosion blew debris and dust out of the room. They went back in. The door of the heavy safe lay on the floor. Inside were several file folders on a shelf. Nick held out a bag, grabbed the folders, anything else that looks interesting. Ronnie and Selena shoveled the files into the bag. They heard someone yelling in German. The sound was followed by a burst of automatic fire. Lamont and Valentina stepped into the room. Is trouble, Valentina said. She leaned out of the door and fired her pistol. Automatic fire echoed as she ducked back. Lamont took out a stun grenade and tossed it in the direction of the shooters. The grenade detonated. The gunfire stopped. Time to boogie, Nick said. Back the way we came. Lamont, grab the bag. Ronnie, cover our six. Smoke and dust drifted through the glaring emergency lighting. Selena began coughing. They ran back past the bio lab. As they reached the room, a hail of machine gun fire came through the broken window. The rounds sent chips of plaster flying from the walls. They dropped to the floor and crawled on hands and knees toward the window and the way out. All this noise, cops will be here soon, Lamont said. Don't worry about it, Nick said. Nearest cops are miles away. Another burst of shots came through the window, striking the metal tank in the corner. A loud hissing noise was followed by the smell of gas flooding the room. This is not good, Valentina said. Out the window as soon as this goes off, Nick said. Nick pulled the pin on another stun grenade and tossed it out the window. Go. They piled out of the broken window. Two men rolled on the ground outside, clutching their ears. There was no need to shoot them. Nick and the others were halfway to the car when the tank blew. The explosion sent them sprawling. A wave of heat rolled over them. Nick got to his feet, half stunned. He looked at the laboratory. The back of the structure was gone. Long tongues of flame reached toward the sky. What was left of the lab was beginning to burn. Jesus, Lamont said. I wonder what was in that tank, Ronnie said. Selena looked at the burning building and shook her head. Elizabeth isn't going to like this, she said. Chapter 20 Gerhard Strecker drove past the safe house where Kesri was hiding. It was situated in an older residential neighborhood, set back from the curb on a small lot. The lawn was choked with weeds and needed water. It was a dull house, unassuming, a faded clone of every other house on the block. It was perfect for the purpose. No one would ever suspect a high-ranking defector was living there. The street climbed a hill to a small park with a green and white gazebo. Strecker drove up the hill, parked, and turned off the engine. He got out, went to a bench, and sat down. From where he sat, he could look down the street and see the house. It was noon, and the park was deserted. It wasn't much of a park, really. Paint was peeling on the gazebo. The grass needed cutting. It hadn't been that difficult to find Kesri. The plane that took her out of Kuwait was the first step on her trail. Ownership was a matter of public record, though it had taken a little digging to find it. It was leased to a foundation run by a former director of the CIA. He'd found out where the man lived, found a place to observe his house, then waited. He'd figured that sooner or later someone would lead him to his quarry, and he'd been right. The CIA connection had been a surprise, but it hadn't caused Strecker any concern. If anything, it made things easier. Hood was a private individual, an administrator type, not an agent. Langley would never use him for something like this. It meant Kesri's defection wasn't a government operation. There wouldn't be any FBI or CIA minders to get in the way of what he had to do. Even so, someone else was in the house with her. Watching the house, Strecker had seen four people go in and out, two at a time. They took 12-hour shifts. Kesri was too important to leave unguarded. He debated the best way to get to her. 
He could go after her up close and personal, or he could take her from a distance. Both approaches had advantages and drawbacks. When possible, Strecker preferred a distance shot. By the time anyone realized what had happened, he'd already be away. But that kind of kill required knowledge of when and where the target would be out in the open, as well as a place to set up and wait for the target to appear. With Kesri, that wasn't possible. He couldn't sit around waiting for her. He'd have to go in. That meant eliminating the guards. Strecker considered the problem. He didn't know the layout of the house. He didn't know where the guards would be or which room was Kesri's. Life wasn't like the movies, where the assassin snuck in through a convenient window and killed his target. Everything would be locked up. The guards had the look of former military. Getting in and taking them out before they could respond would be difficult, if not impossible. There was a reason why buildings like this were called safe houses. Another option would be flushing her out along with her keepers. A fire, perhaps. He could light the place up and pick her off when she came out. That was a possibility, but it didn't guarantee results, and he'd still have to deal with the guards. It would be better if no one in the house had an opportunity to escape. Strecker got up from the bench and went back to his car. He knew what he was going to do. Hauser had wanted him to be discreet, but that was not going to be possible. In the end, what mattered was the result. He didn't think Hauser would hold it against him. A little after two in the morning, Strecker returned. This wasn't the kind of neighborhood where people stayed up late. There were no streetlights. The street was dark except for an occasional porch light. Light showed behind drapes drawn in the front window of the safe house. The rest of the house was dark. He drove past and up to the park where he turned around. Strecker cut the lights and engine and rolled down the hill, pulling up across the street from his target. He picked up the package on the seat next to him and got out. He disabled the interior light. Nothing showed when he opened the car door. His shoes made no sound as he crossed the lawn. Electrical and gas meters sat by the side of the house. The gas line was a bonus. It would make the fire that much bigger and create initial confusion about the cause of the explosion. With the ease of practice, he attached a bomb to the house where the gas line entered. It didn't matter which room Kesri was in. The explosion would level the house and everything in it. There would be collateral damage to houses nearby, but wasn't that what insurance was for? It wasn't Strecker's concern. He padded back to his car and started the engine. At the bottom of the hill, he stopped. The engine idled as he took out a remote detonator. He pressed a button. Behind him, the sky lit with violent orange light. The concussion shook the car. Though he was a block away, bits and pieces of debris rained down on the roof of the vehicle. Strecker drove away, humming a meaningless tune. Chapter 21 When Elizabeth got angry, her face changed from milk white to pale crimson. It gave her green eyes a demonic look. That look had made powerful men shiver. She was angry now. What part of don't blow up the building did you fail to understand? Elizabeth said. Do you realize what a shitstorm you left behind? Nick shrugged. We didn't do it. Hauser's security was shooting at us. They hit a big tank filled with some kind of gas. It made one hell of an explosion when it went off. Elizabeth's pen beat a tattoo on her desk. They found four bodies. The building is a total loss. Two of the guards survived. They say it was a terrorist attack. Fortunately for you, that's what everyone believes. Two militant Islamic groups are claiming credit, so you're clear, at least for now. You were damn lucky to get out of there before the cops showed up. There wasn't any way to avoid the guards, Selena said. We used darts and stun grenades. If that tank hadn't blown, no one would have been killed. Do we know what Hauser was doing in there? Nick asked. The files you retrieved were coded, Stephanie said. I've got Freddy back online. He's working on it. I've scanned everything into his system. 
I estimate 2.23 minutes until completion. Hey, Freddy, are you okay? Nick asked. I am okay, Nick, thank you. Stephanie and I have instituted new security protocols to prevent future incidents. The attack on Freddy originated when I tried to get into Hauser's servers, Stephanie said. I'm working on something now to get past those firewalls. His security programming is impressive, stuff I haven't seen before. I'd love to meet the person who created it. How did Hauser react when he learned about the lab? Nick asked. He can't be happy about it. Elizabeth set her pen down. He made a public statement. First, he claimed the lab was working on a genetic crop enhancement process that would triple world wheat production. Then he blamed the attack on nationalistic elements who don't understand the need for global regulation of food production. He's made himself into a kind of green energy martyr. Green energy dictator, more like, Ronnie said. I'd be surprised if that lab had anything to do with food production, Nick said. You are correct, Nick. Have you finished analyzing the files, Freddy? Stephanie asked. Yes, Stephanie. They waited. Freddy was silent. Stephanie rolled her eyes and sighed. Would you tell us what they contain, please? The files contain records of experiments focused on three specific areas. The first is production of a genetically altered protein that is activated by electronic stimulus. The second area concerns the modification of a virus developed by the Iranians. A virus? I have determined that it is the same virus which caused the death seen in the video you placed in my database. Damn, Lamont said. You said three areas. What's the third? Development of a vaccine to counter the virus. The vaccine will be used as the vehicle to introduce the genetically altered protein into the body. That's diabolical, Nick said. How far have they gotten, Freddy? Elizabeth asked. With the exception of vaccine development, the files show that the experiments were successful. Both the protein and the viral agent have been created. The virus is a genetically altered form of swine flu and is extremely contagious, with a 72% chance of lethality if left untreated. The incubation period is less than 12 hours. 72% mortality? That is correct. They haven't got a vaccine yet? That is correct. What kind of person creates something like that? Ronnie asked. A psychopath, Selena said. He's used Kazri's work, Elizabeth said. It's just what she was afraid of, that someone would follow up on what she discovered. Just what the world needs, Ronnie said. Another bioweapon. At least it's all been destroyed, Selena said. That is not accurate, Selena. The files show delivery of samples containing the virus and the altered protein with detailed instructions for replication. Where were they sent, Freddy? Elizabeth said. I have not yet determined the physical coordinates. Shit, Stephanie said. I do not understand why humans mention excrement in certain situations. It's an expression of frustration, Freddy. You have told me this before, but it does not seem a satisfactory answer. However, I will make an additional notation in my database. Where do we go from here, Director? Nick asked. We have to find out where those samples were sent. It's more than just finding the samples, Selena said. Elizabeth reached for her pen, thought better of it. What do you mean? Dr. Kesri said the protein could be activated by a satellite signal. What are you getting at, Selena? Ask yourself, who controls the satellites? Governments, Nick said. Selena nodded. Yes, and private corporations. You think a government is behind all this? Elizabeth said. I don't know, but it has to be more than Hauser. He's only one man. It could be a small group of people the kind of people who tell governments and corporations what to do. Like Eon, Nick said. Yes. Centuries before, Eon, A-E-O-N, had begun as a secret society in Europe. In the pursuit of personal power and wealth, its members had caused the deaths of millions. You think they're still around? I thought we put them out of business for good. I don't know if they're still around, Selena said, 
I don't think it matters. There are always people with too much money who think it's their right to rule. These days, they dress it up as being for the greater good, but it's really about power and control. They don't care if a lot of people die, if that's what it takes to get their way. To them, people like us are nothing more than cannon fodder and potential slaves. That's pretty cynical, Ronnie said. Maybe, but it's true. All you have to do is look at history. The pattern is always the same. It doesn't matter what time period or culture you're talking about. Sooner or later, someone tries to take over and make everybody do what they want. Humans don't change. What changes are the weapons and technology they use to gain control? All that may be so, Elizabeth said, but it doesn't affect what we have to do. We have to track down where those samples went. From there, we can figure out the rest. We've got one thing going for us, Nick said. Those files show Hauser doesn't have a vaccine yet. If I were him, I'd wait to release the virus until I knew I could protect myself. Might buy us some time, Ronnie said. Selena's right about human nature. Sooner or later, people like Hauser crawl out from under their rocks. At least there's something you can do about it when they do. Which is, Elizabeth said, fight back. You don't give up no matter the cost. You don't let the bastards win. Takes guts, Ronnie said. That's how you tell the sheep from the wolves, Nick said. Lot of sheep out there, Lamont said. Yep, Nick said. Me, I'd rather be a wolf. I don't think you have to worry about that, Selena said. Elizabeth's phone rang. She looked at the display and picked up. Yes, Clarence. As she listened, her face grew tight. You're certain. She listened for another minute. All right. Thanks for letting me know. I'll call you later. She set the phone down. Dr. Kesri is dead. So are the minders Clarence had guarding her. What happened? Nick asked. Someone blew up the safe house with a bomb. The house was completely destroyed with everyone in it. I know the Iranians are pissed, but blowing her up doesn't make sense. It doesn't have to be the Iranians. Selena said. Selena's right, Elizabeth said. The damage to their program has already been done. They don't stand to gain anything by killing her, especially in a way that would call attention to themselves. They could do it out of revenge, Ronnie said. Revenge makes sense, Valentina said. Is very Russian thing, revenge. Yeah, but the Iranians aren't Russians, Lamont said. You think revenge is Russian only? Do not be foolish. Elizabeth shook her head. I don't think revenge is a good motive. If it isn't the Iranians, who is it? Nick asked. How about Hauser? Selena said. That's a pretty big jump. Think about it. He was the one funding her work. He's the one who used her research to create this protein. She was a problem waiting to happen. Now she's dead. She can't talk about him, her work, or anything else. There's no way we can prove that. It's tough to prove something when the principal witness is dead. What are we going to do about this guy? Nick asked. I don't know if he killed Kesri, Elizabeth said. I do know we can't let him release that virus. So we're back to square one. Not completely. We have a specific mission, to destroy those samples. First, we have to find them. Freddy is working on it, Stephanie said. He's backtracking through the invoices and those files. It's all encrypted, but we'll find out where they were sent. Elizabeth looked at her watch. Let's call it a day. Be back here tomorrow morning at eight. What about Hauser? Nick said. He's gone to Davos for the annual meeting of the Global Future Symposium. He'll be there all week. Hanging out with his billionaire buddies while they figure out how to screw the little guy, Ronnie said. Now who's being cynical? Selena said. Psst, if you want more free audiobooks, please click subscribe. Chapter 22 The view was spectacular from the window of Hauser's private jet. Few places in the world were as beautiful as the Swiss Alps. Hauser was too preoccupied to take notice. Kesri had been taken care of, but the way Strecker had done it was far from discreet. Luckily for him, 
the authorities had decided the explosion was due to a gas leak. Of much greater concern was the attack on the laboratory in Germany. He would find out who was behind it. When he did, there would be payback. In the meantime, the loss of the lab was a major setback, something he'd have to explain to the others. Everything was in place to begin the next phase of the plan. His position of authority rested on his ability to produce results. Failure to produce results led to unpleasant outcomes. Samples of the virus and protein were stored in a secure facility known only to him. He had already taken steps to move production to another laboratory, one unknown to the annoying inspectors from the agencies. At most, the delay would amount to no more than a week or two. More important was the development of a vaccine. There had been promising results to some of the experiments. Once he had a solution, millions of doses could be manufactured on short notice. There would be no obstacles to a fast rollout from the government. That had already been taken care of. There would be the usual protests when the vaccine program was announced, but the group was prepared for that. The virus was quite virulent. Once people began dying, there would be a worldwide rush to get the shot. The profits from the vaccine would be enormous. Governments would make vaccination mandatory. Resistance to taking the vaccine would be suppressed in the name of the greater good. How he loved that phrase. It could be used to justify almost anything and get people to go along with it. There would be two vaccines, although the public wouldn't know that. One would contain the protein, the other would not. That was reserved for people like himself, those who were needed to establish the new order of things. His research team had assured him success in formulating the two versions was imminent. Hauser decided his position within the group was still secure, Whatever criticisms were leveled against him during the upcoming meeting could be deflected. The plane landed and taxied to the private terminal. A black Mercedes limousine with darkened windows waited as Hauser stepped from his plane. Customs inspections were waived for people like him. An assistant would take care of the necessary stamps on his passport. A chauffeur held the door open for him as he got into the limo. A large, older man sat on the far side of the leather seat. His face was reminiscent of one of those dog breeds that displayed drooping folds of skin. His eyes were a watery blue, surrounded by rims of fiery red. His hair was gray and thinning. His skin was mottled here and there with brown spots. Baron Friedrich von Breitenbach controlled a vast banking complex that spread in an intricate web across Europe. On the surface, he appeared to control only a small consortium of private banks with headquarters in Hamburg. The reality was quite different. Breitenbach was one of the 10 richest men in the world, a key player within the group. Hello, Carl. Breitenbach's voice was hoarse and wet, as if something had died inside his throat. Baron? I trust you had a smooth flight. Very smooth, thank you. I thought I would take this opportunity to spend a few moments alone with you before we meet with others. I'm always pleased to see you, Baron. I was sorry to hear of what happened in Germany. Yes, it was unfortunate. However, it will not interfere with our agenda. I had made alternative arrangements in the unlikely event of a problem there. Production will resume within a week. Good, good. I am gratified to hear it. The limousine began moving. A soundproof partition with a raised glass window separated passengers and driver. A cabinet with glass doors on the back of the partition displayed a bar and several bottles. Breitenbach opened the cabinet. He took out a bottle and two crystal glasses. This is a particularly fine schnapps from my estate in Austria, made from pears. I think you will enjoy it. He poured and handed a glass to Hauser. Your health. And yours. The liquor was smooth, delicious. It tasted like sunlight and youth. 
leaving a feeling that all was well in the world. Extraordinary, Hauser said. He held his glass up to the light, marveling at the subtle color of the liquid. Truly extraordinary. Baron von Breitenbach nodded, pleased. There are four bottles left. I'll have one sent to your room. Thank you. Hauser took another sip. Baron, I don't think you took the trouble to meet me simply to share a drink. You Americans are so direct, Carl. Of course, you are correct. I am concerned about the cooperation of our French partner, Fournier. Charles Fournier was the founder and CEO of Sky Ventures, the biggest private aerospace company in the world. As you are aware, he is responsible for providing the satellites we need. Is he still making excuses? You grasp the essence of the issue. This is unacceptable. Von Breitenbach contemplated the liquor in his glass. I am beginning to believe Fournier is having second thoughts about the plan. Then we must do something about it. Those are my thoughts exactly, Breitenbach said. The Mercedes had left the airport grounds. Now they were winding through the countryside, headed to the conference center where the Global Future Symposium was about to begin a week of discussions. Have you spoken with the others about this? Hauser asked. I have had a few casual conversations, yes. I'm afraid they are more inclined to believe Fournier's explanations than I am. He has allies. Hauser nodded. Crampton. Sir Peter Crampton owned a chain of food distribution outlets. He controlled 78% of Western Europe's food supply. Yes, also Romanov. Romanov? That surprises me. What about Radu? You know what he's like. He'll wait to see which way the wind is blowing and act in his own interests. I was unable to determine his position, Breitenbach said. He's not been well lately. He will not be at the meeting. If they all support Fournier, it will be difficult to force him to cooperate. I wonder why he's gotten cold feet. I think he has become a victim of his conscience. Oh, dear. I didn't think he had one. That won't do. I may have to confront him at the meeting tomorrow. I would like your support if that becomes necessary. Hauser held up the glass of schnapps, then drained it. You may count on me, Baron. Chapter 23 The Global Future Symposium featured live interviews and lectures by important world figures. Some of these were recorded and broadcast worldwide, a primary way that GFS worked to shape world opinion. While outside observers were distracted by the public events, the future of humanity was being decided in a room on the second floor of the conference center, far from the cameras and annoying questions of the world press. Hauser called the meeting to order. He was currently the chair, a position based on majority vote by the members. Each of the members was a multi-billionaire. Each ruled a personal corporate empire. No one could tell them what to do. Decisions that affected all of them had to be arrived at by discussion and majority agreement. Not that this was always easy to accomplish. The difficulty with getting Charles Fournier to cooperate was a case in point. The meeting had been underway for over an hour. They had discussed the destruction of Hauser's laboratory, production of the virus and protein, and a timeline for development and distribution of the vaccine. Now they moved on to the problem of satellite activation of the protein. Von Breidenbach turned to Fournier. Charles, I'm hoping you can relieve our anxiety regarding that satellite transmission. Fournier was a large man with a florid face, a testimony to his predilection for fine foods and expensive wine. His silk suit displayed tailoring typical of the French, with sharp lapels, and emphasized shoulders. The clothes failed to conceal the fact that he was overweight, a man of soft physique at best. My dear Baron, Fournier said, you simply don't understand the complexity of what is required. Breitenbach decided it was time to show his displeasure. Oh, please, Charles, 
Your satellites can pinpoint the location of any individual on the planet. You have the capability to listen to or interfere with any type of electronic transmission anywhere in the world. Yet you insist on telling us that it's too difficult to transmit a series of simple signals to activate the protein. Forgive me for not believing you. It makes me wonder why you are stalling. I'm beginning to feel you are no longer committed to our cause. How dare you question my intentions, Fournier said. I am as committed to our grand vision as you are. I am merely concerned about the massive death toll that will result from the release of the virus. I am not convinced it's the best way to achieve success. So you admit that you have been stalling. I prefer to think of it as a period of reflection on methodology, Fournier said. I believe we should reconsider. Reconsider, Breitenbach said. You want to change the plan after all the work we put into it? Hauser held up his hand. Baron, if you will. Charles, suppose we did change the plan. What would you offer in its place? We don't need to add to what we're already doing, Fournier said. Our current actions are bearing fruit. World food and energy production has been severely curtailed. This will shortly result in greater control of the various populations. The corruption of traditional social values and suppression of political opponents is well underway. Our propaganda efforts are succeeding. Our polls show that a growing number of the general populace believes the planet is at risk due to human causes. The idea of creating a single unifying governmental body to address planetary issues is gaining acceptance. It's only a matter of time until we achieve full control of those governments that still resist integration. This virus is a lethal wild card. It could mutate beyond our ability to counteract it. I see no reason to release it, and many reasons not to. Hauser's voice was quiet. Are we then to understand that you refuse to provide the satellites required for transmission of the signals? I'm simply asking that we reconsider our options, Fournier said. It is my right as a member of the council to request this. I move we put it to a vote, Romanov said. Pavel Romanov was chief among the oligarchs who controlled Russian resources. He had built his fortune on the ruins of the Soviet Union. Shrewd and intelligent, he knew how to use his great wealth in ways that advanced the Kremlin's agendas while promoting his own. He was one of the architects of Russia's alliance of convenience with China. For the group's plan to succeed, it was necessary to find ways to counteract and weaken American military strength. Romanov was distantly related to the czars that had ruled imperial Russia. The fact that his family had survived the purges of the Bolshevik Revolution and risen to prominence in the days of the Soviet Union said a lot about the genes his forebears had passed on to him. What exactly is the motion? Hauser said. Huh. I move that we consider other options besides releasing the virus. How much time do you think we should take for consideration? I think a month would be sufficient. Peter Crampton spoke up. I agree. A one-month delay. Seconded. All in favor? Hauser asked. Fournier, Crampton, and Romanoff raised their hands. So moved. We will initiate a one-month delay to consider alternative courses of action. Inwardly seething, Hauser looked at his gold Rolex. Gentlemen, I believe it's time for lunch. Let's adjourn until two o'clock. We will then take up the subject of Taiwan. Breitenbach lingered behind with Hauser as the others left the room. That Cretan Fournier is trying my patience, Hauser said. It's clear he's not going to give us what we need. All that will happen as a result of this motion is that we will lose a month. There are other ways to get control of his satellites. Oh, you're sure you can gain access? I am. There are certain difficulties, but they can be overcome. It would have been much simpler if Fournier hadn't changed his mind. What shall we do about him? He's become an obstacle. 
one that needs to be removed. Do you agree? I'm afraid I do, Breitenbach said. It's too bad, really. I've rather enjoyed my infrequent visits to his chateau. He has a magnificent wine cellar. I know the perfect man for the job, Hauser said. Romanov supported delaying things. What do you think he's playing at? He's Russian. He thinks the end game will leave Russia intact as the most powerful entity in the new order. Then he's not thinking clearly. As a matter of interest, what are your ideas regarding China? When we're ready to release the virus, I suspect there will be unavoidable delays in providing sufficient quantities of vaccine to Beijing. Surely you've thought about the Chinese problem. They have far too much power. They need to be cut down to size if we are to establish overall control. A high die-off of their population will go a long way to encouraging cooperation. Breitenbach smiled. You devious bastard! Coming from you, Baron, I take that as a compliment. Chapter 24 Nick dreamed. He stood outside a boarded-up railway station. Weeds grew from cracks in the station platform and between the disused tracks. Across the way, the broken windows of an abandoned factory marched across brick walls stained dark with weather and neglect. He was looking for his car because he had to be somewhere, and he was late. People were waiting for him, depending on him. He was sure he'd park the car near the station. He could see a parking lot and walk down to it, stumbling over uneven ground. Part of the way, he had to step through snow that came up to his ankles. He was wearing tennis shoes. The wet snow got inside the shoes. He reached the parking lot. There were cars everywhere, all of them older models. He wandered around looking for the one that was his, but he couldn't find it. There was something important in the car, something he needed to get. He was getting anxious, worried about the fact he had to be somewhere, where he was supposed to do something in front of a lot of people. He searched his pockets for his phone to call Selena and tell her he was going to be late, but he didn't have it with him. He looked up and saw a man dressed in a hooded robe, someone who looked vaguely familiar. The train doesn't run anymore, the man said. You have to find a different way to get where you're going. I'm going to be late. The man shouted, Wake up! Nick bolted upright in the bed. Selena lay sleeping on her back next to him, her mouth open. A tiny bubble of spit moved on her lips as she breathed. The clock on the dresser told him it was 20 minutes before four in the morning. He got out of bed and threw on a robe, went into the kitchen and turned on the coffee maker. Then he sat at the kitchen counter, thinking about the dream. Soon, the aroma of fresh coffee filled the room. He poured a cup, went into the living area, and sat down on the couch. The dream disturbed him. There had been something familiar about the figure, but he couldn't put his finger on it. He felt unsettled. In the dream, looking for his car had made him anxious. People were waiting for him for some reason. He thought maybe he was supposed to perform for them, but what did that mean? And what was in the car that he needed to get? Usually he didn't remember his dreams, didn't pay much attention to them. But somehow this dream seemed important. Everything in the dream had looked old, abandoned, out of style. The cars in the lot were all from the 40s and 50s. There was nothing modern at all that he could remember. He thought about what the figure had said. The train doesn't run anymore. You have to find a different way to get where you're going. Nick had never been sure if dreams meant anything. From what he'd read, most people thought dreams were nothing more than the mind taking out the trash at night. Others thought dreams had meaning. They believed dreams were important messages from the unconscious, communicating in symbols with the outer mind. He'd had a recurring nightmare for years after coming back from Afghanistan. It was always the same dream replaying an event that happened during the war. He'd been forced to shoot a child who threw a grenade at him. 
The injuries caused by the grenade were bad enough to send him home. He'd told himself he'd be dead if he hadn't killed the boy, but it didn't make any difference to how he felt about it. He'd been unable to get the image out of his mind. The dream had kept showing it to him over and over. Eventually, he'd come to accept that he couldn't have done anything different and survived, and the dream went away. None of that helped with this dream. Maybe it was nothing more than a symptom of stress. The kind of work he did would stress anybody out. Selena came into the kitchen. You're up early. So are you. Coffee's hot. She poured a cup and sat down at the counter. Couldn't sleep? A dream woke me up. There wasn't much point in trying to stay in bed after that. Not that old nightmare again. No, nothing like that. We haven't been working out much these last couple of weeks. Maybe that's got something to do with it. Maybe. Come on, finish your coffee. I need to practice a new attack. Selena was ranked high in the difficult Korean martial art of Kuk Sul Won. There weren't many people anywhere who could defeat her one-on-one. -on -one. The superior physical strength of men was usually no match for her. Her skill and training had saved her life more than once. The last time you practiced a new attack on me, my back hurt for a week, Nick said. Selena laughed. Don't worry, sweetie. I'll be gentle. Chapter 25 Back in Texas, after Davos, Hauser spent time making sure production of the virus and protein was on track. Once that was handled, he turned his attention to the vaccine. Samples of the virus had been shipped to the bio lab at his Nevada manufacturing facility, where his chief of research reported progress. Satisfied that the problems created by the destruction of the German lab had been taken care of, he summoned Strecker. He didn't ask him to sit down. Strecker, I asked you to be discreet in dealing with that Iranian woman. What do you have to say for yourself? I apologize, sir. However, I could see no other alternative for eliminating the target. I had hoped to take her from a distance. I observed the house where she was staying over a period of days, but she never made an appearance. There wasn't any way I could get to her. In my judgment, direct entry into the house carried a significant risk of failure. I assumed this was not acceptable. You were correct. It would not have been acceptable. The local authorities believe it was an accident. You got lucky this time. Make sure nothing like this happens in the future. Yes, sir, it won't. Have you made any progress in determining who is responsible for what happened in Germany? Yes, sir. I believe whoever tried to compromise our computers is behind it. I've traced the location of the hacker to Virginia. I'm working on pinpointing the exact coordinates. Once I have that, you can decide what you want to do about it. You think whoever tried to gain access is responsible? I do. It's too much of a coincidence. That attempt came right before the attack on the lab. I don't believe in coincidences. Very well. Keep me informed. I have another assignment for you. Make sure you don't screw this one up. Elegant bastard. What the hell does he know about it? Yes, sir. Hauser handed Strecker a manila folder. I want you to eliminate the subject of this folder. He's in France. Leave today. He'll be guarded, so act accordingly. Don't worry about trying to make it look natural. I want to send a message. Yes, sir. When you're finished with that, come back here. Yes, sir. After Strecker left, Hauser walked over to the library window and looked out at his domain. One of the gardeners was running a tractor and mower in the distance. Big sprinklers were throwing arcing streams of water over one of the pastures. He thought about Strecker. Getting to Fournier and removing him would not be easy. He always had bodyguards with him. Strecker had his work cut out for him, but Hauser had confidence. Whatever his flaws in execution, the man could be relied upon to get the job done. Once the problem of Fournier had been resolved, he'd do something about whoever had interfered in Germany. Strecker seemed confident he'd located the source of the hacking attempt. Confirmation was needed that the same people had caused the destruction of the lab. But Hauser's intuition told him Strecker was probably correct, even if the two events weren't related. 
an attempt on his computers could not be tolerated. Some sort of retaliation was necessary. If the attempt came from the same people who had attacked the lab, they would never interfere with him again. He would make sure of that. Damage to the German facility had been extensive. Important files were missing. His investigators were certain they hadn't been destroyed in the fire. The files were coded, which was good. But if someone cracked the code, they might discover the location where the virus was being replicated. He knew what he would do if he were them, this unknown enemy. He'd go after the lab and finish what he'd started in Germany. Precautions needed to be taken. Chapter 26 It was around nine in the evening. The twins were down for the night. Selena and Valentina were going out. Friday night in the big city. It's girls' night out, Selena said. The two of you look great. Where are you going? Nick asked. We go to my favorite bar, Valentina said. Little Odessa. It will give my sister a chance to practice Russian. Lots of Russians there? His favorite place for Russians in city to meet. Good vodka. Food is also not bad. Probably crawling with spooks, Nick said. Spooks? You know, spies. Undercover CIA, FBI, those kinds of spooks. I think it would be foolish to be spook in little Odessa. Don't wait up for us, Nick, Selena said. I probably shouldn't say this, but I will anyway. Be careful. The two of you look hot, like a million dollars, and someone might want to steal some of it. Valentina smiled, a million-dollar smile. This is very sweet, Nick. I think we can take care of ourselves, Selena said. Of that I have no doubt. Have a good time. Selena kissed him and they went out the door. He worries too much, Valentina said in the elevator. It's his nature. He can't help it. I called a car service. They'll be waiting downstairs. Traffic wasn't bad. Twenty minutes later, they arrived at Little Odessa. The place was crowded, noisy. Pulsing techno music played in the background. A long, polished bar of black granite dominated the back of the room. Chrome bar stools with black leather seats marched in a neat row along the front of the bar. Four bartenders worked to keep up with the steady demand for drinks. The back bar was stacked from floor to ceiling with bottles of vodka. Selena had never seen so many different brands from different countries. We will drink Russian vodka, Valentina said. It is best. Heads turned to look at the two women as they pushed through the crowd. They reached the bar just as two men got up to leave. Perfect. We sit, no? Valentina said. One of the bartenders came up to them. He was in his thirties, dressed in a black leather vest, white shirt, and black pants. Muscular. He smiled at Valentina and turned to Selena. What can I get you? I want a dirty martini, Selena said. Vodka. I will have same. Make them with Moskoskaya, green label. Coming right up. He moved down the bar. That is Sergei, Valentina said. He is handsome, no? He likes me. Sometimes he gives me free drink. Selena looked around. It had been a long time since she'd been in a place like this. You could dress it up with elegant furnishings and expensive drinks, but it was still what bars like this had always been, a place to pick someone up for a night of uncommitted sex. How often do you come here? Valentina shrugged. Only sometimes is good place for me. Not so much for you, I think. You have Nick and children. I hope you're careful about who you meet here. I mean, I know what you mean, sister. Don't worry, I am very careful. The drinks came. Selena sipped her martini. This is good. What I told you, Russian vodka is best, but you must know which one, not what you see in supermarket. Off to the right, a man with blonde hair and wearing a leather sport coat stepped up to the bar. He ordered a drink and turned to look at them. Something tingled at the back of Selena's skull, a faint, instinctual warning. Val, there's a man down the bar to the right wearing a leather jacket. I see him. Do you know him? No, but he is Russian, I think. Here, this is not unusual. Something doesn't feel right about him. I didn't like the way he looked at us. 
We are beautiful, are we not? Maybe he is, what you say, checking us out. Selena laughed. You're definitely learning our American culture. The crowd was getting dense, packing in around them. People were standing two and three deep behind where they sat at the bar. Valentina signaled the bartender for another round. Selena looked at her glass and realized it was almost empty. She hardly remembered drinking it. The martini was that good. Sister, we should do this more. It's always too serious what we do. You're right, Selena said. It seems like something always gets in the way of having fun. Work, kids, something. Is finito, menya, a voice said behind them. They turned to see the man in the leather jacket. Da, Valentina said. In Russian, the man said, I have a message for you. Message? Who from? Viktor Orlov. A long, sharp blade plunged into Valentina's abdomen once, twice. It was so fast, Selena barely saw the flash. Valentina gasped in pain and looked down at the blood staining her green blouse. She'd chosen the blouse to match her eyes. Selena came off the stool fast, her hand stiff as a board and struck the man in the throat. He stumbled back, larynx crushed. He dropped the knife and fell to the floor, choking. Valentina fell off her stool. The back of her head struck a fitting on the brass rail in front of the bar. She lay crumpled on the floor, unconscious. Blood pooled under her. Electronic music pounded in the background. Someone screamed. Chapter 27 Tell me again what happened, Nick said. It was early morning. They were at the hospital waiting to see if Valentina would live or die. The police had questioned Selena for more than an hour before letting her go. They were gone for the moment, but it was only a temporary reprieve. This guy in a leather jacket came into the bar, Selena said. He gave us the once over. When I saw him, I had a bad feeling. But Valentina said he was just checking us out because we were sitting at the bar and looking good. Okay. Val ordered another round. Then we hear this voice in Russian right behind us saying, Excuse me. She turns around. The guy in the jacket says he has a message for her. She says, Who from? He says, Viktor Orlov. Then he stabs her. Viktor Orlov was president of the Russian Federation. Before Valentina defected, she'd been Orlov's mistress, though not by choice. What Orlov wanted, he got. He'd promoted her, introduced her to the Russian elite, given her the use of a dacha on the Black Sea. Then she'd been forced to flee the country. Orlov had taken her defection personally. Orlov, that bastard. Selena looked away. She bit her lip. It was too fast, Nick. I couldn't stop it. There wasn't time. She choked back a sob. Nick took her in his arms and held her close. Hey, it's not your fault. There wasn't anything you could have done. She wiped tears with the back of her hand. I should have stopped him. No one could have stopped him. You were just having a drink. The place was crowded. There was no reason to think something would happen. You couldn't have done anything. At least Orloff's assassin won't hurt anybody else. I wanted to kill him. You did. I want to kill Orlov. That might be a little harder. Damn it, Nick. Yeah. They were in a waiting room near the entrance to the surgical wing. It was pleasant enough in a neutral sort of way. At least the chairs weren't made of plastic. There wasn't much to look at except notices on the walls and the swinging doors that led to the operating rooms. She's been in there a long time, Selena said. It takes time to fix a wound like that. You've been through it. You kept her from bleeding out until the medics came. You saved her life. What if she dies? Then we'll deal with it. But they know what they're doing in there. She's got a really good chance. The door is opened. A doctor who had spoken earlier with Selena came toward them. His name tag said Miller. He wore a plastic cover over his hair and was dressed in green scrubs. Selena stood. How is she? The knife did a lot of damage, but I think we've got it all repaired. You think? We put everything back together, but she lost a lot of blood. I'm more concerned by the injury to her head. You said she struck the rail at the bar when she fell? Yes, she hit a fitting on it. He nodded. She had a subdural hematoma. I had to open up the skull to relieve pressure. 
We've put her in a medically induced coma. It's possible her brain may have been deprived of oxygen. Oh, damn it, Selena said. Putting her in a coma gives her a better chance to heal. How long will she be in it? Hard to say. At least a few days. We'll monitor her brain activity and see what happens. Can I see her? Is there anything I can do? You can see her after she's out of recovery. As to what you can do, spend time with her. Talk to her. Maybe read to her. There's plenty of evidence that indicates talking to someone who is in a coma helps the healing process. Doctor, I want her to have the best care possible. Money is not an object. I want her in a private room. I want a nurse present all the time. I don't know. I'm serious, Selena said. I mean it when I say money is no object. There will be someone outside her room acting as security. They'll be armed. This was an attempted assassination, not a random attack. He raised an eyebrow. An assassination? It's a long story, yes. Well, you'll have to get clearance from our own security people, but I don't see any real problems with your request. An announcement came over the hospital system. That's me, he said. I have to go. He reached into his shirt pocket and withdrew a card. He scribbled a phone number on the back. That's my cell. You can reach me if you need to. You should talk with security as soon as possible. Thank you, Selena said. Your sister will be out of recovery in about an hour. I'll make arrangements for the room as you requested. Selena thanked him again. They watched him walk away. Seemed like a nice guy, Nick said. Oh, Nick, what if there's brain damage? What if she doesn't come back? She's tough. She survived the surgery. She'll be okay. I hope you're right, Selena said. Come on, let's go down to the cafeteria and grab a coffee. I feel helpless. There's not a damn thing I can do about Orloff. I hate feeling helpless. I can't do anything to get to him. I can't fix it. No, but you can help Val recover. You heard what the doc said. Spend time with her. Talk to her. Tell her stories. Talk to her in Russian. Tell her you love her. There's a lot you can do. I'm worried, Nick. About me. I didn't think about it when I hit that man. I just did it. I knew it would kill him, but I did it anyway. He could have stuck that knife in you. Then you'd be in that operating room with Val. It was self-defense. You did the right thing. Don't beat yourself up about it. I suppose so. But still, it bothers me. If it didn't bother you, I'd be worried. Nick said. Chapter 28 Elizabeth had called everyone in to plan the next moves against Hauser. Once again, Clarence Hood was present. He was becoming a fixture at the meetings. Nick said, Valentina is in an induced coma. She's out of immediate danger, but Selena is at the hospital. She can't be part of what we're doing. Not right now. I understand, Elizabeth said. You can bring her up to speed later. Too bad we can't pay a friendly call on Orloff, Ronnie said. Perhaps I can be of assistance? Freddy, Elizabeth said, what do you mean? Victor Orloff is not a good person. He should not have attacked Valentina. I could pay him a call, as Ronnie has suggested. I can access his computers and make things difficult for him. I don't think that would be a good idea right now, Freddy. Elizabeth said, perhaps in the future. Are you sure, Elizabeth? Yes, Freddy. As you wish. An odd sound came over the speakers. What was that? Ronnie asked. Freddy is practicing human nonverbal expressions, Stephanie said. I think that was a sigh. Is that correct, Freddy? You are correct, Stephanie. Please refrain from these expressions for now. As you wish, Stephanie. Elizabeth gently tapped her pen on her desk. We have new intelligence regarding Hauser. Clarence, tell them what you told me. Usually, Clarence Hood was perfectly dressed, but today he looked tired and rumpled. The knot on his tie was loose, his shirt wrinkled. Nick was surprised. It was out of character for him. Hood cleared his throat. Y'all know about my foundation, he said. What you don't know 
is that it's more than what it appears to be. Figures, Ronnie muttered under his breath. Elizabeth gave him a warning look. Hood continued, For some time, I've been working with a group of people who are concerned about our national security. You remember President Rice. He's one of them. There are others I won't bother to identify. The Foundation serves as a way for us to gather intelligence and act under the radar. Wait a sec, Nick said. Are you saying your Foundation is a kind of shadow CIA? In a way, although we don't have the kind of facilities Langley has, the truth is, we don't need them. The best intelligence has always come from human sources, and we have those. It's helpful to have sophisticated technology, of course, but in the end, it always comes down to what people know. Would I be right to assume some of your sources are within Langley? Nick, Elizabeth said. Elizabeth, it's okay, Hood said. To answer your question, yes, but Langley is by no means the source of all our information. I'm curious, why did you form this foundation? I believe in our Constitution. It's the core foundation of our society, and it's under serious attack. It's nothing new to have external enemies threaten us. But now, we have powerful enemies within as well. They want to bring America down. I set up the foundation to expose and stop them. Is that where Hauser comes in? Yes. He's part of a cabal of wealthy men who think it's their right to rule the world. We have an informant on the fringes of the inner circle. He has some knowledge of what these lunatics are planning. Yesterday, we discovered what they have in mind for us, us and everyone else in the world. This has got to be about that virus, Ronnie said. Hood nodded. They plan to release the altered virus as soon as they have adequate stocks of vaccine for themselves. The plan is to let it go worldwide. It's safe to say it will spread everywhere and quickly. This is a bad bug. You catch it, there's a good chance you'll die, unless you get the vaccine they're going to produce. And the vaccine is a trap, Nick said. That's right. The media will go full bore to hype how deadly the virus is. People will be terrified of catching it. The government will say they have a vaccine to keep everyone safe, and they're giving it to you for free. Everyone will rush to get it, but it will contain the modified protein Kesri developed, which will begin reproducing in your body. The protein responds to electronic stimulus, and it creates an identifiable signature unique to each individual's DNA. The result is that anyone who takes the vaccine can now be targeted and controlled. It's a dictator's dream. How does it work? Ronnie asked. Let's say you don't like the way things are going. Maybe you take part in a protest against some new government regulation. Maybe you don't want to report somewhere for indoctrination. If I don't approve of what you're doing, I can send a signal to stimulate the protein you received with your shot. The protein affects brain functions. I can make it do different things. Like what? I can create excruciating pain or paralyze you. I can kill you by disrupting your brain waves. I can make you sick or stimulate murderous rage. By manipulating your brain functions, I control your body. If I control your body, you will do what I say. That's totally insane, Lamont said. Yes. It's also consistent with the way totalitarians think. And Hauser is the key to this? Nick asked. He's the current leader of this cabal. He's the one with the manufacturing facilities for the virus, the protein, and the vaccine. That makes him a major player and a serious threat. Okay, Ronnie said. Hauser is the leader of this group. Who are the others? They're a nasty bunch. Hood said, I know of five, but there may be more. Each one is a billionaire many times over. There's Hauser, you know about him. Then there's a man named Breitenbach. He's a banker, but not just any banker. Breitenbach is a baron, old Prussian aristocracy. 
His family has been in finance for centuries. One way or another, he controls almost every bank in Europe. That gives him enormous power. If he wanted to, he could bring about a worldwide economic collapse almost overnight. What is it about bankers anyway? Lamont said. Money, what else do you need to know? Ronnie said. Then there's Charles Fournier, Hood said. He owns Sky Ventures. The aerospace company, Nick said. That's him. He controls a global network of satellites. Most are corporate, but he's tied into the French and German governments as well. Those satellites would be ideal for triggering the protein, Nick said. The thought had occurred to me. Who else is in this group? Sir Peter Crampton. He controls food distribution throughout Western Europe. He could create chaos if he disrupted supplies. We think that's part of their plan to take over. Then there's Pavel Romanov and Andrei Radu. Romanov is one of the oligarchs who made their fortune after the Soviet Union collapsed. He's one of the richest men in the world. He is also a rabid Russian nationalist. That makes him an odd duck in this group, since they want to establish a world without national borders. What's his specialty? Oil and natural gas. He's the power behind the throne in the Kremlin. And Radu? Radu is a real peach. He's from Romania. He's one of those amoral people who believes only in himself. The man has never produced anything of value in his entire life. He made his fortune by manipulating currencies and commodities. Radu is absolutely ruthless, completely without ethics or compassion, and obscenely rich. He cares nothing at all for the harm he causes to people. He uses his money to destabilize societies by manipulating political outcomes. He funds terrorist groups and calls them freedom fighters, then justifies his actions by claiming he wants to create a better world. The world he has in mind is a totalitarian nightmare. He's a blot upon humanity. Sounds like a great bunch of guys, Lamont said. I don't think you want to sit down and play poker with them, Hood said. You just described a perfect storm of evil bastards, Nick said. That's a good way to put it. You can imagine what will happen if they succeed in getting their way. Makes me wish for the good old days when the enemy had a flag and you knew who he was, Ronnie said. There are still a few of those around, Clarence said, but the enemy that scares me the most looks you straight in the eye and promises a better life when what he's really doing is setting up the killing fields. How are we going to stop these assholes? Lamont said. We have to keep them from releasing that virus. If we stop Hauser, we buy time to stop the others. We need to find out where he's manufacturing the virus and destroy the facility. Great. We don't know where it is? Yes, we do, Nick. The facility is located in Henderson, Nevada. Are you certain of this, Freddy? Elizabeth said. Yes, Elizabeth. I have tracked the location through the files recovered from Germany. Freddy, do you have a satellite photo of the area? Yes, Elizabeth. Please put it on the monitor. A high-altitude shot of the city appeared on the screen. Not far from Las Vegas, Lamont said. Maybe we could get in a little time at the tables. Why don't you just give me all your money instead, Ronnie said. Tap, tap. Sorry, Director, Lamont said. Freddy, zoom in on the coordinates of Hauser's lab, Elizabeth said. The shot changed. That's serious, Ronnie said. Big, Lamont said. What we're looking for could be anywhere in there. The lab in Germany had been small, unobtrusive. Not so Hauser's Nevada facility. It took up several acres on the edge of the city, where civilization stopped and the desert began. The entire complex was surrounded by a high wire fence. A ground-mounted solar array with hundreds of panels was situated inside the compound. There were signs of security everywhere. A guardhouse sat by the main gate. Lights were mounted on tall poles around the perimeter of the compound at regular intervals. At night, 
the place would be lit up like a primetime football game. Worse, the buildings were part of a sprawling industrial park. There were several other businesses nearby. I don't like this, Nick said. That compound is part of a big commercial development. There are always going to be people around, no matter what time of day it is. There's bound to be collateral damage if we destroy it. You're not going to take that out with a few kilos of C4, Ronnie said. A missile, maybe, Lamont said. If those buildings were located in some third world shithole, destroying them would be hard enough, Nick said. Here in America, in a big city, it's not happening. You don't have to blow it all up, Hood said. Just the part where he's working on the virus. With all due respect, sir, you've never had to do something like this. Take my word for it, we can't get in there without being seen. It's a mission guaranteed to fail. Once they see us, it's game over. Ronnie and Lamont nodded in agreement. But if you could get in without being seen? Even if that were possible, I don't think we'd succeed. Take a look at that complex. It's huge. There are probably a thousand people working there. You don't know what he's got in that bio lab. Destroying it could infect everyone in the area. In my opinion, the chances of success are almost non-existent. Nick, I understand your concern, Hood said. All I ask is that you think about it. Hauser has to be stopped. See if you can come up with a way to get into that compound without getting killed. The Foundation has a lot of resources. If there's anything you need, I can get it. Maybe not air support or a missile, but pretty much anything else. Nick looked at Ronnie and Lamont. What do you say? Doesn't hurt to think about it, Ronnie said. Lamont? I'm in, long as it's not a suicide mission. Okay, Nick said. We'll think about it. Chapter 29 Valentina lay unconscious in her hospital room. Selena had been reading to her for the last hour. She'd chosen Moby Dick translating into Russian as she read. She thought it was unlikely Valentina would have come across it on her own. Somehow, Melville's classic novel of obsession and revenge felt appropriate, given the circumstances. She stopped reading, her voice tired, and set the book down on the edge of the bed. An armed guard sat outside the door. The only sound in the room was the quiet murmur of air conditioning. A bank of monitors by the bed traced Valentina's life across their screens. Valentina's color was as pale as the sheet she lay on. Except for the slow rise and fall of her chest under the covers, she showed no movement. They'd removed the ventilator that morning, letting her breathe on her own. They'd taken her off the drugs that induced coma, but nothing had changed. She was still unresponsive, gone somewhere Selena couldn't follow. Selena looked at her sister and thought about all the times she'd been in a room like this, times when she'd been the one hooked up to IVs and monitors, times when life and death had hung in the balance, with the jury out on the result. It had been a strange journey, this sisterhood. When first they met, they'd been enemies, yet somehow found a way to help each other. When Selena learned of Valentina's existence, she'd been overwhelmed by conflicting emotions. Anger at her father, who had betrayed her mother. Surprise at the sudden longing for connection to family. Something she'd thought was gone forever. The discovery had sounded the siren call of shared blood. She had Nick and Jason and Katrina. But Valentina was her sister, in blood and in spirit. If she died... It would leave an emptiness no one could fill. She took Valentina's hand in both of hers. Val, I know you can hear me. You're drifting somewhere. I know what it's like. I've been there, but I came back. It's not your time to go yet. You hear me, Val? It's not your time. You need to come back. Come back to me, Val. We have so many things to do, so many things I want to show you. She paused took a breath. You have to come back, so we can do those things. Everyone wants you to come back. Ronnie and Lamont have been here every day. 
Nick keeps waking up at night worried about you. Elizabeth has been here too. She left a vase of beautiful flowers. Don't give up, Val. Don't quit on us. We need you. We love you. Selena squeezed Valentina's hand. Give me a sign that you can hear me, please. Just a little sign. Anything at all. She looked at the still, pale form on the bed, thinking how fragile Valentina looked. A sudden wave of sadness brought tears to Selena's eyes. It wasn't just for Valentina. It was for herself. For everyone who suffered the cruelties of life. A sudden urge to pray came to her. She'd never been religious, but she was convinced in her heart that there was a unifying consciousness to the universe. It was a mystery to her, but whatever it was, she sensed it in the beauty of nature and the kindness of others. Lord, I'm not very good at this, asking for help. Please help us. Sudden heat bloomed in the center of her chest. It felt like the sun had suddenly appeared from behind dark clouds. The feeling startled her. She felt the heat spread to Valentina. It was a strange, comforting connection. Selena had no idea how long it went on. Gradually, the sensation faded, and she was left with a feeling that something had happened. What it was, she couldn't say, but somehow she thought Valentina was going to be all right. Chapter 30 Charles Fournier's home was in the Rhone Valley, in the heart of one of the great wine-producing areas of France. The chateau looked out over rolling countryside and flourishing vineyards, a view certain to warm the heart of any wine aficionado. Constructed of local stone in the 17th century, the buildings of Fournier's estate descended down the side of a hill. The main house was three stories high, with an attached four-story tower that contained a communication center. Servants were quartered in a separate building. The second and third floors of the main building were reserved for guests. All of Fournier's private quarters were on the first level. A large stone patio opened out to the back, where he liked to entertain during good weather. A broad staircase led from the patio down to a sparkling swimming pool, surrounded by extensive gardens. Strecker had been observing the house for several days, establishing the rhythms of the household. When the servants came and went, when the grocer delivered, the trivial details of daily living on the billionaire's estate. He was surprised to see that Fournier's security force was small, at least by the standard Strecker would have set if he were guarding such an important man. Although security appeared minimal, it couldn't be ignored. There was usually a bodyguard in Fournier's presence. Two armed guards patrolled the grounds around the house at all times. The schedule of their rounds seemed random, but Strecker had figured out the pattern. It would be easy enough to avoid them when he made his move. If that became impossible, well, that was their bad fortune. Fournier might be a billionaire, but in most ways he was like anyone else. He had routines and habits, and that made him vulnerable. Every evening, he would come down the steps from the patio for a 20-minute swim before retiring, accompanied by a bodyguard. It was always about the same time, around 10 at night. The guard would wait by the side of the pool until Fournier was finished. Then they would return to the patio above. Strecker had learned enough. It would be easy to kill Fournier at the pool, easy to disappear afterward. Hauser had told him to send a message. Finding Fournier lying in his own blood would make the message loud and clear. The thick garden landscaping bordering the pool provided plenty of cover. A silenced shot would neutralize the guard. By the time Fournier realized something was wrong, it would be much too late to do anything about it. That evening, Strecker concealed himself near the pool and waited for his quarry to appear. A soft, warm breeze carried the scent of growing things, a hint of perfume from some sweet flower. Moonlight reflected from the still waters of the pool, less than twenty yards from where he lay concealed in the shrubbery. 
He screwed a suppressor onto the barrel of his pistol and relaxed. A little before 10, lights came on in the pool and along the steps descending from the lighted terrace above. Fournier came out of the house dressed in a blue robe, carrying a bottle and two glasses. He was accompanied by a beautiful dark-haired woman wearing a diaphanous wrap and nothing else. They were laughing as they descended the steps to the pool. There was no guard accompanying them. Fournier probably had more in mind for his companion than an evening swim, something that required privacy. Too bad for you, my lovely, Strecker thought. Fournier and the woman reached the pool. Fournier set the bottle and glasses down on a table and tossed his robe onto a chair. He was naked under the robe, running too fat, his body covered with dark hair. He said something about the pool being heated. The woman shrugged off her wrap. They embraced and got into the water. Strecker waited a moment, savoring what was about to happen. He rose slowly from the bushes and walked to the edge of the pool. She was the first to notice him and the gun in his hand. Charles, someone is here. Fournier turned. Strecker shot the woman in the face, the report of the gun little more than a dull cough in the night. The bullet blew away the back of her skull. She sank beneath the surface. A dark stain spread across the water. Fournier stared, his mouth open in shock. Who, what? Strecker pointed the pistol at him. Fournier raised his hands in the air. Wait, please, I will pay you. Get out of the pool. All right, all right, I will do whatever you say. Don't shoot. Fournier stumbled through the water and climbed out, dripping on the side of the pool. Instinctively, he covered his shriveled genitals with his hands. Whoever you are, I will pay you. I can pay you more than whoever sent you. Please, I can make you rich. He glanced at the body of his companion drifting near the bottom of the pool. Blood swirled through the water in dark, abstract patterns, illuminated by the underwater lights. You didn't have to kill her. Of course I did, Strecker said. He shot Fournier between the eyes, scattering bits of brain and blood over the terrace. The body collapsed. Fournier's bowels let go. The stink defiled the clean night air. Strecker looked down at his kill. It was too bad about the woman. She'd really been quite beautiful. It would have been nice to have her before killing her, but this wasn't a situation where that was possible. What a waste he thought. Strecker turned and walked away into the night. Chapter 31 Everyone except Selina was back in Elizabeth's office. Nick, do you have a plan to get into that lab? We talked it over. We can't do it. Elizabeth looked at him, an expression on her face he'd never seen before. You're refusing the mission? It's not possible without using lethal force. A target like this requires a lot more than three men with a few blocks of C4. We looked at plans of Hauser's complex. The lab is in the middle of the biggest building. It's surrounded by offices and workspaces filled with people. We'd never get to it without being discovered. You want us to get everyone out of the building, but that's not practical. Plus, we don't know what else he's brewing in there. That's a BSL-4 lab. Blowing it up could create a worse problem than the one we have, assuming we could even get to it. We can't take it out without a lot of people getting killed. Most of the people working in there are just trying to make a living. I can't do it. I won't do it. What about at night? People will have gone home. There's a night shift. From what we can tell, he's got a full complement of people working 24-7. Damn it, Nick. Hang on, Elizabeth. Hood said, Nick, are you certain you can't do this? I wish I could tell you something different. I'm sorry to hear you say so. I was awake most of last night, tossing this around in my mind. Why are we spending so much time thinking about the Nevada lab? By the time we blew up the one in Germany, the damage had already been done. By now, Hauser is cranking up supplies, probably in every one of his manufacturing facilities, it's too late to stop that. You remember that airliner that flew straight into a swamp down in Florida years ago? It crashed because the crew was focused on trying to get the landing gear light to show green. 
They forgot to pay attention to the bigger picture. I think that's what we've been doing. Since you seem to have it all figured out, what do you think we should be paying attention to? Elizabeth said. She was angry. Two things. The vaccine for a start. Hauser won't release that virus if he doesn't have a vaccine to protect himself. Analysis of the files removed from Germany indicates that development of a successful vaccine was imminent. Freddy, are you saying he already has a vaccine? Elizabeth said. Probability that a successful vaccine has been created is 98.4%. Uh-oh, Ronnie said. Please explain your comment, Ronnie. That's an expression of concern, Freddy. Is this like the expression referring to excrement? I am attempting to understand human thinking. Good luck with that, Ronnie said. It's sort of the same, Freddy, but less important. I will add this information to my database. Hood coughed. You said two things, Nick. What's the second? If Hauser has a vaccine, he'll release the virus soon. He may even have already done it. When people realize how bad it is, they'll panic. Nothing's going to stop them from lining up for their shot. What's your point? The purpose of getting people to take the vaccine is to get the protein into them. That makes them vulnerable to electronic transmissions that stimulate the protein. Hauser and his cronies plan to use that to control the population, right? That's right. It's probably too late to do anything about the virus, but not the vaccine or the transmissions. We need to know where he's manufacturing the vaccine and destroy the facility. If he doesn't have the vaccine, he won't release the virus. It's too dangerous for him and his buddies. The vaccine is the priority. Once we've dealt with that, we go after whatever he's going to use to send those transmissions. Selena mentioned satellites, Ronnie said. How can we stop that? Satellites are controlled from the ground, Nick said. We find out where the control center is and we take it out. What I can't figure out is how a satellite gives him what he wants, Ronnie said. Sure, he can send a signal, but it has to be pretty focused. How could he affect a lot of people at once? I don't know, Nick said, but somebody does. We'll find out. Chapter 32 Carl Hauser sat in front of the monitor in his library in secure conference with his chief researcher, Wilhelm Schmidt. At one time, Schmidt had been a favorite to win the Nobel Prize for his innovative work with viruses. Then the politics of the prize committee kicked in and the award had gone to someone else. Schmidt had never forgiven them for the slight, denying him what he considered his rightful due. When Hauser offered him a position heading up his research laboratory, he'd jumped at the chance. Told to develop a variant of the Iranian virus, then create a vaccine to combat it, he'd applied his considerable intellect to the task. The virus had been relatively easy. Now he was reporting success with the vaccine. You are certain, Schmidt? Yes, sir, I am certain. And what about side effects? In most cases, there are no significant side effects beyond mild fever and aches similar to a conventional flu shot. Those symptoms disappear after a day or two. Tell me about the protocols you used. The vaccine was tested on human volunteers. Subjects were split into four groups, three of which were infected with the virus. The vaccine was given to the group that had not been exposed. This group was then allowed to mingle in social settings with the other subjects. We allowed the disease to progress to different stages before administering the vaccine to those who were infected, according to which group was being studied. That gave us a comprehensive timeline to work with. And the results? The vaccine is extremely effective. Those not previously exposed who received it never contracted the disease. Those who were infected experienced different rates of recovery, depending on how far the disease had progressed. What is the mortality rate? Once the disease has progressed beyond 10 to 12 days after exposure, death is almost certain. Do you anticipate any consequences as a result of test subjects dying? Not at all. We were careful to choose subjects without personal attachments, which might um, cause problems. Excellent. What about production? 
We are ready to begin production whenever you say. I'll ask you one more time, Schmidt. Are you certain this vaccine is safe to use? Absolutely. I've already injected myself and key personnel here at the lab. I'm confident it will provide protection. It's possible that a booster shot may prove necessary in the future to maintain immunity. Begin production immediately. Yes, sir. I'll fly to our Romanian facility today to get things started. Very good, Schmidt. You have validated my trust in you. I'll see that you are well rewarded. Thank you, sir. How does it feel? How does what feel? How does it feel to know you've done something to show those Swedish snobs on the prize committee what a big mistake they made? On the screen, Schmidt smiled. A smile that did not reach his eyes. They will come to regret their mistake, I think. Chapter 33 Charles Fournier's brutal murder was big news in Europe. In America, it was barely a blip. The only in-depth coverage appeared in the Wall Street Journal, analyzing the consequences for investors in Fournier's company. Elizabeth and Clarence were in her office discussing what it meant. Late afternoon sun streamed through the windows, giving the room a golden glow. What do you think the chances are of this being a random attack? Elizabeth said, None. This has to be a power move within the cabal. But why kill Fournier? Everything we know about this group indicates that they've been working to get to this point for years. Once they decided to use Kesri's research, the satellites he controlled would have been part of the plan all along. I agree. There wouldn't be any reason to kill him unless he decided not to go along with the plan. You think he changed his mind? It's the only reason I can think of for eliminating him. Hood said, if this virus is as bad as we think, releasing it will kill millions. Fournier was Catholic, not a good one by all accounts, but he still attended mass. Perhaps planning to commit mass murder started him thinking about what he might be in for after he died. A genuine fear of hell would definitely give him second thoughts. Do you think this was Hauser's doing? Probably not on his own. He'd need support from some of the others. Breitenbach, for sure. Maybe Romanoff. That would be enough. Killing Fournier sends a message to anyone in that group who might be feeling hesitant about going ahead, Elizabeth said. Murdering dissenters has always been an effective tactic, Hood said. It does create a chilling effect, no doubt about that. If we're right, Fournier was an obstacle. It means Hauser and the rest of them have decided to go ahead. Which means we're running out of time. I'm surprised about Nick, Elizabeth said, disappointed too. He's never refused to take on a mission before. Don't let your desire to stop these lunatics affect your judgment. Nick knows what he's doing. He and the others are the best chance we've got to stop them. No one in government is going to do a damn thing about these people. They're too wealthy, too powerful, too connected. They own the governments. Sometimes I wonder how we got to this point. I don't think you're alone in wondering that, Hood said. Elizabeth clasped her hands together. I'm tired of fighting this battle. How many times have we stopped something terrible from happening? It's like being caught up in a myth. Every time you chop off the head of the hydra, two more pop up and it starts all over again. Yes, but in the myth, the hydra is eventually killed by a Greek hero who was the son of the gods. I'm not feeling very godlike these days. Just as well, Clarence said. I like the human part of you. That's sweet, but flattery won't solve our problem with the cabal. Nick was right, you know, about what actions we can take. Our best shot is to find out where Hauser is manufacturing the vaccine and shut it down, then go after Fournier's satellites. We have to make sure they can't activate that protein, regardless of anything else. I wonder if Fournier's equipment is their only option. Couldn't they gain access to satellites controlled by another source? Like a government? I suppose so. But that would be much more difficult. It could get complicated. Fournier may be dead, but I'd lay odds the cabal now controls his network. All right, I agree. The priority is preventing Hauser from obtaining a vaccine. 
We need to find out where he's manufacturing it. Once we have a location, we can plan a mission against it. When that's done, we'll go after the Satellite Control Center. It can't be done without inflicting casualties, Hood said. I know, she said. That doesn't mean I have to like it. If you liked it, you wouldn't be the person I care about. Elizabeth looked at him, surprised. I care about you, too. Liz, there's something I want to say, he took her hand. We were doing pretty well for a while, as a couple, I mean. Then work seemed to get in the way. Do you think we could pick it up again, between us? I miss the intimacy we had. Not just the sex, all the rest of it. Clarence, look, don't say anything now. Promise me you'll think about it. All right, I'll think about it. That's all I ask. Hood looked at his watch. I have to leave or I'm going to be late for a strategy session at the foundation. Will you be meeting with everyone tomorrow? Yes, in the morning. We'll discuss options. Let me know what you decide. Psst. If you're enjoying this story and want to support more free audiobooks, please click subscribe. Chapter 34 Nick woke at four in the morning, old wounds throbbing. Selena lay dead to the world next to him. She'd gotten back late from the hospital. There'd been no change with Valentina. He rolled out of bed, his back stiff, and threw on a robe. He used the toilet, then went into the kitchen and turned on the coffee machine. While he waited for the coffee to brew, scattered fragments of a dream came back to him. He'd been standing somewhere, somewhere he didn't recognize, having a conversation with someone. He couldn't remember what it was about, only that he felt a vague sense of dread. Great, that's really helpful. The coffee was ready. He poured a cup and sat down at the kitchen table. The first sip burned his tongue. Damn it. It was one of those mornings when he felt time creeping up on him. He could remember waking in the morning without pain, but it was only a memory. A time when he woke up full of energy, ready to take on the day. It had been a while since he'd felt like that. Well, pain came with the territory given the life he'd chosen. Someone had told him once that pain was good because it meant you were alive. He supposed that was one way to look at it. Just the same he could have done without it. The caffeine began working. As his mood improved, he thought about how the day was shaping up. There was a morning meeting to plan next moves against Hauser and his cronies. They seemed determined to kill most of the world's population. He'd never understand how anyone could contemplate such a monstrous act. It was irrational. By any definition, it was insane. But then again, the lust for power was never rational. World history fascinated Nick especially the sagas of vast empires long turned to dust. History was littered with people like Hauser, men and women driven by ego and the quest for power, who'd left a legacy of death and destruction behind them. A lot was at stake in this hidden war. Hauser and his cabal wanted to create a totalitarian government to rule the world. For people like Hauser, compassion and empathy didn't exist. They believed in an ideology contemptuous of life, one that despised individual freedom. They had no feelings to speak of, except contempt for those who weren't like them. If Hauser got his way, there would only be rulers and slaves. In a twisted way, his plan to unleash death across the globe made sense. If you killed off enough people, it would be a lot easier to gain total control. It was a classic example of narcissistic thinking. Dictators like Mao and Stalin had murdered millions, but their actions paled in comparison to what Hauser and his allies had in mind. Nick thought about what Hauser represented. His warped philosophy and enormous wealth made him dangerous, but he wasn't unique. There were others like him, people convinced of their superiority their right to decide what was best for everyone else. They pretended to be concerned with the good of all. In reality, they had only contempt for most of the world's population. What mattered to them was personal power. 
They were expert at manipulating human fears and emotions, good at convincing people of their lies. They had the technology of totalitarianism at their fingertips and no scruples about using it. They ran corporations and governments. Collectively, they posed an existential threat to humanity. They were the enemy of every person on the planet. There had never been an enemy like them, or one more necessary to defeat. Selena came into the kitchen. She looked worn, tired. The strain of waiting to see if Valentina would come out of her coma was getting to her. That's a pretty serious look, she said. Something wrong with the coffee? Morning, hon. The coffee's fine. I was thinking about Hauser, what he represents. That would make anybody serious. She poured a cup of coffee and sat down. Valentina squeezed my hand last night. I thought she was waking up, but the doctor said it was just a reflex. Nick, I don't know if she's going to make it. If she doesn't pull through, I'm not sure how I'll handle it. She's really tough, you know that. That coma is her body healing itself. My money's on her. I suppose you're right. You know I'm right. Hang in there, she's gonna be okay. You're meeting with Harker today? Yep, we have to figure out what's next. As soon as I wake up a little more, I'm going to head over to the hospital again. Wanna get together for lunch? As long as it's not in the cafeteria. What is it about hospital food anyway? It's pretty hard to mess up a grilled cheese sandwich or something simple like that, but they always manage to do it. I've never figured that out, Nick said. Sometimes I think the people in charge do everything they can to take all the taste out of the food. They probably think if it tastes awful, it's good for you. Right. Food is medicine. You can't have medicine that tastes good. Everyone knows that. Selena finished her coffee. I have to get ready. I'll call you when the meeting's over. Chapter 35 Hauser was at his desk in the library. Strecker entered the room and waited to be acknowledged. Hauser gestured at a chair. Have a seat. Strecker sat. Well, what have you discovered? The source of the hack on our servers came from Virginia, specifically from something called the Harker Group. It appears to be a security consulting firm. It's run by a woman named Elizabeth Harker. You said appears to be. What does that mean? The consulting business is just a cover. She's in charge of what amounts to a covert operations team. At one time, they worked for the former president. He used them against terrorists and the like. So, experienced? Yes, very. Most of what they did is classified. The details I was able to discover suggest they are professional and good at what they do. I believe they're the ones who went after the facility in Germany. Why do you say that? Whoever attacked the lab was efficient and well-trained. They knew exactly what they were doing. When you combine that with where the hacking attempt came from, it's too much of a coincidence. For whatever reasons, Harker and her people are involved. This woman, Harker. You are sure she's the one in charge? Yes, sir. Very well. Eliminate her. Make that your priority. I will not tolerate interference with our plans. Do you have any preference as to how I do it? Just get it done, Strecker. The sooner the better. Yes, sir. That's all. Hauser waved him away. Strecker showed no sign of the sudden anger he felt at his abrupt dismissal. Treats me like a servant. One day, he'll regret it. Strecker walked to his rooms thinking about how to kill Harker. From what he learned about the people working for her, it would be a bad idea if they got involved. He needed to take her when she was by herself, away from them. He'd observe her, find out her routines, and set up a shot from a good distance away. There had to be times when she'd be out in the open and alone. He'd take the shot and be gone before anyone knew what had happened. He hummed a little tune to himself and began packing. Chapter 36 Elizabeth sat behind her desk, ready to begin the morning briefing. Hood sat off to her right. 
Stephanie was at her usual place behind her computer console. Let's begin, Elizabeth said. This morning we learned that Charles Fournier has been murdered. Clarence and I think it's a power move by Hauser and his allies. Why kill him? Nick asked. We don't know. It's possible Fournier got cold feet about their plan, Hood said. It's the only reason we can think of that would motivate them to remove him. With Fournier gone, who controls the satellites? Theoretically, his company does. But we think the cabal will take control one way or another. Something's bugging me, Nick said. If the virus carries the protein and the vaccine kills the virus, does it kill the protein too? Good question, Hood said. I don't know, but I doubt it. Hauser must have thought about that. I don't think he'd want to have that protein floating around in his brain, so any vaccine he took would have to exclude it. Where are you going with this, Nick? His plan is to infect people with the virus to get the protein into their brains. It's the protein that gives him the potential to control people. If the vaccine takes care of both, what's the point? You think he's got a way to kill the virus and leave the protein at the same time? He has to. I'm not sure it matters, Hood said. What matters is making sure he doesn't release that virus. We do that. His plan doesn't work. There's another way to make sure it doesn't work. We take him and the others off the board. I agree with you, Elizabeth said, but getting to them isn't going to be easy. It will have to wait. First, we have to stop production of the vaccine. After that, we make sure they can't use Fournier's satellites. Then we go after Hauser and the others. I still don't see how using satellites can affect everyone at once, Ronnie said. I mean, a beam from a satellite is pretty specific, right? I can answer that, Hood said. He could use cellular networks to activate the protein worldwide. There are places where service isn't available, but it's not that big a factor. Take Washington, for example. There isn't any part of the city without a tower nearby, especially with 5G. Those antennas are everywhere. Don't you just love progress, Lamont said. Makes me think about living in Fiji, Ronnie said. Wouldn't work. Fiji has cell service, too, Nick said. Let's get down to business, Elizabeth said. We've located the facility where Hauser is working on the vaccine. Stephanie, would you take over, please? The location was in the files that came from Germany. It's in Constanza, on the Black Sea. Constanza is a major port. Lots of industry, good infrastructure. That makes it ideal for Hauser. It also makes it easy for us to get to. Freddy, please put up a satellite photo of the city. My pleasure, Stephanie. They studied the satellite picture. It's a typical Eastern European city, Stephanie said. Lots of narrow streets and interesting sights. It's one of Romania's top tourist destinations. You have an exact location for us? Nick asked. Freddy, please zoom in on the vaccine manufacturing plant. The building was three stories high, made of reddish brick. A two-lane highway ran in front. It sat on the end of a high promontory overlooking the Black Sea. With a shock, Nick recognized the building. Shit, it's the one I saw in my dream. Looks like one of those old textile mills in the South, Lamont said. That's what it used to be, Stephanie said. During the Second World War, they made uniforms there. It kept going for a while after the war before it shut down. It stayed empty until two years ago when it was purchased by a company owned by Andre Radu. Radu, Nick said. Isn't he one of the bad guys? That's right. It's another reason I'm certain this is the right place. It makes sense they'd use Romania for this, Hood said. There wouldn't be any nosy government inspectors making problems. Radu is a powerful man in that country. Nobody's going to ask him what he's doing inside that building. It's an industrial area, Lamont said. Probably not much going on at night. That was Ronnie. Maybe, Nick said. We need plans for the building.
I have obtained a set of architectural plans, Nick. Would you like to see them? Yes, Freddy, thanks. You are welcome, Nick. The plans came up on the monitor. Big, Lamont said. Looks like two freight elevators, four sets of stairs between floors. He could put a lab anywhere in there, Nick said. Yeah, Ronnie said, but probably on the lower level. Make it easier to move stuff in and out. Possible. We won't know until we get inside. What about weapons and gear? Lamont asked. How do we get our stuff in? I can help with that, Hood said. Nick looked at the sprawling brick building. That's going to take a lot of C4. Make a list of what you need, Hood said. I'll make sure it's waiting for you when you get there. Your best bet is to fly into Bucharest, Stephanie said. From there, it's not that far to Constanza. You can rent a vehicle at the airport. Sounds like a plan, Ronnie said. I'll need two days to organize what you need and get it in place, Hood said. You can pick it up in Bucharest. It will be Eastern European gear, AKs and Semtex. Good enough, Lamont said. You have a reliable contact there, Nick asked. He always has been in the past. Then we'll leave tomorrow. That gives us time to settle in and check out the target. Chapter 37 Strecker decided he'd been watching Harker long enough. She always left her Georgetown home early in the morning and arrived at the building in Virginia by 7. The others in her group showed up sometime before 8. They usually left around noon, although that didn't really matter. What mattered was when Harker left for home. In the time he'd been observing her, that had never been before four in the afternoon. It was possible she might leave earlier. If for some reason he missed her, he'd come back the next day. Harker drove a black Audi, easy enough to spot. Strucker hadn't seen any signs of armor or unusual defensive features on the car. In her car, she was vulnerable. The building where she worked was off a secondary road that rambled through the Virginia countryside. Heading back to the city, about a mile from her headquarters, the road entered a long curve bordered by ancient stone walls. They looked like they'd been there since before the Civil War. The spot was ideal for what he had in mind. It was after four in the afternoon, the sky hazy with clouds. Strecker was in position, waiting behind the wall for the Audi to make its appearance. There was little chance of being noticed. He couldn't be seen from the road. To his back was a green pasture and some trees. A few sheep grazed in the distance. He had a good view of the road coming into the curve. There would be plenty of warning when the woman's car appeared. Strecker sat cross-legged, the rifle lying across his knees, and glanced at his watch. Almost 4.30. She was running late today. That meant she'd be along soon. Just as he had the thought, the Audi entered the far end of the curve. With the ease of long practice, Strucker brought the rifle up, steadied himself, and centered the scope on the windshield where his target would be behind the wheel. He let out part of his breath and gently squeezed the trigger. As soon as the rifle kicked back into his shoulder, he knew it was a good shot. The Audi swerved wildly to the right, then to the left. The car lifted up on two wheels and flipped. He watched it roll, glass breaking, pieces coming off, until it came to rest upside down in the middle of the highway, wheels spinning. Metal and glass littered the pavement. Steam rose from the wreck. Strecker put the rifle in its case and walked to where he'd parked his rented car on the side of the highway. He got in and drove away, whistling to himself. Chapter 38 Nick was washing out a coffee cup when Selena called. Hey, hon. Nick, they just brought Elizabeth into the hospital. She's badly injured. What? What happened? She was in a car crash. She's in surgery now. They're not sure she's going to make it. Nick, somebody shot her. Shit, I'm on my way. Call the others. Right, see you in a bit. Nick called Ronnie, thinking about how this could have happened. What's up, Kimosabe? Selena called from the hospital. She was visiting Valentina. 
and saw them bring Harker into the emergency room. Somebody tried to take her out. Call Lamont and meet me there. Copy that, Ronnie said. He hung up. Less than an hour later, Nick, Selena, Ronnie, and Lamont were in the waiting area of the surgical wing. Did anyone call Steph? Selena asked. Yeah, she should be here any moment, Ronnie said. What happened? Lamont asked. There's a coffee machine down in the ER, Selena said. It makes lousy coffee, but at least it's hot. I went down to get a cup and saw them bring Elizabeth in. I talked with a state trooper. He told me she'd been in a car crash and that someone had shot her. Someone's going to be sorry they did this, Nick said. Yeah, but who? Ronnie said. Doors opened on the elevator. Stephanie stepped out and came over to them. How is she? What happened? She's in surgery, Selena said. She was driving and somebody shot her. She crashed. Somebody shot her? Yes. Stephanie sat down. She took out a tissue and dabbed at her eyes. Damn it, who did it? We don't know yet. Someone's declared war, Nick said. We need to figure out who thinks we're a big enough threat to go after us. The only one that comes to mind is Hauser, Ronnie said. Hauser, why? He doesn't know we're after him. Who else would it be? He's the only one we're planning a mission against. Maybe he found out it was us that messed up his lab in Germany. It could be somebody from the past, Nick said. Fall out from one of our old missions? Maybe. I kind of hope it turns out to be Hauser. Otherwise, we might have a hard time figuring out who it is. I'll get Freddy on it, Stephanie said. He might find out something. We'd better let Hood know what's happened, Nick said. I'll do it. Stephanie took out her phone, got up from her chair, and walked a little distance away. They could hear her talking. We still have to go through with the mission, Nick said. What mission? Selena asked. You don't know yet. I haven't seen you since we talked it over this morning. We need to stop Hauser before he can develop a vaccine. His operation is in Romania. We're going to Bucharest tomorrow. What about Elizabeth? You can't take off and leave her like that. We don't have a choice. We don't know how far he's gotten with that vaccine, but we're running out of time. If she could, she'd tell us to stick to the mission schedule and get it done. I don't believe you just said that, Selena said. Elizabeth needs us. She's our friend. All the more reason to do what she wanted us to do. Damn it, Nick. Why do you always have to be so damn stubborn? Whatever else Selena was going to say was interrupted. The big door to the surgical wing swung open, and a tired-looking doctor came out. He looked at Selena with recognition. Hello, Dr. Miller, she said. Are you here for Elizabeth Harker? Yes, Selena said. Will she be all right? She's stable, but it's early days. Her injuries are severe. She lost quite a bit of blood. The seat belt and airbag saved her life, but several bones were broken. That wasn't the worst part. You know that she was shot. Yes. The bullet entered the left side of her chest. It tumbled and did a lot of damage. We had to remove part of the lung. When the round exited, it took a piece off her shoulder blade and broke a rib. We got all the debris out, but it was a bad wound. The bullet missed the heart and the important blood vessels or she'd be dead. I was in Afghanistan. I've seen wounds like this before. Recovery is difficult and long. That's if she survives. Are you saying she might die? Nick said. Not necessarily but you need to consider the possibility. Would you say she's a fighter? Yes. Then she has a chance. The next 24 hours will tell us more. When can we see her? Right now she's in recovery. We'll move her to intensive care in about an hour. We're going to keep her unconscious for a while. I'm sorry, but I can't allow visitors until I'm certain she's out of danger. Doctor, Nick said, this was an assassination attempt. It's possible someone might try again, we're going to post guards. Consider it a matter of national security. Miller looked at Selena again. What is it you people do? You seem to have a penchant for these things. I'll need to clear it with administration. Clarence Hood came out of the elevator. Nick, how is she? Stable, according to the doc here. I was just telling them that we need to post guards. I can take care of that, Hood said. Do I know you? Miller said, you look familiar. We haven't met, but...
but you might have seen my picture in the paper. I'm Clarence Hood. Recognition dawned. You are director of the CIA. That's right. Your patient is a friend of mine. She's also important to our nation's security. Miller looked at Nick. That's what he said. I'd be grateful if you could smooth the way for us to provide protection, doctor. Of course. I'll see what I can do. Hood handed him a card. That's my personal number. Please keep me informed if there's any change. Feel free to call any time, day or night. Well, Miller said, if there's nothing else, I'd like to get back to my patient. Thank you, doctor, Selena said. We're very grateful to you. You're welcome. Just doing my job. After he'd left, Nick briefed Hood on Elizabeth's condition, repeating what the doctor had told them. This could be Hauser's doing, Hood said. He's perfectly capable of it. The man is ruthless. Nick nodded. We have the same thought. It could be someone from the past, but it seems like too much of a coincidence. I don't believe in coincidences. Nor do I. I'll set up security for her. I think we should go ahead with the mission, Nick said. I agree. You are going to leave tomorrow, but let's back it off a day. I suggest we all meet in the morning at Elizabeth's office at the regular time. By then we should know more about her condition. We can review everything, make any final adjustments. Does that sound good? That will work, Nick said. I'm going to check on Valentina, Selena said. She gave Nick a hard look and walked away. Uh-oh, Ronnie said. I think she's mad at you, Nick. She's upset. She'll get over it. I need to make some calls, Hood said. He headed for the elevator. We have to take this guy Hauser off the board. We will, Lamont. First, we make sure he doesn't have a vaccine. I'd like to know who pulled the trigger, Ronnie said. It wasn't Hauser, that's for sure. He's too rich and too old to get his hands dirty. Probably the same person who killed Kesri, Lamont said. Hauser would have a go-to guy for work like this. Freddy can help, Stephanie said. I'll get him to look into Hauser's personnel files. Something might turn up. Nick looked around at the hospital setting. Here we are again. What a day, he said. Chapter 39 Selena sat at Valentina's bedside, her mind a jumble of random thoughts. She thought about Nick's determination to continue with the mission, a mission she hadn't even known about. When he'd told her she'd gotten mad, her first thought had been that he was abandoning Elizabeth. Now that she'd cooled down, she knew that wasn't true. Much as she hated to admit it, he was right. It wasn't his fault. He hadn't had a chance to tell her they were going after the vaccine facility. All along, he'd been keeping her up to speed on the discussions about Hauser. Once again, someone she cared about was hurt, perhaps dying. She remembered the day she'd met Nick in Elizabeth's office, the day everything changed. Since then, it seemed like She'd been caught up in a never-ending cycle of violence, fighting to bring down people who cared about nothing except themselves, people who seemed to be missing a gene for common human decency. She looked at Valentina, watching the covers rise and fall with her breath. She took her sister's hand and thought about Elizabeth. This is what you end up with, people you love circling the drain. Damn it! Valentina squeezed her hand. Another reflex. Sister? The word shocked her. Valentina's voice was weak and hoarse. Val, you're awake. Thank God. Water? A cup of water with a bendable straw sat on a tray table next to the bed. Selena took the cup and held the straw to Valentina's lips. She took a sip and coughed. This is hospital. Why? You were stabbed. We were in the bar, remember? A man stabbed you. He said it was a message from Orlov. This man. He is where? He's dead, Val. I killed him. Oh. I'm calling the nurse. Selena pressed the call button. I was worried about you. You should not worry, sister. I am tough, no? Was small stab only. Selena snorted. 
You're crazy, you know that? No, sister. It is world that is crazy. The nurse came in. So you've decided to join us, she said to Valentina. Welcome back. She turned to Selena. Now that your sister's awake, we need to run some tests. It's going to take a while. It would be better if you came back tomorrow. Suddenly, Selena realized how tired she was. It had been a long, stressful day. Watching Elizabeth brought into the ER, waiting to see if she would survive surgery, hearing news of another damn mission, certain to put Nick at risk. It was time to go home. I understand. Give me a moment. She turned to Valentina. You were reading book, Valentina said. That's right. In Russian, yes? Yes. Sister, your accent can improve. She smiled to show she was joking. Smartass, I have to go. They're going to give you some tests to make sure you're okay. I am very okay. I love you, Val. I also, sister. As Selena turned to leave the room, Valentina called out to her in Russian. Be careful, sister. Chapter 40 The next morning in Elizabeth's office, no one was smiling. Let's begin, Hood said. I talked with Elizabeth's doctor this morning. They have her sedated, but it looks like she'll be all right. I'm going over there later. She's going to pull through. Thank God, Selena said. That's the good news. The bad news is that she's facing months of rehab. She's not going to be doing much for a while. I'd like to propose that I take over for her until she's ready to come back, if that's okay with all of you, at least until we complete this mission and do something about Hauser. Nick looked around the room at the others. Ronnie met his eyes and gave a slight nod. I don't think anyone has any objections, Nick said. We all appreciate what you've done for us. I think it's a great idea. Second that, Lamont said. I want to say something, Selena said. I've been staying away because I was worried about Valentina. I felt that she was my priority. Now that she's awake and on the mend, I want in on this mission. I speak a little Romanian. It could help. We talked this over last night, Nick said. Selena is up to speed. I think she should come along. What he didn't say was that they'd had a heated argument about it. Nick was worried things could go wrong. The last thing he wanted was for Jason and Katrina to end up without their mother, or worse, as orphans. In the end, she'd convinced him. The more the merrier, Lamont said. It wouldn't be the same without you, Ronnie said. All right, that's settled, Hood said. I filed a flight plan for Bucharest. You leave at six tonight from the private hangar at Dulles. Bucharest is seven hours ahead of Washington. It's almost a 12-hour flight, so you'll get there in the middle of the afternoon. That will give you time to rent a car and get settled in. Hood held up a bulging manila envelope. This contains passports in different names for all of you, cash and credit cards. I thought it best you didn't use your real names when you go through customs. Memorize the details of your legends on the plane. Selena? I'll have yours ready before you leave. What about our contact in Bucharest? Nick asked. Hood tapped the envelope. In here. When you've memorized it, destroy it. He'll provide the weapons you need. Once you're done, get rid of them. Don't get caught with them. The Romanians get very upset about things like that. What's our cover story? Ronnie asked. You're tourists. The Romanians will be happy to see you. You're coming in on a private jet, so they'll assume you're wealthy. Do what wealthy tourists do. Go shopping and buy some nice things for yourselves. It's all part of your cover. I've booked you into the Hotel Epoch, right in the middle of the city. It's five stars. You'll like it. Does your contact know we're coming and what we need? Not yet. He can be difficult to reach. Don't worry. By the time you get there, he'll be expecting you. He knows me as Mr. Gray. Okay. Anybody have any questions or comments? I'd feel better if we had more intel, Nick said. There's a lot we don't know. We don't know what kind of security he's got. 
We know there's a laboratory inside where he's working on the vaccine, but we don't know where it is or how big it is. We don't know if he has a night shift working. A lot could go wrong. What else is new? Lamont said. When have we ever known everything we needed to know? Ronnie said. I'm just saying, Nick said. If you think it can't be done once you're there, abort the mission, Hood said. That's not an option, Nick said. It's too important. Don't go Rambo on me. It doesn't do anyone any good if you get killed trying to do something impossible. Chapter 41 The flight to Bucharest was uneventful. They arrived at the Henri Quanda International Airport a little before two in the afternoon, passed through customs without any problems, and took a taxi to the hotel. The Hotel Epoque was a grand European hotel, seven stories high, elegant, the kind of hotel with a doorman wearing enough braid on his uniform to pass for a general, bellboys, marble floors, and a world-class restaurant. Their suite was on the sixth floor, Florida-ceiling arched windows with reddish-brown drapes and white curtains overlooked the city beyond. Everything in the room was impeccably clean. The floor was polished wood. The bathroom was enormous, beautifully tiled with a large tub. There was a separate glass shower enclosure. What do you think? Will it do? Nick asked. Selena was picky when it came to hotels. It's fine. Clarence must know what I like. It's too bad we're here on business instead of a vacation. It's not far to Transylvania. We could visit Dracula's castle, maybe get a bite. Very funny. Seriously, I wouldn't mind coming back sometime for fun. First things first. I'm going to call our contact. Nick entered the number on his sat phone and let it ring. There was no answer. No luck. I'll try again later. We should act like tourists, Selena said. First, I want a shower. Sounds like a plan. Want some company? That shower is plenty big enough. If you behave yourself, you can wash my back, she said. Yes, ma'am. The hot water was plentiful, the shower comfortable for two. It didn't take long for Nick to forget to behave himself, but Selena didn't seem to mind. They toweled off and turned back the covers on the bed. Soon, they were making love. Afterward, they lay nestled with Selena's head on his shoulder. Maybe we're not on vacation, but so far it's not a bad substitute, Nick said. We can pretend, at least for today. It's nice to pretend. Nice to be away from all the hassles, even if it's an illusion. Do you think we'll ever have a normal life? You know, the kind of life where we go somewhere for the heck of it? without worrying about somebody trying to kill us? I think we could, but we'd have to quit doing what we do. Every time I think about it, I end up wondering what I'd do instead. You could do anything you wanted to, she said. I've been doing this for so long that I haven't a clue what I'd want to do. I'm not built to sit around doing nothing. I have to be active, doing something that makes a difference, or at least trying to make a difference. What if we established a charity? Selena said. I have the money to finance it. We could run it together. There are lots of people in the world who need help. What kind of charity? Oh, I don't know. Maybe helping people become self-sufficient, teaching them to grow their own food, and providing the means to do that. Provide clean water, build health clinics, things like that. I'm sure we can think of something. One thing is certain. That would keep us busy, and we'd be working together, except it wouldn't be about trying to stop the bad guys. Nick looked at her. You've been thinking about this. I have. I always worry one of us is going to get killed on these missions. It's hard for me to remember when that wasn't the case. We can't keep doing this forever, Nick, and we have the kids to think about. Yeah, I know. I have all that money Uncle William left me. We don't need all that. I don't need all that. It keeps making more money on its own. Why not use it to do something that makes a difference in the world? I've always contributed to charities. But 
why not start one of our own? Then we could be sure the money is being spent in worthwhile ways. When you bring up an idea like that, it reminds me of why I love you. Promise me you'll think about it. Okay, I promise. Do you mean it? I do. I promise. She reached up and touched his face, looked into his eyes. I love you. I love you too. She nestled close to him, rested her arm across his chest and closed her eyes. Soon the only sound in the room was the soft whisper of their breathing. Chapter 42 It was mid-afternoon before Nick reached Hood's Hungarian contact. His name was Alexandru Luca. Luca gave Nick the address of an antique shop in an older part of the city. Nick used the GPS on his phone to find the shop. He stood outside the store with Selena looking at the antiques in the window. Ronnie and Lamont were back at the hotel. That's a nice vase, Selena said. Buy it. It gives us a legitimate excuse for being here. The hotel will pack and ship it for us. A brass bell hanging over the entrance dinged when they opened the door. Inside, the shop was long and narrow, with worn wooden floors. A tall ceiling bore the marks of old water stains. A suit of armor stood off to the left of the door. Along the right wall, a wooden display case held watches, jewelry, old medals, and an assortment of knives. Odds and ends of furniture cluttered the floor. Most of this is junk, Selena said. That cabinet over there is nice. A man came through a beaded curtain at the rear of the store. He was several inches short of six feet, about 60 years old. He was dressed in dark trousers and shoes with a white shirt. His hair and beard were gray. A pair of gold-rimmed tinted glasses rested uncertainly on a large nose. Are you Luca? Nick said. Yes. We called earlier about a shipment you're holding, Nick said. We have a mutual friend. Ah, which friend, please? Mr. Gray. Luca went to the entrance of the shop, locked the door, and pulled down a shade. Come this way, please. They followed him through the bead curtain into the back of the shop, through a kitchen and into a narrow hallway. The hall smelled of boiled cabbage and garlic. They passed a bathroom and a door leading to a bedroom. At the end of the hall, Luca paused and unlocked a door. In here. He pushed a button on a wall switch. A single naked bulb hanging from the ceiling cast yellow light over the room. There was a window on the back wall, boarded over. The only piece of furniture was a round table with a khaki duffel and a blue gym bag on it. This is best I do, Luca said. Nick opened the duffel. Inside were three AK-47 carbines, four Makarov pistols, and half a dozen boxes of ammunition for the weapons. Nick took out one of the carbines. It looked well used, but the metal shone under a thin sheen of oil. He removed the banana-shaped magazine, cleared the action, and checked the bore. It was clean. He replaced the rifle, picked up one of the pistols, and examined it. The Makarov pistol had been a staple of Eastern Europe police and military forces since the 50s. This one looked almost new. He put the pistol back in the duffel and opened one of the boxes of ammo. Taking out a round, cased in gray steel, he showed it to Selena. Russian. He turned to Luca. You can't give us any more ammunition than this? Luca shrugged. No, it is difficult here, items like this. This was all I find. Okay, it will have to do. Nick opened the gym bag. Inside were several packages wrapped in dark green plastic and a brown box. He held one of the packages up to his nose. Some text? Yes. Detonators also in box. I assume our friend has taken care of the cost? Luca nodded. Then I think we're done. What about that vase in the window? Selena said, is it for sale? That is very nice piece, 18th century. How much? For you, only 1,100 American dollars. I'll give you 750. 
No, no. Okay, one thousand dollars. Eight hundred, Selena said. Luca looked pained. He sighed. Nine hundred. All right, sold, Selena said. Luca got the vase out of the window. While Selena counted out the money, Nick picked up the duffel and the gym bag, carried them outside, and put them in the trunk of their rented car. A pleasure doing business with you, Nick said. Please tell our friend this is last time. It is getting difficult here, too dangerous for me. I'll tell him. Luca handed the vase to Selena, anxious for them to leave. Goodbye, he said. He closed the door to the shop. They heard the lock click. You had to bargain with him, Nick said. It's part of the game. He expected it. Nick shook his head. They got in the car and drove back to the hotel. Nick parked in the hotel garage. They left the weapons locked inside the trunk. Back in their room, Nick took a soda from the mini fridge. I wish we could have brought the guns to the room, Selena said. We need to make sure they're going to work. We'll check them out later. I didn't want to risk bringing them into the hotel. The ones I looked at seemed good. Hood said the guy was trustworthy. The woman at the desk was very helpful about the vase. I hope it gets back home in one piece. He picked up the phone and dialed Ronnie's room. No answer. I'll try Lamont. Pizza Hut! You wish, Lamont. Ronnie there with you? Yeah. Come on up to our room. We need to talk about where we're going to have dinner tonight. One of my favorite subjects. See you in a few. Chapter 43 Constanza was a two-and-a-half-hour drive from Bucharest along the E-81 highway. They left early in the afternoon. It would give them time to get a look at the objective while it was still light. The plan was to hit the target sometime after full dark. If there were no complications, they'd drive back to Bucharest. The highway was modern, sometimes two lane, sometimes four. Nice road, Ronnie said. What did you expect? Nick asked. I don't know. I think of Romania, I think of gypsies and horse-drawn wagons. Maybe a hundred years ago, Selena said. I've been thinking, Ronnie said. What happens if we can't just drive back? We need a plan B. If something goes wrong, it won't take them long to set up roadblocks. We need another way to get out of here if things go south. Any ideas? Nick said. This town where we're going is a port. Gotta be plenty of boats. You're thinking we steal one? Nick said. The target's near the water. We pick out a boat close by before we go in, just in case. Everything goes right, no problem. We drive back to the hotel. There's a problem. We make for the boat and head for Istanbul. I like it, Selena said. It could work, Ronnie said. All right, Nick said. Good idea. They reached Constanza around four. Nick followed the GPS to the coast, then turned south toward the old factory that was their objective. They drove along the coast road, paralleling white sand beaches. Reminds me a little of Cape Cod, Ronnie said. Nice beaches. They were getting close to the target. Up ahead was a large marina. Nick slowed as they drove past. Whoa, Lamont said. Check out that red and black beauty. He pointed at a sleek craft bobbing in the water. It looked like it was going a hundred miles an hour, standing still. Cigarette boat, Nick said, built to go fast, a rich man's toy. That one will do if we have to run for it. Doesn't look like much security, Ronnie said. I make it a guard shack and wire fence, nothing fancy. Once they were past the marina, the surroundings changed. They entered an industrial area and followed the road out onto a wide promontory. Hauser's factory was the last building at the end. Beyond lay only the expanse of the Black Sea. A high chain-link fence surrounded three sides of the factory. The fourth side was protected by the bluff dropping down to the sea. A guard shack was positioned next to a wide gate at the only entrance. They could see a man inside reading something. The road went past the front of the building to the other side of the promontory, then continued on its way south. Nick kept driving for another half mile, then pulled over to the side. Impressions, he said. 
There are cameras on the corners of the building, Ronnie said. I saw them. The question is where they feed their images. Is there a security station inside, or do they end up in that shack where we saw the guard? No way to tell, Lamont said. We have to assume there's a station inside and that it's manned 24-7, Nick said. If that's the case, we'll never make it past the fence before they spot us. There's another possibility, Selena said. We go in through the back. From the water? That bluff is a hundred feet high at least. We don't have the gear to climb it. The satellite shots showed a ledge behind the factory. When we drive back, look at the fence on the left side of the building. It ends about a foot short of the cliff. We can get to that point and work our way around to the back of the building. From there, we go in through a window. Unless there are cameras on that end as well. I didn't see any, but there could be. Even so, we can't get in through the front. The back is the weak point. Hmm, she's right, Nick, Ronnie said. Going in the front won't fly. It's a plan, Lamont said. All right, we'll try it that way. Nick made a U-turn. They headed back the way they had come. When they passed the factory, they all looked at where the fence ended on the left. More like six inches than a foot, Ronnie said. A wrong step, you go for a swim. Still doable. Anyone see a camera? No one had. Okay. It's still a couple of hours until full dark. Let's get something to eat. Now you're talking, Lamont said. Chapter 44 Nick parked off the road in a deserted lot not far from the factory. The air was heavy with the threat of rain. It was nearing midnight. For once, it seemed the mission gods were cooperating. The sky was black. Clouds hid the moon. Feels like weather coming in, Lamont said. Far out, over the Black Sea, bolts of violet lightning arced across the sky. In the intermittent light, they saw a dark bank of clouds in the distance. Let's get moving, Nick said. Selena took the gym bag with the Semtex. The others slung the carbines over their shoulders. They all carried a Makarov pistol and spare magazines. In the dark, they could barely see each other. They walked single file on the left side of the road, ready to go to ground if lights appeared. So far, there had been no traffic. This area was far from the nightlife of the city. They drew close to the factory. Nick held up his hand. The compound in front of the building was lit with cold bluish light. A guard was visible in the shack by the gate. There were no lights in the back. Whoever set up security had assumed the sheer drop to the sea far below was security enough. They moved in a low crouch to the corner of the fence. There wasn't much room past the end post, but the ledge beyond was at least six feet wide. One by one, they swung around the end of the fence, then followed the building until they came to the first window. Standing on the ledge, Nick could reach the window but couldn't see in. Ronnie, give me a boost. Ronnie made a cup with his hands. He boosted Nick up until he could see. The room beyond was dark. I'm going to break it. If an alarm sounds, get back to the car. Nick tensed as he struck the window with the butt of the Makarov. The glass shattered. They waited, ready to run. There was no sound of an alarm. Carefully breaking away a few shards, Nick climbed through the opening, then leaned out. His voice was quiet clear. One by one, he helped the others through the window. They were in a storeroom filled with stacks of empty shipping boxes. Nick clicked on a pen light. A closed door led to the rest of the building. His voice was quiet as he spoke. Anyone here is working for the opposition. If you see someone, take them out. Keep it quiet. Our objective is to stop Hauser from producing his vaccine. The only noise I want to hear is when those charges go off. I'll take point. Ronnie, cover our six. Okay, weapons free. Safeties clicked. Nick went to the door and turned the knob. It was unlocked. He cracked the door and peered out into a hallway lit at intervals with wall lights. There was no one in sight. He signaled clear and went through, feeling the first rush of adrenaline. 
He didn't need to look behind to know the others were following. The hallway paralleled the back wall. He passed two more closed doors, then came to a junction where another passage branched off at a 90-degree angle toward the front of the building. He held up his hand and listened. He heard no voices, sounds of movement, nothing except the sound of their breathing. He darted a quick glance around the corner. There was a soft glow of light ahead. He remembered the plans. This passage led to a large central space that had held machinery when the building manufactured uniforms and clothing. There would be stairs and a freight elevator there. Beyond that space, the hallway picked up again and led to offices at the front. He signaled and moved around the corner. At the end of the passage, he stopped. The others caught up to him. Bingo, Ronnie said. A large sealed room with glass walls had been constructed in the middle of the building. Through the glass, they could see gleaming steel tables lined with instruments and microscopes. A bank of refrigerated glass cabinets took up the back wall of the room. Rows of tubes were visible inside. One side of the room was taken up with an elaborate entrance accessed through an airlock. Hoses hung from the ceiling. It's a BSL-4 lab. Selena said, God only knows what's in those cabinets. Start placing charges, Nick said. Lamont handed Selena his carbine. Trade you for the bag, he said. He took the bag with the Semtex and detonators and split the contents with Ronnie. They moved around the laboratory room placing charges. Selena and Nick stood guard. This is old Russian shit, Lamont said. I hope these detonators work. We're screwed if they don't, Ronnie said. Damn it, keep your voices down, Nick whispered. From somewhere in the front of the building came the sound of a door closing. Someone's coming, hurry it up, Nick said. Selena, with me. He moved toward the offices in front, Selena behind. At the end of the passage, he stopped, glanced around the corner and pulled back. He put his mouth next to Selena's ear and whispered, Three cops and the security guard. We must have triggered an alarm. Go back and warn the others. Start the timer. Ten minutes. Nick, go. I'll be right behind you. Selena ran back to the others. We've got company. Set the timer for ten minutes. I'm done, Lamont said. Ronnie made a last connection. He stood and started the timer. The sound of pistols firing and the hammering racket of Nick's AK came from the front. That's torn it, Ronnie said. Half a minute later, Nick ran into the room. Blood stained his shirt. You're hit, Selena said. It's nothing, just a crease. Let's get out of here. They ran to the rear, back to the broken window. Wind had picked up while they were inside. It buffeted them as they climbed out and tried to blow them off the ledge. Below, the sea boomed like cannon shots against the rocks at the base of the cliff. They swung around the end of the fence and ran toward the car. It started to rain. The charges blew as they reached the car. The inside of the factory lit with a bloom of reddish light. A column of flame shot into the air in a cloud of flying bricks and debris. The sound of the explosion rolled over them. Maybe a little too much Samtex, Lamont said. Guess those detonators were good after all, Ronnie said. Chapter 45 They got in the car. I'll drive, Ronnie said. Nick climbed in back with Selena. Ronnie started the car and they drove away. Selena opened Nick's shirt. It was soaked with blood. The bullet had plowed an ugly gash into his side. Lucky shot, he said. Three cops and a guard. You killed them? They didn't give me a choice. You really know how to stir things up. She took a pint bottle of vodka from her purse. Hundred proof vodka? It makes a great antiseptic. I brought it in case something like this happened. Selena wore a dark cotton blouse. She tore two strips from the bottom, soaked one in vodka, and began cleansing the wound. Nick gritted his teeth. Damn, that hurts. You deserve it, you idiot. You almost got yourself killed. He winced as she worked. You need to work on that bedside manner. She folded the second strip and handed it to him. Hold this against it. The blood will dry and keep it in place for now. Thanks, nurse. 
Nick pressed the makeshift bandage against his side, ignoring the pain. Red and blue lights flashed on the highway ahead. They'd driven less than a mile. Ronnie pulled over to the side as two police cars roared past, heading for the factory. So much for driving back to Bucharest, Nick said. When they find the cops I shot, they're going to be pissed. They'll block all the highways. Looks like we're going for a boat ride. I always wanted to see Istanbul, Lamont said. Ronnie slowed, coming up on the marina. They drove past the guard shack. Ronnie pulled over to the side of the road. How you want to do this, Nick? Take out the guard and see if that fancy boat will start. I'll do it, Selena said. He won't be as suspicious of a woman. Besides, I speak enough Romanian to make him think I'm local. I'll act like a hooker. They have hookers in Romania? Lamont said. I'll pretend you didn't say that, Ronnie said. Try not to kill him, Nick said. Don't worry, I won't. Selena got out of the car. She undid the top buttons of her blouse and left her jacket open. She sprinkled a little vodka on her blouse. They watched as she walked back along the marina, stumbling a little as if she'd been drinking. She should have been an actress, Ronnie said. Lucky for us she isn't, Lamont said. She reached the fence by the guard shack and stumbled against it. The man inside got up and came out. They couldn't hear what was being said, but they saw the man smile and open the gate. Selena tripped and held out her hand towards him. The guard reached for her. It seemed like she hardly moved, but seconds later the man lay unconscious on the ground. I've never figured out how she does that, Ronnie said. Nobody does it better, Lamont said. That how she keep you in line, Nick? If you're thinking about becoming a comedian, don't give up your day job. Let's go. They left the car where it was. Ronnie and Lamont moved the unconscious guard out of sight. They walked out onto the wooden dock. The boards were slick with rain. The red and black cigarette bobbed up and down in the water, tied with two white lines. Oh, you beauty, Lamont said. It's an Aurora's 42. Always wanted to run one of these. Ronnie pointed to where five big outboard motors hung on the stern. This thing has five engines. Yep. Something over 2,000 horsepower, as I recall. This boat will do more than 100 miles an hour. We don't have to go that fast, Nick said. You know how to run it? It's a boat, right? Climb in. The boat had an open cockpit with a padded bench seat. A sleek-looking fiberglass top with a windshield arced back over the cockpit and gave some protection from the weather. They crowded in. It was a tight fit for four people. There were more seats in the front of the boat, but they were exposed to the weather. The steering wheel was in the center of a blacked-out glass console. Be a lot easier if we can find a key, Lamont said. There's a locked side compartment here, Selena said. Try that. Ronnie took out a knife. Usually I'd pick it, but there's no time to be subtle, he said. He reached across Selena's legs and broke the lock. The compartment fell open. A set of keys and paperwork were inside. Cheap lock for such an expensive boat. Ronnie handed the keys to Lamont, who turned on the ignition. The console lit with displays and symbols. It looked like something from Star Trek. We've got almost a full tank, Lamont said. Should be enough to get us to Turkey. He turned the key. The engines woke with a deep, throaty rumble. Ooh, baby, someone get the lines. Selena climbed out and undid the lines. She got back into the cockpit and squeezed in next to Ronnie. Lamont looked over the unfamiliar display, then gently moved the throttle and turned the wheel. They eased away from the dock. A marked channel led through the marina to the open water beyond. Lamont steered for the middle of the channel. The rain pounded on the fiberglass over their heads. Waves slapped against the boat. Any life vests on board? Ronnie asked. Not that I can see, Nick said. Guess you can't have everything, Lamont said. It's gonna be a rough ride once we're out in the open. How far to Istanbul? I'm not sure. Maybe a couple of hundred miles? When I figure out all the gadgets, I'll plot an accurate course. Can they track us? Ronnie asked. I don't know. Probably. It has GPS. They'd reached the end of the channel. Nick looked back toward shore. 
Red and blue lights flashed near the guard shack. Looks like the guard woke up. Hang on, Lamont said. He opened the throttles. The bow came up. The acceleration pressed them back in their seats. They headed for the open sea. Psst. Give this author some love by clicking subscribe. Chapter 46 It was early evening in Texas. Hauser had just finished a light meal, washed down with an Italian wine. Strecker entered the room. What is it, Strecker? You know I don't like to be disturbed when I'm eating. Sorry, sir, but it's unavoidable. Something's happened. Well, the plant in Romania has been attacked. Damage is extensive. Extensive? Hauser was suddenly angry. Extensive? What the hell does that mean? The lab and part of the building were destroyed. Three cops are dead. So is the security guard. The Romanians aren't happy. Hauser felt his blood pressure rising, a tight band clamping around his head. It wouldn't do any good to give himself a stroke. He took a deep breath and forced himself to be calm. You're certain the lab has been destroyed? Yes, sir. Any clue as to who did it? Not that this time. They escaped in a boat. What are the Romanians doing about it? The Coast Guard has been alerted, but there's a big storm coming in. Sometimes they get these in August, like a hurricane. They won't send anything out until after it blows over. Miserable tin-pot country. I should have kept everything in-house instead of listening to Radu. A hurricane on the Black Sea? Yes, sir. What assets do we have in the area? Nothing along the coast of Romania or Bulgaria. We have people in Istanbul. They're probably headed for Turkey. It's the nearest safe refuge for them. Contact our assets, brief them. I want those people found and killed. Yes, sir. What are you waiting for? Go! After Strecker left, Hauser thought about what he'd tell the others. The loss of the Romanian facility was another setback but it wasn't the end of the world. A week earlier, it would have been much worse. The attack had come too late. He already had a successful formulation for the vaccine. All he had to do was move production to the Swiss facility. Once sufficient supplies of the vaccine were on hand, he'd release the virus in key spots across the globe. A year after that, enough people would have been vaccinated to initiate the final phase. Fournier's satellites would transmit signals to activate the protein administered with the shots. Then the new era would begin. Hauser poured another glass of wine, thinking. He'd underestimated the determination of his enemies. The woman, Harker, had been eliminated. But it hadn't been enough of a deterrent. He'd hoped to avoid more drastic measures, but clearly they were necessary. He'd put Strecker on it. It was tiring, having to deal with these annoying obstacles. Well, there were always obstacles to progress. It was the price great men had to pay to achieve their goals. One always had to struggle against ignorant people who thought they had a right to personal freedom. People who couldn't seem to understand that it was for their own good to let their betters control their lives. Not everyone would have access to the prosperity the new society would offer but there was nothing new about that. It was simply the natural order of things. It had never been any different. Order and peace came at a price. Hauser smiled, thinking of a future where he'd be a king, more than a king. Like his idol Napoleon, he'd be an emperor. Chapter 47 Three hours since they'd left the marina. The wind howled around the small craft. Nothing could be seen beyond the boat. The only light came from the glow of the control panel. The open cockpit offered little protection against the storm. They huddled together in the relentless rain, wet and cold, clothes soaked through. The waves were big, breaking in torrential bursts of foam and spray. Each time the boat climbed a wave, it dropped back down into the trough with a flat shock it felt like it would split the hull wide open. Lamont took a hand off the wheel and wiped spray from his face. Nick, take a look at the display. Nick looked at the console, where an ominous green mass swirled on the screen. 
Their boat was a tiny white dot at the edge of the green. That doesn't look good. If that catches us, we're toast. We're not going to make it to Istanbul. We have to head for land. Near as I can tell, we're just south of Bulgaria. Turkey should be off to starboard. Can we make it without getting swamped? We don't have a choice. We have to try. Go for it. Lamont turned the wheel and pushed the throttle forward. With the new course, the boat began a sickening corkscrew motion. Up, twist, down, twist, and up again. Selena leaned over the side and threw up. Ronnie held on to her to keep her from being swept overboard. Nick took out his phone and called Hood. Come on, come on, he said under his breath. Pick up. The boat took a long slide down the side of a wall of water. For a moment, Nick thought they were done. Then they began to climb the next wave. Nick, what's happening? What's that noise? The target is destroyed, Nick shouted into the phone. We had to steal a boat to get away. We're on the Black Sea, caught in a hell of a storm, and making for the coast of Turkey. We need Xville. All right, I've got your GPS. I'm pulling up an image now. Jesus, Nick, it's a hurricane. Yeah, tell me about it. You're off the tip of European Turkey. It's a mix of rock, cliffs, and beaches. If you can get farther south, you'll have a better chance of making a beach. Copy that. Protect your phone. I'll start things going here. Copy. Out. What did he say? Lamont yelled. Get as far south as you can. He's on it. The next 20 minutes was a nightmare roller coaster of water and darkness. Selena threw up again. Ronnie followed shortly after. Nick had never been seasick, but the twisting motion of the boat made him wonder if he was about to discover what it was like. None of it seemed to affect Lamont. Listen, Lamont said. Hear that? Somewhere ahead, surf pounded against the shore. Getting close. Close to what? Ronnie said. The boat began to climb toward the sky, then it surged forward. What the hell? Nick grabbed the seat. Hang on, Lamont yelled. Helpless, they were swept forward on the crest of a huge wave. Ahead lay a wall of black. The sound of the surf grew loud. The bow dipped until it was pointed almost straight down. The engines screamed as the props came out of the water. They slid down the face of the wave, picking up speed. Selena screamed. The boat struck the shore. The fiberglass hulls shattered as the wave thundered over them. Nick was rolled and tossed in a churning maelstrom of choking water, sand, and debris. Something struck him on the side of the head. Then, nothing. Chapter 48 Nick came to, retching seawater. He lay on his stomach, his face pressed into rough sand. His side hurt. Something slimy and uncomfortable was under his cheek. A hard shape pressed into his chest. The boat. Selena. The thought jarred him awake. He raised up on hands and knees, then climbed to his feet. The wind tried to blow him over. A thick glob of seaweed was plastered to his face. He pulled it off and tossed it away. He looked around in the dark. Behind him, a churning line of white foam marked where the surf crashed against the shore. He called out, Selena, Ronnie, Lamont. Over here, it was Selena. Her voice came from somewhere on his right. Keep talking. Nick, I'm here. He stumbled in her direction and almost tripped over her. She sat upright on the sand, holding her left arm close to her chest. Thank God, he said. Are you all right? Yes, but my shoulder is dislocated. That was a hell of a ride, he said. She gave him a tiny smile. What about Ronnie and Lamont? Have you seen them? No. Let me look at your arm. You're sure it's dislocated, not broken? Yes. Okay, I can fix it. It will hurt. I know. Just get it over with. Nick knelt in front of her. Gently, he moved her arm. She gasped in pain. He grasped the arm behind the wrist and in front of the elbow. Okay, on three. Ready? One, two. Nick pulled her arm straight forward. Selena yelled in pain. There was an audible click as the bone moved back into place. 
Tears ran down Selena's face. Damn it, Nick. You said on three. I lied. Easier that way for you. He pulled off his belt and improvised a sling. You know the drill. Try not to move it. Does it feel better? Yes, thanks, I think. Go look for Ronnie and Lamont. There's a small flashlight in my left jacket pocket, if it's still there. He reached inside the pocket and found the light. It clicked on, giving a small, intense white beam. This will help. Nick stood, cupped his hands around his mouth, and shouted, Ronnie! Lamont! Where are you? Nick, we're over here! Hurry! Ronnie's voice came from farther down the beach. Go, I'm fine, Selena said. Nick swept the flashlight beam in front of him. Ten yards farther on, Lamont lay unmoving on the sand. Ronnie crouched over him, giving him CPR. Shit, Nick said as he came up to them. Is he breathing? No, I think he hit his head on the rocks. Probably swallowed a lot of water. Take over. I'll try and get some air into him. Nick set the flashlight on the sand, knelt down and began. Ronnie leaned close, pinched Lamont's nostrils, and blew into his mouth. They set up a rhythm between compressions and pushing air into Lamont's lungs. Come on, Lamont, Nick said. Breathe, damn it. You're not getting out of here that easy. Selena came up, drawn by the light. They kept at it. Nick's wound opened as he pressed on Lamont's chest. The blood felt warm as it trickled down his side. He kept up the rhythm, looked at Selena, shook his head. His arms were growing tired. He was about to ask Ronnie to take over when Lamont coughed. Water spewed from his mouth. Quick, turn him, Ronnie said. They rolled him onto his left side. Lamont began coughing and choking, spitting water. Ronnie held his head off the sand. Breathe, that's it, breathe. Minutes later, Lamont was sitting up, shivering. His coffee-colored skin looked white in the light of the flashlight. Thanks, he croaked. Rain poured down. The wind whipped around them. Nick remembered his phone. It was still in his jacket, the hard shape it had been lying on when he woke up. It was supposed to be waterproof. He took it out and turned it on. Nothing happened. No good, Maybe if we can get it dried out. Lamont, can you walk? Yeah, give me a minute. What's the plan? Ronnie said. Find shelter. Walk until we find something. I'm ready, Lamont said. They helped him up and set off. The beach stretched along a deserted rocky shore. They couldn't see far with the small flashlight, but it was enough to keep from tripping over rocks and debris. They'd been walking for several minutes when the light crossed a sandy trail leading up from the beach. That looks like a path, Ronnie said. Good a bet as any, Nick said. Lamont, how you doing? I'm good. He coughed a long string of hacking sounds. They took the path. Years of military training, putting one foot in front of the other took over. It didn't take much thinking. As long as you kept doing that, you'd get somewhere. They almost ran into the side of a wooden shack that emerged from the darkness. There were no lights inside. The front of the shack had a door and one small window. The door was closed with a hasp and padlock. Ronnie made short work of that with his knife. They opened the door and stumbled inside, exhausted. Nick closed the door behind them. Man, it's good to get out of the rain, Lamont said. Nick's light fell on a kerosene lamp resting on a brightly painted table. We need a match. Ronnie took a small metal box from his shirt pocket and tossed it to Nick. Waterproof, so they say. Nick struck a match, lifted the glass chimney and lit the wick of the lantern. It burned and began smoking. He adjusted the wick until the smoke stopped. The room filled with a warm yellow glow. Two wooden chairs painted red and blue sat next to the table. A bench with a metal basin and a cabinet made up a rudimentary kitchen. A rusty potbelly stove sat in one corner with a small pile of dry wood next to it. In a few moments, Nick had a fire going. Lamont coughed, coughed again, and kept coughing. Finally, he stopped. Outside, wind and rain beat against the sides of the building. Nick put his phone next to the stove, hoping the heat would dry it out. He sat down in one of the chairs, exhausted. We're safe for the moment, Nick said. 
there's nothing to do until the storm is over. I need to sleep, Selena said. Sounds about right, Ronnie said. Lamont stretched out on the floor near the stove. Nick sat at the table. The others found places to lie down. After everything they'd been through, the warped boards of the floor felt like luxury. Long after the others were asleep, Nick sat staring at the glow of the stove. At last, he folded his arms on the table, laid his head down, and slept. Chapter 49 The heat dried out Nick's phone. Once it began working again, Hood zeroed in on the GPS signal. They waited in the shack for the storm to blow over. It was another full day before Hood got someone to them. His connection still ran deep. There'd been no awkward questions from the Turkish authorities. Now they were back in Elizabeth's office, holding a council of war to decide what to do about Hauser. Elizabeth was still in the hospital. Hood was running the meeting. That was good work in Romania, he said. Unfortunately, it looks like Hauser is preparing to produce the vaccine in his Swiss facility. How many factories does this guy have? Ronnie asked. Too many. At least, too many for us to eliminate them. Seems like everything we've done has been a waste of time, Nick said. That's not the case, Nick, Hood said. Everything you've done has set him back. That's not enough. He's still in business. Isn't there any way to stop him, legally? I made several discreet inquiries. Hauser's money has bought him a lot of protection. No one is willing to do anything about him. My concerns were dismissed out of hand. I was told I was out of line. It was a warning. He has a great deal of influence. So we're just going to let him get away with it? Selena said. I didn't say that. There's only one thing you can do with people like this, Ronnie said. Take him out, Lamont said. You have a better idea? He's made it clear he's not going to stop. He releases that virus. It's all over. It's not just him, Nick said. Remember, he has partners. There's nothing to stop them carrying out their plan, even if Hauser's dead. It's like a nest of vipers, Lamont said. There's only one way to be sure this thing ends for good, Nick said. We have to get them all. How do you propose to do that? Hood asked. These people are well protected. They're almost never in the same place. If we manage to eliminate Hauser, that will put the others on their guard. We'll never get near them after that. Stephanie had been sitting quietly to the side of Elizabeth's desk in her usual position. Now she spoke out. Then we have to find a way to get them together in one place. How? Nick said. What's the one thing all these people have in common, aside from their insane ideology? That's easy, Ronnie said. Money? They're all billionaires. Suppose something happened to their money. If we could get them worried enough, it might provoke a meeting. We could make it look as though someone in their group was responsible. They define themselves by their wealth and the power it gives them. It's a good bet they're all paranoid as hell. We plant the idea that one of them is a traitor to the others. If we're successful, they might even destroy themselves and save us the trouble. That's an interesting thought, Stephanie, Hood said. It might even work. How would you go about it? Most of their wealth will be invested. Freddy can manipulate the markets to make sure those investments start bleeding money. He can access their accounts and play games with them. He can do that, Nick said. Of course. Normally, it would be unethical to take advantage of his abilities in that way. But in this case, I think we can make an exception. Hood steepled his fingers together. Could you make it look as if one particular member of the cabal is stealing from the others? Sure. The only question is how obvious you want it to be. I think it should be very obvious, Nick said. We need to provoke a reaction fast before they can get that virus out there. What's to prevent the other members of the cabal from simply eliminating the one they think is stealing their money? Selena asked. Good question. We have to make them deal with it up close and personal, in a meeting. I can intercept and monitor their communications, Stephanie said. We'll know if what we're doing is working. Can you change anything in those messages? Maybe. It depends. That opens up a lot of possibilities, 
Nick said. You could stir things up, but how would you keep them from knowing their messages had been hacked? I'd have to think about it, Steph said. All right, let's run with this, Hood said. Stephanie, start Freddy on interfering with their finances. See if you can figure out a way to insert something in their comms if we need to do that. I have already researched the financial information necessary. Shall I begin to interfere? That's good work, but not yet, Freddy, Stephanie said. There's something we need to decide first. Very well, Stephanie. What are you thinking, Steph? Selena asked. Do we want to focus on one person with this strategy? For example, do we want the others to think Hauser is behind it? Or do we want everyone wondering who it is? I think it's better if no one is quite sure who's doing it, as long as they believe it's one of them, Nick said. More suspicion, more paranoia, Ronnie said. Right. The more we get them off center, the better chance of pulling this off. Selena brushed a wisp of hair away from her forehead. We could make it look as if someone in the cabal was having less trouble than the others, just enough to cast suspicion. Maybe two of them, Nick said. Who would you choose, Hood said. We have Hauser, Von Breitenbach, Crampton, Romanoff, and Radu. Radu is the wealthiest of the bunch. I would say he's also the most ruthless, although it's a real toss-up with these people. Romanoff for sure, Selina said. He's not as wedded to the globalist philosophy as the others, and they know it. I don't think Hauser is a good bet. Nick said. All the damage we've done to him, it's pretty obvious he's fully on board with their agenda. On the other hand, that might work to our advantage, Selena said. How so? We've cost him a lot of money. Millions, maybe more. All that equipment, those laboratories, that was expensive stuff we blew up. You're saying we make it look like he wants to recoup some of his losses at the expense of the others? It's an idea anyway. I like it, Lamont said. I'd love to cause that creep some trouble. Okay, Hood said. We make it look as though either Romanoff or Hauser are manipulating the markets. The others will see it as a power play, Nick said. For people like them, money always equals power. That will fit right in with their paranoia. I see a problem with this, Selena said. These men are all multi-billionaires. Damaging their investments will cause a lot of other people to lose money as well. If we aren't careful, we could start a run and cause a crash. I don't want that on my conscience. Freddy can make sure that doesn't happen, Steph said. We'll do it in a way that hurts them without setting off a larger panic. We can increase Hauser's and Romanoff's wealth at the expense of the others and still keep things balanced in the big picture. Do not worry, Selena. Stephanie is correct. I have completed an extensive analysis of the targeted investments. We can accomplish the mission without causing a market crash. Does that relieve your concern, Selena? Hood said, yes. This is going to be fun, Stephanie said. Chapter 50 Hauser was finishing breakfast on the veranda of his Texas home. By noon, the temperature would hit 100 degrees, but this early in the morning, it was still pleasantly cool. He took a last bite of pastry, then poured another cup of coffee. The beans came from a plantation he owned in Hawaii. He inhaled the rich aroma and sighed with pleasure. One of his enjoyments in life was knowing the gourmet beans were not available to the public. He contemplated the day. Production of the vaccine had started in Switzerland. In spite of the annoying delay caused by the attacks in Germany and Romania, the plan was moving ahead. Soon there would be enough to distribute to personnel essential to success. Once that was achieved, he would release the virus. That woman had survived Strecker's botched attempt to kill her, but he'd make sure she and her minions were infected. Needless to say, the vaccine would not be available to them. On the other hand, it might be interesting to let them get the shot. The protein could be stimulated to create excruciating pain. Then they would regret the trouble they'd caused him. 
the image of his enemy's suffering brought another smile. Yes, he'd make sure they got the vaccine. With that thought, he dismissed them from his mind. Hauser had not become as wealthy as he was by delegating everything to others, no matter how experienced or competent they were. His empire was too big to manage every detail, but he always paid personal attention to his market investments. His habit was to review his financial position every morning. It was a simple matter to track how things were going while enjoying his morning coffee. He opened his laptop, entered his password, and logged into his account. He owned the company that managed his investments and had full access in real time to everything happening in the markets. His enormous wealth made him one of the hidden factors that influenced stock prices all over the world. The figures on the screen did nothing to dampen his good mood. His portfolio had gained almost 2% over the last few days. That amounted to something well over a billion dollars. He was considering whether or not to invest in a Canadian mining venture when his encrypted satellite phone signaled a call. Only members of the group knew that number. He looked at the display. It was von Breitenbach calling. Hauser answered. Good morning, Baron. Perhaps not so good, Carl. I believe we have a problem. Oh, what is it? Have you talked with the others lately? No. Have you suffered any recent losses to your investments? What an odd question, Baron. As a matter of fact, I was just looking at my portfolio. Aside from normal fluctuations of the market, things are going well. Then you are the exception. I haven't spoken with Romanoff, but myself and the others have experienced significant losses in the last few days. This can't be the result of the usual market dynamics. I believe our group is under attack. Someone is behind this. I am calling an emergency meeting to discuss our options. Agreements within the group were based on the need for each individual to feel he had an equal amount of control. One of those agreements was that a member could call an emergency meeting for any reason he deemed necessary. Because of the increasing ability of hostile parties to intercept any kind of electronic communication, emergency meetings were always held in person. Hauser could only remember a few times when this had happened. I see, he said. You are certain someone is engineering these losses? I am. Then why haven't I experienced the same thing? I have no idea, Breitenbach said. Perhaps whoever it is hasn't gotten around to you yet. In any event, I'm calling a meeting. Where and when? At my villa in Portofino this coming weekend. Plan to arrive sometime on Saturday. We'll get together at dinner. Portofino was a village located on the Italian Riviera, popular for its high-end shops and restaurants. From March to the end of October, the harbor was filled with the super yachts of the rich. Breitenbach's villa was several kilometers out of town, well away from the crowds and tourists. What about security? Hauser asked. I will provide security. Of course, everyone is free to bring their own people if they wish. It's likely everyone will. There are plenty of accommodations at the villa. We can also discuss next steps. I'm sure everyone wants a progress update after all the difficulties you've recently experienced. The delays were unfortunate, but things are now settled. I don't anticipate any more problems. I'm happy to hear it, Carl. We'll talk on Saturday. There are a few things I'd like to go over with you that don't concern the others. I look forward to it, Baron. After the call ended, Hauser thought about what the call meant. It would take serious computer resources and expertise to go after the group's investments. It wasn't easy to manipulate the markets on that level. The others would wonder why he hadn't been affected. They'd be suspicious. Hauser was under no illusions regarding his partners. If they thought he was behind this attack, it would mean trouble. He'd take Strecker and some of his men with him to the meeting. In the meantime, he'd look into what had happened to Breitenbach and the others. No matter how careful they were, if someone was behind the market losses, they would have left a trail. A trail could be followed back to its source. The best thing he could do to ensure his continued health was to bring knowledge of that source to the meeting in Italy. That decision made, Hauser picked up his phone. Chapter 51 
I stopped by the hospital to see Elizabeth this morning, Hood said. She's in a lot of pain, but they're keeping her doped up. She won't be going home soon. Once again, they were meeting in Elizabeth's office. It was strange not to have her sitting behind her desk. The familiar surroundings made everything seem almost normal, but it was an illusion. Stephanie, what have you got for us? Hood asked. I've been tracking everyone in Hauser's group. I haven't had any luck understanding their phone conversations. They're using advanced encryption, something I've never seen before. I was getting frustrated, but then Crampton made a mistake. He sent von Breitenbach an email requesting details about a meeting. They'll all be at his villa in Italy this weekend. Our strategy is working. Ronnie pumped his fist in the air. All right. Where in Italy? Nick asked. Near Portofino, a few kilometers out of town, Stephanie said. I know Portofino, Selena said. It's popular with the big money set. Do we have pictures of the villa? Nick said. We do. The wall monitor lit with a shot of Breitenbach's Italian retreat. It was located in the forest north of Portofino, several kilometers from the main road. It was clear Breitenbach valued his privacy. The villa was set inside a sprawling compound, surrounded by high walls of whitewashed stone. There were several additional outbuildings. At least 20 people could be seen walking around, many armed. Big compound, Ronnie said. Zoom in on one of the guards, please, Steph. The picture was sharp. The guard carried a submachine gun. That's a scorpion, Lamont said. Nasty. Stephanie clicked. A different picture taken at ground level appeared on the monitor. Breitenbach's villa was featured in an architectural magazine, she said. We also have shots of the interior and the grounds. That could come in useful, Nick said. Those walls look about 10 feet high, Lamont said. One gate and guardhouse at the end of the drive. Pretty typical setup. See the glass shard sticking out of the top of the wall? That's enough to discourage a common thief, Nick said. Not enough to keep away somebody serious. We'll have all sorts of additional security besides the guards. Probably ground sensors and dogs, Ronnie said. Maybe lasers. Cameras, Lamont said. We'll have to kill power before we go in, Nick said. Steph, can we get plans? Maybe blueprints? I have already procured the plans, Nick. Would you like to see them? Yes, Freddy. Thank you. You are welcome. We've done this kind of thing before, Nick said. Yeah, but it never gets easier, Ronnie said. They studied the plans. The power comes in underground, but it's fed from a pole on the road. We could cut it there. Look at the blueprints, Nick said. He's got a big backup generator in that building to the right of the main house. The question is whether or not it comes on automatically, Ronnie said. If it does, it's going to make things harder. It is not an automatic backup. The designation on the blueprint indicates a model which must be manually started. That's good to know. That helps, but how long will it take them to get it up and running? Lamont asked. Not long, Nick said. Too bad we can't hit it with a missile, Lamont said. It would make things a lot simpler. We need to rethink this, Selena said. They all looked at her. What do you mean? There are already at least 20 men there. The others will bring their personal guards with them to this meeting. There are only four of us. Even if we can get in there without being discovered, it won't take them long to catch on. It's a suicide mission. We're not going to get another chance like this. I know that, but we can't take that place without someone getting killed. Once the shooting starts, our chances of success go down to zero. We need to find a different way to get at these people. Hood had been silent while they were talking. He cleared his throat to get their attention. I think Selena is right. Then what would you suggest? They won't always be inside that compound. If you can't get them when they're at the villa, you have to take them when they're not. Portofino has some world-class restaurants, Selena said. There's no reason for Hauser and the others to suspect an attack, not with all the security they've got. They fly in during the day on Saturday. Breitenbach will make reservations at one of the better restaurants for the entire party on Saturday evening. 
That's where we should go after them. You seem certain that's what they'll do. Trust me on this, Selena said. I know how people with their kind of money think. They belong to a particular social class. They can't escape their conditioning. Big money has its own culture. They'll pick the best restaurant in town and take it over. I like this idea, Lamont said. You like any idea that involves food, Ronnie said. What's wrong with that? Guys, Nick said, let's stay on task. It should be easy to find out which restaurant they pick, Selena said. Then we can figure out the logistics. You're forgetting something. What's that? Their people will be heavily armed. We go after them in a restaurant. There's going to be collateral damage. It will be unavoidable. We can't have that, Hood said. Breitenbach will make sure there's no one in that restaurant except his party and the staff, Selena said. The risk is there, but it's minimal. We could take them on the street before they get there, Ronnie said. If we hit them on the street after they leave would be better, Selena said. Good food, good wine. Hauser and the others will be relaxed, off their guard. Even their security might be less alert. But the street offers more chance for collateral damage. That makes sense, Nick said. We'll talk more, but I agree we should hit them at the restaurant or after. Works for me, Lamont said. Me too, Ronnie said. Then it's settled, Hood said. The closest airport is Genoa, Selena said. I'll have the plane ready. You can leave tonight. What about weapons? Nick asked. Give me a list. You can pick them up in Genoa. I'll make the arrangements. Chapter 52 The long flight got them into Genoa in the afternoon. They rented an Alfa Romeo SUV at the airport. Classic Italian red a luxury wolf in disguise, with over 500 horsepower and a top speed over 170. Selena smiled when she saw it. Nick knew better than to argue when she said she'd drive. Hood had come through on the weapons. They'd picked up two aluminum cases holding MP5s, stun grenades, pistols, and ammunition. Ronnie loaded them into the back of the car, and they drove to Portofino. Selena had made reservations at the best hotel she could find. In Portofino, that meant five stars with all the bells and whistles. The hotel was built on the side of a cliff. Their suite overlooked the Ligurian Sea. They stood together on the balcony, looking out at the stunning view. Nice, isn't it? Selena said. Nice doesn't begin to describe it. How do you come up with these places? When I was 14, I stayed here for a week with my uncle. I've never forgotten it. It was like living in a fairy tale. I can only imagine what life was like for you back then. I was a child. I won't deny it was wonderful, but it was never something that could have lasted. Your uncle was really something, Nick said. He was. He always said money comes with the obligation to help others. He also taught me that nothing lasts. Not money, not youth, not fame. He exposed me to the world's different cultures. He never pushed one religion, but he made sure I had a solid spiritual foundation, a firm belief in God. It's what gives me the strength to keep going. Without that, I couldn't do what we do. I wouldn't be who I am. You never told me this before. I don't think I ever put it into words before, she said. In the distance, a lone sail shone white in the sun. A soft breeze blew through the open windows on the balcony carrying the scent of flowers and the sea. Nick took Selena in his arms and kissed her. I love you, he said. She hugged him tight. Let's go inside, she said. Later, they went down to dinner. The restaurant featured an open terrace looking out over the water. The sun was dropping below the horizon in a blaze of color and light. The maitre d' led them to their table. Ronnie and Lamont were already seated. If the food's anything like the view, I'm really going to enjoy dinner, Lamont said. I can guarantee you'll like the food, Selena said. A waiter appeared, introduced himself as Mario, and asked if they would like something to drink before dinner. Shall I order some wine? Selena said. Be my guest, Nick said. Selena fired off a rapid stream of Italian. 
If the waiter was surprised to see a foreigner speaking to him in perfect Italian, he didn't show it. After a brief conversation, he nodded and disappeared. I ordered wine for us and mineral water for you, Ronnie. I can always use a few more minerals. They studied the menus. Man, this is fancy, Lamont said. Everything here will be good, Selena said. You can't go wrong with the fish or the pasta. I think I'll have the Santa Margarita prawns with lemon and a bouquet of vegetables with thyme. I'm going for the grilled swordfish, Nick said. Ronnie decided on a lobster antipasto, Lamont, the Piedmont beef rib. When the waiter returned with the wine, they'd made a few more selections. By the time the food arrived, every table in the restaurant was taken. Loud voices talking in half a dozen languages and bursts of occasional laughter filled the terrace. No one was paying any attention to them. Nick felt it was safe to talk. Tomorrow's Saturday. Our friends will be arriving and heading to the villa. How do we find out what restaurant they'll pick? Ronnie asked. Easy, Selena said. There are only a few possibilities. I'll call them and ask about reservations. It will be simple enough to find out if the entire restaurant has been booked by a private party. As soon as we know that, we can look at the location and make a plan. What if there's more than one? That's possible, but I think it's not likely. If that happens, we'll have to watch and see who shows up. Dinner is an event here. We'll have plenty of time to get to a different location if we pick the wrong one. Be nice if we had more time to figure out what we're doing. Lamont said. It's never any different, Ronnie said. Nick held up his glass. Here's to us, to friendship. They clinked glasses. Nick sipped. This is really good wine. It's too bad Valentina isn't here, Selena said. She'd enjoy this. When will they let her go home? Ronnie asked. She'll be out of the hospital by the time we get back. Do you think Orloff will try again? Nick asked. I don't know. You can never predict what someone like that will do. Hell of a business we're in, Ronnie said. Tell you the truth, I'm thinking it might be time to hang it up. Nick nodded. You're not the only one. Here comes the first course, Selena said. Chapter 53 Freddy tapped into a geostationary satellite over Italy. Hood and Stephanie watched Breitenbach's villa in real time. The members of the cabal arrived one by one. By three in the afternoon, they were all there, except Andre Radu. Earlier in the day, he'd collapsed at the airport in Bucharest and been rushed to a hospital. What's the status on Radu? Hood asked. Freddy got into the hospital computer and took a look. Radu had a massive heart attack. He's not expected to live through the night. Good riddance. That evil old man and his billions have caused more trouble than anyone since Hitler. What's scary is how many people can't seem to see him for what he is. Well, he's out of the picture now. One less to worry about. Each of the cabal had brought their own security. Added to the guards already present, there were more than 40 armed men in the villa compound. Good thing we're not going after them there. Hood said. It's still not going to be easy, Stephanie said. Some of those goons will go with them to the restaurant. Have we got the location yet? There's only one restaurant booked exclusively for the evening. It's located on the harbor, in the busiest part of the village. It's small, famous for its seafood and rated three stars by Michelin. It's just the kind of place Breitenbach would choose. That's going to make it difficult. We can't have collateral damage. I'm going to call Nick now, Stephanie said. She dialed. Nick answered after two rings. What's up, Steph? I know where Hauser and the others will be this evening. It's a restaurant called Trattoria La Vida. Selena came up with the same location. Good work. Let me talk to him, Hood said. Stephanie gave him the phone. Nick, there is a problem. The restaurant is right on the main street of the harbor. The area will be packed with tourists and locals, plus there's no easy escape route. If you go after them there, a lot of innocent people are going to get hurt. That's assuming you can get to the target before their bodyguards take you out. I'm overwhelmed by your optimism. 
you need to come up with a different plan. Another thing, Radu is out of the picture. That leaves Hauser, Crampton, Romanoff, and von Breitenbach. They all brought their own guards. It brings the total to over 40 at the villa. Okay, thanks. Let me know what you're going to do. I'll keep you posted if anything changes on this end. Hood ended the call. What's the word? Ronnie asked. Hood doesn't think we can take them at the restaurant. He's worried about collateral damage. The location means there's no easy way to get out afterward. The good news is there are only four of them to deal with. Radu is out of the picture. Any bad news? Lamont asked. They brought lots of security. Hood counted over 40 guards at the villa. So we need a new plan. Yep. Suggestions? How about we wait till they go back where they came from and go after them one by one, Lamont said. There's not enough time for that. We have to stop them now before they can release the virus. They'll be gone by the end of tomorrow. If we can't get them in town and we can't attack the villa, there's only one obvious place to go after them, Selena said. Which is? The road back to the villa, after they leave the restaurant. That could work, Ronnie said. That would solve the problem of collateral damage, Nick said. A map of the road would be nice, Lamont said. Better would be pictures. Steph can get us a satellite shot, Selena said. I'll give her a call, Nick said. Chapter 54 The night was warm. Overhead, clouds obscured the stars. Showers were predicted for the morning. From where he sat, Hauser could see a half-dozen ocean-going yachts anchored in the harbor. All that floating money gave him a good feeling, knowing he could buy any one of them if he desired. He picked a speck of lint from his shirt, an Armani creation in gray silk. Pavel Romanov sat across from him. The Russian had put on weight. He wore an elegant white shirt open at the collar, revealing graying chest hair and a heavy gold chain. Black linen slacks and gleaming Gucci loafers completed his outfit. To Hauser's right was Peter Crampton, looking every inch the English aristocrat in a cream-colored linen suit. A discreet glint of gold came from a Patek Philippe watch on his left wrist. Breitenbach sat a little way off to Hauser's left. He too had chosen a linen outfit for the evening, a combination of light green and black. The table was set with a white linen tablecloth. Candles cast a soft glow on polished glasses and gleaming silverware. With the yachts and harbor in the background, the scene could have been an advertisement for self-satisfied wealth. Gerhard Strecker stood off to the side of the table where the four men sat, watching the street for potential threats. The other bodyguards had taken up positions around the restaurant, some sitting at tables, some standing. All were nicely dressed, as was expected in a good Italian restaurant. A careful observer would have noted the occasional telltale bulge of weapons under the tailored suits. Breitenbach had decided to let guards eat in shifts. He'd paid a considerable amount to secure exclusive use for the evening, and he wanted his money's worth out of the kitchen. Nothing of consequence had yet been discussed between the conspirators. It's a shame Andre couldn't be here. Romanov said. I, for one, am glad he's not, Crampton said. I've always found him to be a rather common man for all his wealth and his breath. Every time he started talking, I had to choke back an urge to turn away and vomit. You won't have to deal with his bad breath again, Breitenbach said. I'm assured he won't survive the night. Whatever his flaws, he's been of great service to our cause, Hauser said. His work has prepared the ground for the future. I propose a toast. If you insist, Crampton said. They raised their glasses. To Andre, a man as devious as Machiavelli. They drank. Breitenbach decided to bring up the subject they all had on their mind. Let's talk about the financial situation. Yes, let's, Crampton said. I've lost almost a billion dollars in the last two days. This simply cannot go on. I am convinced someone is manipulating the markets against us, Breitenbach said. I've been looking into it. Not all of us have suffered losses. Pavel and Carl seem to be unaffected. He turned to them. 
Perhaps you can tell us why. Romanov's face, already flushed from the wine, grew darker. Are you accusing me of something, Baron? Not at all, my dear Pavel. But you must admit it is rather odd that neither you nor Karl have been affected by these dramatic changes in our portfolios. It's not Pavel or me you should be worried about, Baron. We're not the ones behind this. Oh, who is then? There was underlying menace in Breitenbach's tone of voice. I think you will agree that I have a certain expertise with the markets. When you told me of these unusual fluctuations, I decided to look into it. It wasn't easy, but I managed to trace the source of the difficulties. Hauser told the others what he'd found. The origin of their problems was something called the Harker Group. Harker? Isn't that the woman your man failed to kill? Strecker overheard and flushed with anger. What the hell does he know about it? The same. She's still in the hospital. I intend to finish the job soon. However, she's not the problem at the moment. The man who took over for her used to run the CIA. He has a Cray computer at his disposal and someone who knows how to use it. These are the people responsible for attacking my laboratories in Germany and Romania. They're the ones who've been interfering with your investments. I believe they deliberately ignored Pavel and myself in order to sow discord among us. They seem to have succeeded. You can prove this? Of course, Baron. Let's be frank, gentlemen. We are all powerful men. None of us fully trust the others. It's only appropriate, given what's at stake. I wouldn't dream of presenting this information without proof. When we return to the villa, you'll find a full report in each of your rooms. Until you've had a chance to evaluate it for yourselves, I ask you to take me at my word. We must do something about these people, Romanov said. In my opinion, we should eliminate them, Hauser said. I suggest we discuss possibilities tomorrow. Very well, Breitenbach said. We'll add that to our agenda. In the meantime, let's enjoy our meal. Two hours later, they left the restaurant and got into their vehicles. Hauser settled back in his seat and thought about Andre Radu. He wondered what the others would say if they knew he was responsible for Radu's sudden coronary. Radu had always thought of himself as the leader of the group and had often opposed Hauser's ideas. Well, he'd been mistaken. Tomorrow, he'd tell the others that enough vaccine would be ready in a week to protect themselves and key personnel. The virus was poised for distribution. A month after the release, deaths would begin to mount. In three months, there would be worldwide panic. By this time next year, Hauser and the others would be fully in control. It had taken years of planning and billions of dollars to bring things to this point, but at last, the goal was in sight. One day, statues would be erected in his memory. Pleasantly high from the wine, Hauser contemplated the future. Confident, his place in history was assured. Chapter 55 There was only one road to Portofino. From the village, the highway ran north until it came to the town of Santa Margherita Ligure. From there, it led west to the SS-1, a major highway following the coastline. Eventually, it came to Genoa. Stephanie had sent satellite shots of the area. Breitenbach's villa was several kilometers north of town. It was reached by a gravel and dirt road that made its way through the forest until it ended in a sparsely populated village three kilometers past the villa. Late at night, the only traffic on the road would be the cars carrying Breitenbach and his party. About a kilometer from the main highway, the road curved sharply to the right. The cars would have to slow to negotiate the curve. It was a good place for an ambush. Nick and the others sat drinking coffee in the cafe across the street from the restaurant. It was almost eight when Hauser and the others arrived in three black Land Rovers. Once Nick was certain they'd settled in, the team headed out of town. Selena turned onto the road to the villa. She drove until they were near the spot they'd chosen for the ambush and pulled off into the trees where the car wouldn't be seen. They got out. It was quiet under the trees. The loudest sound was the ticking of the Alpha's engine as it cooled. Selena held a flashlight while Ronnie got the weapons from the car. He handed them out. 
We caught a break with the clouds, Nick said. Makes it difficult to see us. Won't be any problem knowing they're coming, Lamont said. When we open up, take out the headlights. Watch out for your night vision. Yes, mother, Lamont said. Yeah, I know. Just the same. Be careful. How you want to do it? Ronnie asked. We'll walk up past the curve. Ronnie, Lamont, you take that side of the road. Selena and I will be on this side. Space yourselves out. Lamont, you let the first and second cars go by and hit the third. Ronnie, you've got the second. Selena and I will take the first one. That will block the others. Wait until you hear us start shooting. Sounds almost too easy, Lamont said. It always sounds easy before it starts. Don't underestimate these guys. Their security is ex-military, probably special forces. They'll be stale, but they have the skills. I only saw pistols at the restaurant, but they've probably got more firepower stashed in the cars. I counted nine in the restaurant, Ronnie said. Hauser and the others makes 13 total. Unlucky number, Lamont said. Only for them. Any questions? Okay, let's do it. Ronnie and Lamont moved to take their positions. Nick and Selena sat on a fallen tree trunk off to the side of the road and waited. After a few moments, Selena stirred. I wonder if we're doing the right thing, she said, acting like judge and jury to execute these people. It's a little late for second thoughts. There's no way to get them into a court of law. Even if we could, no one would convict them. They're too rich, too powerful. I know, but this is different from anything we've done in the past. We've never planned an ambush in cold blood like this. If there was a better way, I'd take it, Nick said. I still don't like it. I don't like it either, but people like Hauser represent everything that's bad about humanity. They have to be stopped. You don't think shooting them down is a little uncivilized? Sure it is. But they gave up the right to be treated in a civilized way a long time ago. They don't think the rules of civilized behavior apply to them. They have nothing but contempt for what we call civilized. Their actions prove that. What they're planning makes Genghis Khan look like an amateur. They're so blinded by the lust for power that nothing else matters. You know what really bothers me? It's all so unnecessary. They have so much, but it's not enough for them. What is it that feeds such hatred for life? Why pretend that destroying people's lives is for their own good? I don't have an answer for that without sounding like one of those phony talk show hosts on TV. A sudden glow of light flickered through the trees. Nick clicked off the safety on his MP5. Here they come. They got up off the log. Go for the lights and radiator, I'll aim for the windshield. The lights of the approaching cars cast long shadows through the trees. The lead vehicle slowed for the curve. It came into sight, followed closely by the one behind. Now! They fired at the front of the Land Rover, shattering the silence. The headlights went out with the first burst. The windshield disintegrated into thousands of pieces. The car swerved to the left and went off the road, dropping down into a ditch. Selena heard Ronnie and Lamont firing. She kept shooting. Her rounds punched holes in the rover and smashed through the windows. Inside the car, Strecker ducked as the first round struck. He fumbled with the door handle and rolled out of the car as it went down into the ditch. He came up with a pistol in his hands and began shooting. His bullets passed by Selena. She slammed in a new magazine and aimed for the flashes coming from behind the wrecked vehicle. The sound of guns was increasing as more weapons joined in. The guards who had survived the initial attack were fighting back. Everything shifted to slow motion. She was aware of Ronnie and Lamont firing, of the dull reports of pistols, of Nick standing next to her. The casings flying from her gun seemed to float through the air. Beside her, she heard Nick grunt with pain. Slowly, he went down on one knee. Woomph! The gas tank in the last car went up in a bloom of yellow and orange flame. The rover lifted from the ground and crashed back to earth. The guns went silent. The car burned with fierce heat. Flames crackled and danced in the night air. Selena turned toward Nick. Time speeded up again. He was still on one knee, his hand pressed to his side. Blood seeped through his fingers. 
fear rippled through her. Nick, you're hit. I'm all right. Same place as before, maybe a little deeper. He grimaced and got to his feet. Ronnie and Lamont walked toward them, carrying their weapons. In the flickering light of the flames, they looked like gods of war. You okay? Ronnie asked. Yeah, check the cars. Lamont nodded at the burning wreck. Nothing but crispy critters in that one. Nick grasped his side, holding his weapon in his left hand. They went to the first vehicle. The driver was dead, slumped over the wheel. So was a passenger in the front seat. The rear doors were open. Peter Crampton sprawled in an impossible position across the rear seat, his mouth wide open, his face frozen in pain and surprise. Behind the car, a blonde man lay dead on the ground. A second man lay not far away. A trail of blood went a few yards into the trees and ended at another body. Lamont rolled it over with his foot. It was Breitenbach. Where's Hauser? Nick said. A second car had come to a stop a few yards behind the first. All the glass had been shot out. Bullet holes scarred the metal panels. The front seat was soaked with blood. The driver was dead. A guard was dead in the passenger seat. In the rear seat, Romanov slumped unmoving against the door. His white shirt stained red. Hauser sat next to him, his eyes open, struggling to breathe. Blood bubbled on his lips. He looked at Nick. Who are you? It doesn't matter, Nick said. You, I would have been king. Hauser coughed. Blood ran from his mouth. You lose, Hauser, Nick said. The game's over. Anything you want to say while you still can? Hauser looked at his tormentor and laughed, setting off a terrible spasm of coughing. You fool, too late. What do you mean? Hauser grinned, his teeth red with blood. It sent a chill down Nick's spine. Too late. He began laughing. The laughter turned to choking, a hoarse, wet sound. His eyes stared at Nick. Hauser, what do you mean? There was no answer. He's gone, Nick, Ronnie said. What the hell did he mean? Nick said. Then he pitched forward onto the hard-packed gravel of the road. Chapter 56 Selena and Ronnie dressed the wound by the light of the burning car. Then she drove them back to Genoa. Ronnie called ahead. Hood's Gulfstream was ready to go by the time they reached the airport. Fourteen hours later, they were back in Virginia. Selena called Hood while they were in the air and briefed him. When they landed, an ambulance was waiting. The bullet that brought Nick to his knees was a through-and-through. -through. It left a nasty wound on the way out, but missed everything serious. He'd lost a lot of blood, but his luck had held once again. After a day in a private hospital with tubes pushing fluids into him, Nick went home. The next day found everyone sitting on the couches in Nick and Selena's loft. They had the place to themselves. The twins were off to the park with Anna. Valentina had been released from the hospital. She was late to the meeting. She came in and sat down next to Lamont on the couch. The hair had been shaved from one side of her head, where the surgeon had gone into her skull. How you doing, Val? Lamont said. I am very good, Lamont. I am glad to be out of hospital. We missed you, Ronnie said. I'm glad you're okay. Nice haircut. I like the punk look. You are so funny today, Valentina said. You and I have a lot to talk about after the meeting, Selena said. I look forward to this, sister. We have drinks, no? Let's start, Hood said. What's the fallout so far? Nick asked. The Italians are asking a lot of questions. Nobody can figure out what happened. The official line is that it was an act of terrorism. So far, nobody has claimed responsibility, but you can bet someone will. I don't think it's going to come back on us. I'm glad to hear it, Nick said. What did you do with the weapons? We dumped them in the sea, Ronnie said. No one's going to find them. Once Hauser and the others were identified, the markets tanked, Hood said. It's going to take a while for them to recover. At least they'll be able to recover, Selena said. If Hauser had succeeded, there wouldn't be any markets. What he said at the end bothers me, Nick said. He said it was too late. Too late for what? Did he already release the virus? There haven't been any reports of a new disease, Hood said. Let's hope it stays that way. 
What about Hauser's labs? Selina asked. He may be gone, but everything he set up is still there. Someone could pick up where he left off. Soon that won't be a problem, Hood said. You can trust me on that. The Iranians have Kezri's research, Nick said. They could plan something along the same lines. Right now, there are a lot of problems in Iran. It looks like the people may finally rise up against the mullahs. I suspect they'll be too busy trying to stay in power to worry about launching a complicated plot like the one Hauser and his associates cooked up. Just the same, I'll keep an eye on them. Associates? You make them sound like something out of The Godfather. Compared to them, Vito Corleone was a saint. Nobody said anything for a minute. Well, Hood said, I'm going to go visit Elizabeth. How is she? Selena asked. Recovering. That attempt on her life has got her thinking about the future. I'm not sure what she's going to do. Hood got up from the couch. Say hello for us, Ronnie said. Yeah, Lamont said. After Hood left, Selena got up and started a new pot of coffee. She came back into the living area and sat down. I want to talk about what happens next, she said. This last mission has been rough. I don't want to do this anymore. I'm tired of not having enough time with the twins. You know you've said this before, Nick said. Yes, but this time is different. You were shot again, twice. It's sheer luck I wasn't hit. Suppose we'd been killed. What would happen to Katrina and Jason? Can I say something? Ronnie said. When I was 19 and gung-ho, this stuff was like meat and potatoes. I could hump 130 pounds for 20 miles in three and a half hours and kick ass at the end of it. That was a hell of a long time ago. There's someone back in Arizona I want to spend time with. I don't want her getting a letter saying I'm not coming back. You old dog, you, Lamont said. You didn't tell me that was serious. Ronnie shrugged. It never came up. What are you getting at? Nick asked. I don't like saying it, but I'm getting too old for this. Hell, we're all too old. None of us duck as fast as we used to. Amen, brother, Lamont said. I feel like Selena does. It's time to give this up. Someone else can do it. I second the emotion, Lamont said. Nick looked at him. You too? I'm not saying I won't miss the action. I will, but Ronnie's right. It's time to hang it up while I'm still walking on two legs. I think I knew this was coming, Nick said. Hey, Ronnie said. We're still above ground. We stopped a lot of bad guys. Maybe that's all you can ask for. I wonder what Elizabeth will say, Selena said. From what Hood said, it doesn't sound like she's in any shape to run things. For a while, anyway, Nick said. Maybe never again. Valentina had been quiet. Now she said, I think it's good decision. It is like you say about poker. Run away while ahead. It's quit while you're ahead, Val. Whatever is same meaning. Do we all agree this was our last mission? Nick said. Nobody said anything. I guess that makes it official. I'll talk with Elizabeth. Selena got up, went into the kitchen, and came back with the pot of coffee. She filled cups all around. Nick went to the liquor cabinet and came back with a bottle of Jameson. He poured a shot in everyone's cup except Ronnie's. It's been a hell of a run. He lifted his cup. A toast. They raised their cups. To us and good times to come. Thousands of miles away, Chang Mei was getting ready to go to work. Mei lived in a one-room apartment on the 12th floor of a building in downtown Taipei. She felt awful. She had a dull, throbbing headache. She hadn't slept well, and she ached all over. She wasn't supposed to go to work today, but she'd promised a friend she'd take her shift. She'd been drinking the night before with her friends. Mei didn't usually drink anything stronger than tea, but they were celebrating. One of the girls was getting engaged. Her stomach felt queasy. She decided to skip breakfast. She washed down two aspirin, took a last look in the mirror, and locked the apartment door behind her. In the elevator, she took out a face mask and put it on. It was only polite to wear a mask when you weren't feeling well. This has been The Enemy, The Project, Book 23, written by Alex Lukeman, narrated by Jack DeGolia. 
Copyright 2022 by Alexander Lukman.